Chapter One of the Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lena Emsley. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter One. A cloud floated slowly above the mountain peak, vast, fleecy and white as the crested foam of a sea wave. It sailed through the sky with a divine air of majesty, seeming almost to express a consciousness of its own grandeur. Over a spacious tract of Southern California it extended its snowy canopy, moving from the distant Pacific Ocean across the heights of the Sierra Madre, now and then catching fire at its extreme edge from the sinking sun which burned like a red brand flung on the roof of a roughly built hut situated on the side of a sloping hollow in one of the smaller hills the door of the hut stood open there were a couple of benches on the burnt grass outside one serving as a table the other as a chair papers and books were neatly piled on the table and on the chair if chair it might be called a man sat reading his appearance was not prepossessing at first glance though his actual features could hardly be seen so concealed were they by a heavy growth of beard in the way of clothing he had little to trouble him loose woolen trousers a white shirt a leathern belt to keep the two garments in place formed his complete outfit finished off by wide canvas shoes a thatch of dark hair thick and ill combed apparently served all his need of head covering and he seemed unconscious of or else indifferent to the hot glare of the summer sky which was hardly tempered by the long shadow of the floating cloud at some moments he was absorbed in reading at others in writing close within his reach was a small notebook in which from time to time he jotted down certain numerals and made rapid calculations frowning impatiently as though the very act of writing was too slow for the speed of his thought there was a wonderful silence everywhere a silence such as can hardly be comprehended by any one who has never visited wide spreading country over canopied by large stretches of open sky and barricaded from the further world by mountain ranges which are like huge walls built by a race of titans the dwellers in such regions are few there is no traffic save the coming and going of occasional pack mules across the hill tracks no sign of modern civilization among such deep and solemn solitudes the sight of a living human being is strange and incongruous yet the man seated outside his hut had an air of ease and satisfied proprietorship not always found with wealthy owners of mansions and parklands he was so thoroughly engrossed in his books and papers that he hardly saw and certainly did not hear the approach of a woman who came climbing wearily up the edge of the sloping hill against which his cabin presented itself to the view as a sort of fitment and advanced towards him carrying a tin pail full of milk this she set down within a yard or so of him and then straightening her back she rested her hands on her hips and drew a long breath for a minute or two he took no notice of her she waited she was a big handsome creature sun-browned and black-haired with flashing dark eyes lit by a spark that was not originally caught from heaven. Presently, becoming conscious of her presence, he threw his book aside and looked up. Well, so you've come after all. Yesterday you said you wouldn't. She shrugged her shoulders. I do not wish you to starve. Very kind of you, but nothing can starve me. If you had no food. I should find some, he said yes i should find some somewhere i want very little he rose stretching his arms lazily above his head then stooping he lifted the pail of milk and carried it into his cabin disappearing for a moment he returned bringing back the pail empty i have enough for two days now he said and longer what you brought me at the beginning of the week has turned beautifully sour a lovely curd as our cook at home used to say and with that lovely curd and plenty of fruit i am living in luxury here he felt in his pockets and took out a handful of coins that's right isn't it she counted them over as he gave them to her bit one with her strong white teeth and nodded 
you don't pay me she said emphatically it's the plaza you pay how many times will you remind me of that he replied with a laugh of course i know i don't pay you of course i know i pay the plaza that amazing hotel and sanatorium with a tropical garden and no comfort it is more comfortable than this she said with a disparaging glance at his log dwelling how do you know and he laughed again what have you ever experienced in the line of hotels you are employed at the plaza to fetch and carry to wait on the wretched invalids who come to california for a cure of diseases incurable you are not an invalid she said with a slight accent of contempt no i only pretend to be why do you pretend oh manella what a question why do we all pretend all every human being from the child to the dotard simply because we dare not face the truth for example consider the sun it's a furnace with flames five thousand miles high but we pretend it is our beautiful orb of day we must pretend if we didn't we should go mad manella knitted her black brows perplexedly i do not understand you she said why do you talk nonsense about the sun i suppose you are ill after all you have an illness of the head he nodded with mock solemnity that's it you're a wise woman manella that's why i'm here not tubercles on the lungs tubercles on the brain oh those tubercles they could never stand the plaza the gaiety the brilliancy the all too dazzling social round he paused and a gleam of even white teeth under his dark moustache gave the suggestion of a smile that's why i stay up here you make fun of the plaza said manella biting her lips vexedly and of me too i am nothing to you absolutely nothing dear but why should you be anything a warm flush turned her sunburnt skin to a deeper tinge men are often fond of women she said often oh more than often too often but what does that matter she twisted the ends of her rose-coloured neckerchief nervously with one hand you are a man she replied curtly you should have a woman he laughed a deep mellow hearty laugh of pleasure should i you really think so wonderful manella come here come quite close to me she obeyed moving with the soft tread of a forest animal and face to face with him looked up he smiled kindly into her dark fierce eyes and noted with artistic approval the unspoiled beauty of natural lines in her form and the proud poise of her handsome head on her full throat and splendid shoulders you are very good-looking manella he then remarked lazily quite the model for a juno be satisfied with yourself you should have scores of lovers she stamped her foot suddenly and impatiently i have none she said and you know it but you do not care he shook a reproachful forefinger at her manella manella you are naughty temper temper of course i do not care be reasonable why should i she pressed both hands tightly against her bosom seeking to control her quick excited breathing why should you i do not know but i care i would be your woman i would be your slave i would wait upon you and serve you faithfully i would obey your every wish i am a good servant i can cook and sew and wash and sweep i can do everything in a house and you should have no trouble you should write and read all day i would not speak a word to disturb you i would guard you like a dog that loves his master he listened with a strange look in his eyes a look of wonder and something of compassion there was a pause the silence of the hills was or seemed more intense and impressive the great white cloud still spread itself in large leisure among the miles of slowly darkening sky presently he spoke and what wages manella what wages would i have to pay for such a servant such a dog her head drooped she avoided his steady searching gaze what wages manella 
None, you would say, except love. You tell me that you would be my woman, and I know you mean it. You would be my slave. You mean that too. But you would want me to love you. Manella, there is no such thing as love, not in this world. There is animal attraction. The magnetism of the male for the female, the female for the male. The magnetism that pulls the opposite sexes together in order to keep this planet supplied with an ever new crop of fools. But love? No, Manella. There is no such thing. Here he gently took her two hands away from their tightly folded position on her bosom and held them in his own. No such thing, my dear, he went on, speaking softly and soothingly as though to a child, except in the dreams of poets, and you fortunately know nothing about poetry. The wild animal in you is attracted to the tame, ruminating animal in me, and you would be my woman, though I would not be your man. I quite believe that it is the natural instinct of the female to select her mate, but though the rule may hold good in the forest world, it doesn't always work among the human herd. Man considers that he has the right of selection, quite a mistake of his, I'm sure, for he has no real sense of beauty or fitness, and generally selects most vilely. All the same, he is an obstinate brute, and sticks to his brutish ideas as a snail sticks to its shell. I am an obstinate brute. I am absolutely convinced that I have the right to choose my own woman, if I want one, which I don't, or if I ever do want one, which I never shall. She drew her hands quickly from his grasp. There were tears in her splendid dark eyes. You talk, you talk, she said with a kind of sob in her voice. It's all talk with you, talk which I cannot understand. I don't want to understand. I am only a poor, ignorant girl. I cannot talk, but I can love. Ah, yes, I can love. You say there is no such thing as love. What is it, then, when one prays every night and morning for a man, when one would work one's fingers to the bone for him, when one would die to keep him from sickness and harm? What do you call it? He smiled. Self-delusion, Manella. The beautiful self-delusion of every nature-bred woman when her fancy is attracted by a particular sort of man. She makes an ideal of him in her mind and imagines him to be a god, when he is nothing but a devil. Something sinister and cruel in his look startled her. She made the sign of the cross on her bosom. A devil? she murmured. A devil? Ah, now you are frightened, he said with a flash of amusement in his eyes. You are a good Catholic, and you believe in devils. So you make the sign of the cross as a protection. That's right. That's the way to defend yourself from my evil influence. Wise Manella. The light mockery of his tone roused her pride, that pride which had been suppressed in her by the force of a passionate emotion she could not restrain. She lifted her head and regarded him with an air of sorrow and scorn. After all, I think you must be a wicked man she said. You have no heart. You are not worthy to be loved. Quite true, Manella. You have hit the bull's eye in the very middle three times. I am a wicked man. I have no heart. I am not worthy to be loved. No, I am not. I should find it a bore. Bore? she echoed. What is that? What is that? It is itself, Manella. Bore is just bore. It means tiredness, worn-outness. A state in which you wish yourself in a hot bath or a cold one, so that nobody can come near you. To be loved would finish me off in a month. Her big eyes opened more widely than their wont in piteous perplexity. But how? she asked. How? Why, just as you have put it. To be prayed for night and morning, to be worked for and waited on till fingers turned to bones, to be guarded from sickness and harm. Heavens! Think of it. No more adventures in life. No more freedom. Just love, 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 which would not be love at all but the chains of a miserable wretch in prison. She flushed an angry crimson. Who is it that would chain you? she demanded. Not I. You could do as you liked with me. You know it. And when you go away from this place, 
you could leave me and forget me i should never trouble you or remind you that i lived i should have had my happiness enough for my day the pathos in her voice moved him though he was not easily moved on a sudden impulse he put an arm about her drew her to him and kissed her she trembled at his caress while he smiled at her emotion a kiss is nothing manella he said we kiss children as i kiss you you are a child a child woman physically you are a juno mentally you are an infant by and by you will grow up and you will be glad i did no more than kiss you it's getting late you must go home he released her and put her gently away from him then as he saw her eyes still uplifted questioningly to his face he laughed upon my word he exclaimed i'm making a nice fool of myself actually wasting time on a woman go home manella go home if you are wise you won't stop here another minute see now you are full of curiosity all women are you want to know why i stay up here in this hill cabin by myself instead of staying at the plaza you think i'm a rich englishman i'm not no englishman is ever rich not up to his own desires he wants the earth and all that therein is does the englishman and of course he can't have it he rather grudges america her large slice of rich plum pudding territory forgetting that he could have had it himself for the price of tea but i don't grudge anybody anything america is welcome to the whole bulk as far as i'm concerned britain ditto let them both eat and be filled all i want is to be left alone do you hear that manella to be left alone particularly by women that's one reason why i came here this cabin is supposed to be a sort of tuberculosis shelter where a patient in hopeless condition comes with a special nurse to die i don't want a nurse and i'm not going to die tubercles don't touch me they don't flourish on my soil so this solitude just suits me if i were at the plaza i should have to meet a lot of women no you wouldn't interrupted manella suddenly and sharply only one woman only one you she sighed and moved impatiently oh no not me a stranger he looked at her with a touch of inquisitiveness an invalid she may be i don't know she has golden hair he gave a gesture of dislike dreadful that's enough i can imagine her a die-away creature with a cough and a straw-coloured wig yes that will do manella you'd better go and wait upon her i've got all i want for a couple of days at least he seated himself and took up his notebook she turned away stop a minute manella she obeyed golden hair you said she nodded old or young she might be either and manella gazed dreamily at the darkening sky there is nobody old nowadays or so it seems to me an invalid i don't think so she looks quite well she arrived at the plaza only yesterday ah well good night manella and if you want to know anything more about me i don't mind telling you this that there's nothing in the world i so utterly detest as a woman with golden hair there she looked at him surprised at his harsh tone he shook a forefinger at her fact he said fact as hard as nails a woman with golden hair is a demon a witch a mischief and a curse see always has been and always will be good night but manella paused meditatively she looks like a witch she said slowly one of those creatures they put in pictures of fairy tales small and white very small i could carry her i wouldn't try it if i were you he answered with visible impatience off you go good night she gave him one lingering glance then turning abruptly picked up her empty milk pail and started down the hill at a run the man she left gave a sigh deep and long of intense relief evening had fallen rapidly and the purple darkness enveloped him in its warm dense gloom he sat absorbed in thought his eyes turned towards the east 
where the last stretches of the afternoon's great cloud trailed filmy threads of woolly black through space. His figure seemed gradually drawn within the coming night, so as almost to become a part of it, and the stillness around him had a touch of awe in its impalpable heaviness. One would have thought that in a place of such utter loneliness the natural human spirit of a man would instinctively desire movement, action of some sort, to shake off the insidious depression which crept through the air like a creeping shadow. But the solitary being, seated somewhat like an Aryan idol, hands on knees and face bent forwards, had no inclination to stir. His brain was busy, and half unconsciously his thoughts spoke aloud in words. "'Have we come to the former old stopping-place?' he said, as though questioning some invisible companion. "'Must we cry halt for the thousand millionth time? Or can we go on? Dare we go on? If actually we discover the secret, wrapped up like the minutest speck of a kernel in the nut of an electron, what then? Will it be well or ill?' Shall we find it worth while to live on here with nothing to do, nothing to trouble us or compel us to labour? Without pain shall we be conscious of health? Without sorrow shall we understand joy? A sudden whiteness flooded the dark landscape, and a full moon leapt to the edge of the receding cloud. Its rising had been veiled in the drift of black woolly vapour, and its silver glare, sweeping through the darkness, flashed over the land with astonishing abruptness. The man lifted his eyes. One would think that done for effect, he said, half aloud. If the moon were the goddess Cynthia, beloved of Endymion, as woman and goddess, in an impulse of vanity, she would certainly have done that for effect. As it is... Here he paused. An instinctive feeling warned him that someone was looking at him, and he turned his head quickly. On the slope of the hill where Manella had lately stood, there was a figure, white as the white moonlight itself, outlined delicately against the dark background. It seemed to be poised on the earth like a bird just lightly descended. In the stirless air its garments appeared closed about it fold on fold, like the petals of an unopened magnolia flower. As he looked, it came gliding towards him with the floating ease of an air bubble and the strong radiance of the large moon showed its woman's face, pale with the moonbeam pallor, and set in a wave of hair that swept back from the brows and fell in a loosely twisted coil like a shining snake, stealthily losing itself in folds of misty drapery. He rose to meet the advancing phantom. Entirely for effect, he said. Well planned and quite worthy of you. All for effect. End of chapter one. Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lena Emsley. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter Two. A laugh, clear and cold as a sleigh bell on a frosty night, rang out on the silence. Why did you run away from me? He replied at once and brusquely. Because I was tired of you. She laughed again. A strange white elf as she looked in the spreading moonbeams. She was woman to the core, and the disdainful movement of her small uplifted head plainly expressed her utter indifference to his answer. "'I followed you,' she said. "'I knew I should find you. What are you doing up here? Shamming to be ill?' "'Precisely. Sham is as much in my line as yours. I have to pretend in order to be real.' "'Paradoxical, as usual.' And she shrugged her shoulders. "'Anyway, you've chosen a good place to do your shamming in. It's quite lovely up here.' much better than the plaza. I am at the plaza. Automobile and all, I suppose, he said sarcastically. How many servants? How many boxes with how many dresses? 
she laughed again that's no concern of yours she replied i am my own mistress more's the pity he retorted they faced each other the moon now soaring high in clear space shed a luminous rain of silver over all the visible breadth of wide country and their two figures looked mere dark silhouettes half drowned in the pearly glamour it's worth travelling all the long miles to see she declared stretching her arms out with an enthusiastic gesture oh beautiful big moon of california i'm glad i came he was silent you are not glad she continued you're a bare man in hiding and the moon says nothing to you it says nothing because it is nothing he answered impatiently it is a dead planet without heart a mere shell of extinct volcanoes where fire once burned and its light is but the reflection of the sun on its barren surface it's like all women but mostly like you she made him a sweeping curtsy so exquisitely graceful that the action resembled nothing so much as the sway of a lily in a light wind thanks gentle knight flower of chivalry she said i see you love me in spite of yourself he made a quick stride towards her then stopped love you he echoed then laughed loudly and derisively great god love you you if i did i should be mad when will you learn the truth of me that women are less in my estimation than the insects crawling on a blade of grass or spawning in a stagnant pond they have no power to move me to the smallest pulse of passion or desire and that you of all your sex seem to my mind the most hateful she suggested smilingly no the most complete and unmitigated bore dreadful and she made a face at him like that of a naughty child then she sank down on the sun-baked turf in an easy half-reclining attitude it's certainly much worse to be a bore than to be hated hate is quite a live sentiment besides it always means or has meant love you can't hate anything that is quite indifferent to you but of course you can be bored you are bored by me and i am bored by you we are absolutely indifferent to each other what a comedy it is isn't it he stood still and sombre gazing down at the figure resting on the ground at his feet its white garments gathering about it as though they were sentiently aware that they must keep the line of classic beauty in every fold boredom is the trouble she went on no one escapes it the very babies of today are bored we all know too much people used to be happy because they were ignorant they had no sort of idea why they were born or what they came into the world for now they've learned the horrid truth that they're only here just as the trees and flowers are here to breed other trees and flowers and then go out of it for no purpose apparently they are disillusioned they say what's the use to put up with so much trouble and labour for the folks coming after us whom we shall never see it seems perfectly foolish and futile they used to believe in another life after this but that hope has been knocked out of them besides it's quite open to question whether any of us would care to live again probably it might mean more boredom there's really nothing left that's why so many of us go reckless it's just to escape being bored he listened in cold silence after a pause have you done he said she looked up at him the moonbeams set tiny frosty sparkles in her eyes have i done she echoed no not quite i love talking and it's a new and amusing sensation for me to talk to a man in his shirt sleeves on a hill in california by the light of the moon so wild and picturesque you know all the men i've ever met have been dressed to death have you had your dinner i never dine he replied really don't you eat and drink at all i live simply he said bread and milk are enough for me and i have these she laughed and clapped her hands like a baby she exclaimed a great bearded baby it's too delicious and you're doing all this just to get away from me what a compliment 
with angry impetus he bent over her reclining figure and seized her two hands get up he said harshly don't lie there like a fallen angel she yielded to his powerful grasp as he pulled her to her feet then looked at him still laughing plenty of muscle she said well he held her hands still and gripped them fiercely she gave a little cry don't you forget my rings they hurt at once he loosened his hold and gazed moodily at her small fingers on which two or three superb diamond circlets glittered like drops of dew your rings he said yes i forgot them wonderful rings emblems of your inordinate vanity and vulgar wealth i forgot them how they sparkle in this wide moonlight don't they just a drifting of nature's refuse matter turned into jewels for women strange ordinance of strange elements there and he let her hands go free they are not injured nor are you she was silent pouting her underlip like a spoiled child and rubbing one finger where a ring had dinted her flesh so you actually think i've come here to get away from you he went on well for once your ineffable conceit is mistaken you think yourself a personage of importance but you are nothing less than nothing to me i never give you a thought i have come here to study to escape from the crazy noise of modern life the hurtling to and fro of the masses of modern humanity i want to work out certain problems which may revolutionize the world and its course of living why revolutionize it she interrupted who wants it to be revolutionized we are all very well as we are it's a breathing place and a dying place voila tout she gave a french shrug of her shoulder and waved her hands expressively then she pushed back her flowing hair the moonbeams trickled like water over it making a network of silver on gold what did you come here for he asked abruptly to see you she answered smilingly and to tell you that i'm on the warpath as they say taking scalps as i go this means that i am travelling about possibly i may go to europe to pick up a bankrupt nobleman he suggested she laughed dear no nothing quite so stupid neither a nobleman nor bankrupts attract me no i'm doing a scientific prowl like you i believe i've discovered something with which i could annihilate you so and she made a round o of her curved fingers and blew through it one breath from a distance too and hey presto the bare man on the hills of california eating bread and milk is gone a complete vanishing trick no more of him anywhere the bare man as she called him gloomed upon her with a scowl you'd better leave such things alone he said angrily women have no business with science no of course not she agreed not in men's opinion that's why they never mention madame curie without the poor monsieur she found radium and he didn't but he is always the first mentioned he gave an impatient gesture enough of all this he said do you know it's nearly ten o'clock at night i suppose you do know and the people at the plaza they know she interrupted nodding sagaciously they know i am rich 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 it doesn't matter what i do because i'm rich i might stay out all night with a bear man and nobody would say a word against me because i am rich i might sit on the roof of the plaza and swing my legs over the visitors windows and it would be called charming because i am rich i can appear at the table d'hote in a bath wrap and eat peas with a hairpin if i like and my conduct will be admired because i am rich when i go to europe my photo will be in all the london pictorials with the grinning chorus girls because i am rich and i shall be called the beautiful the exquisite the fascinating by all the unwashed penny journalists because i am rich oh she gave a little comic screw of her mouth and eyes it's great fun to be rich if you know what to do with your riches do you he inquired sarcastically i think so here she put her head on one side like a meditative bird and her wonderful hair fell aslant like a golden wing 
I amuse myself as much as I can. I learn all that can be done with greedy, stupid humanity for so much cash down. I would. Here she paused, and with a sudden feline swiftness of movement came close up to him. I would have married you, if you would have had me. I would have given you all my money to play with. You could have got everything you want for your inventions and experiments, and I would have helped you. And then, then you could have blown up the world and me with it, so long as you gave me the time to look at the magnificent sight. And I wouldn't have married you for love, mind you, only for curiosity. He withdrew from her a couple of paces. A glimmer of white teeth between his dark moustache and beard gave his face the expression of a snarl more than a smile. For curiosity, she repeated, stretching out a hand and touching his arm. To see what the thing that calls itself a man is made of. I did my very best with you, didn't I? Uncouth as you always were and are. But I did my best, and all Washington thought it was settled. Why wouldn't you do what Washington expected? The light of the moon fell full on her upturned face. It was a wonderful face, not beautiful according to the monotonous press camera type, but radiant, with such a light of daring intelligence as to make beauty itself seem cheap and meretricious in comparison with its glowing animation. He moved away from her another step and shook his arm free from her touch. Why wouldn't you? she reiterated softly. Then with a sudden ripple of laughter she clasped her hands and uplifted them in an attitude of prayer. Why wouldn't he? Oh, big moon of California, why? Oh, pagan gods and goddesses and fauns and fairies, tell me why? Why wouldn't he? He gave her a glance of cool contempt. You should have been on the stage, he said. All the world's a stage, she quoted, letting her upraised arms fall languidly at her sides. And ours is a real comedy. Not as you like it, but as you don't like it. Poor Shakespeare. He never imagined such creatures as we are. Now, suppose you had satisfied the expectations of all Washington City and married me. Of course, we should have bored each other dreadfully. But with plenty of money, we could have run away from each other whenever we liked. They all do it nowadays. Yes, they all do it, he repeated mechanically. They don't love, you know, she went on. Love is too much of a bore. You would find it so. I should indeed, he said with sudden energy. It would be worse than any imaginable torture to be loved and looked after and watched and coddled and kissed. Oh, surely no woman would want to kiss you she exclaimed. Never! That would be too much of a good thing. And she gave a little peal of laughter. Merry as the lilt of a skylark in the dawn. He stared at her angrily, moved by an insensate desire to seize her and throw her down the hill like a bundle of rubbish. To kiss you, she said, one would have to wear a lip shield of leather, as well as kiss a bunch of nettles. No, no, I have quite a nice little mouth soft and rosy. I shouldn't like to spoil it by scratching it against yours. It's curious how all men imagine women like to kiss them. They never grasp an idea of the frequent unpleasantness of the operation. Now I'm going. Thank God, he ejaculated fervently. And don't worry yourself, she continued airily. I shall not stay long at the plaza. Thank God again he interpolated. It would be too dull, especially as I am not shamming to be ill like you. Besides, I have work to do, wonderful work, and I don't believe in doing it shut up like a hermit. Humanity is my crucible. Good night, good bye. He checked her movement by a quick, imperious gesture. Wait, he said. Before you go, I want you to know a bit of my mind. Is it necessary? she queried. I think so, he answered. It will save you the trouble of ever trying to see me again, which will be a relief to me if not to you. Listen, and look at yourself with my eyes. Too difficult, she declared. I can look at nothing with your eyes any more than you can with mine. Madam, 
she uttered a little laughing oh and put her hand to her ears not madam for heaven's sake she exclaimed it sounds as if i were either a queen or a dressmaker his sombre eyes had no smile in them how should you be addressed he demanded a woman of such wealth and independence as you possess can hardly be called miss as if she were in parental leading strings she looked up at the clear dark sky where the moon hung like a huge silver air ball no i suppose not she replied the old english word was mistress so quaint and pretty don't you think oh mistress mine where are you roaming oh stay and hear your true love's coming she sang the two lines in a deliciously entrancing voice full of youth and tenderness with one quick stride he advanced upon her and caught her by the shoulders my god i could shake the life out of you he said fiercely i wonder you are not afraid of me she laughed careless of his grasp why should i be you couldn't kill me if you tried and if you could ah if i could he muttered fiercely why then there would be another murderer to add to the general world of murderers she said that's all it's not worth it still he held her in his grip see here he said before you go i want you to know a thing or two you may as well learn once and for all my views on women they're brief but they're fixed and they're straight women are nothing just necessary for the continuation of the race no more they may be beautiful or homely it's all one they serve the same purpose i'm under no delusions about them without men they are utterly useless mere waste on the wind to idealize them is a stupid mistake to think that they can do anything original intellectual or imaginative is to set oneself down as an idiot you you the spoilt only child of one of the biggest rascal financiers in new york you left alone in the world with a fortune so vast as to be almost criminal you think you are something superlative in the way of women you play the cleopatra you are convinced you can draw men after you but it's your money that draws them not you can't you see that or are you too vain to see it and you've no mercy on them you make them believe you care for them and then you throw them over like empty nutshells that's your way but you never fooled me and you never will he released her as suddenly as he had grasped her she drew her white draperies round her shoulders with a statuesque grace and lifted her head smiling empty nutshells are a very good description of men who come after women for her money she observed placidly and it's quite natural that the woman should throw them over her shoulder there's nothing in them not even a flavour no never fooled you you fooled yourself you are fooling yourself now only you don't know it but there let's finish talking i like the romance of the situation you in your shirt sleeves on a hill in california and i in silken stuff and diamonds paying you a moonlight visit it's really quite novel and charming but it can't go on for ever just now you said you wanted me to know a thing or two and i presume you have explained yourself what you think or what you don't think about women doesn't interest me i am one of the wastes on the wind i shall not aid the continuation of the race heaven forbid the race is too stupid and too miserable to merit continuance everything has been done for it that can be done over and over again from the beginning till now and now now she paused and despite himself the tone of her voice sent a thrill through his blood of something like fear now well what now he demanded she lifted one hand and pointed upwards her face in the moonbeams looked austere and almost spectral in outline now the change she answered the change when all things shall be made new a silence followed her words a strange and heavy silence it was broken by her voice hushed to an extreme softness yet clearly audible good night good-bye he turned impatiently away to avoid further leave-taking then on a sudden impulse his mood changed morgana the call echoed through emptiness 
she was gone. He called again, the long vowel in the strange name sounding more like Morgana, as a shivering note on the G-string of a violin may sound at the conclusion of a musical phrase. There was no reply. He was, as he had desired to be, alone. End of chapter 2 of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 3 she left new york several weeks ago didn't you know it dear me i thought everybody was convulsed at the news the speaker, a young woman, fashionably attired, and seated in a rocking chair in the veranda of a favourite summer hotel on Long Island, raised her eyes and shrugged her shoulders expressively as she uttered these words to a man standing near her with a newspaper in his hand. He was a very stiff-jointed, upright personage, with iron-grey hair and features hard enough to suggest their having been carved out of wood. No, I didn't know it, he said enunciating his words in the deliberate dictatorial manner common to a certain type of American. If I had, I should have taken steps to prevent it. You can't take steps to prevent anything Morgana Royal decides to do, declared his companion. She's a law to herself and to nobody else. I guess you couldn't stop her, Mr. Sam Gwent. Mr. Sam Gwent permitted himself to smile. It was a smile that merely stretched the corners of his mouth a little. It had no geniality. Possibly not, he answered. But I should have had a try. I should certainly have pointed out to her the folly of her present adventure. Do you know what it is? He paused before replying. Well, hardly, but I have a guess. Is that so? Then I'll admit you're cleverer than I am. That's a great compliment. But even Miss Lydia Herbert, brilliant woman of the world as she is, doesn't know everything. Not quite, she replied, stifling a tiny yawn. Nor do you. But most things that are worth knowing I know. There's a lot one need never learn. The chief business of life nowadays is to have heaps of money and know how to spend it. That's Morgana's way. Mr. Sam Gwent folded up his newspaper, flattened it into a neat parcel, and put it in his pocket. She has a great deal too much money, he said, and to my thinking she does not know how to spend it, not in the right womanly way. She has gone off in the midst of many duties to society at a time when she should have stayed. Miss Herbert opened her brown, rather insolent eyes wide at this and laughed. Does it matter? she asked. The old man left his pile to her absolutely and unconditionally, without any orders as to society duties, and I don't believe you've any authority over her, have you? Or are you suddenly turning up as a trustee? He surveyed her with a kind of admiring sarcasm. No, I'm only an uncle, he said. Uncle of the boy that shot himself this morning for her sake. Miss Herbert uttered a sharp cry. She was startled and horrified. What? Jack? shot himself oh how dreadful i'm i'm sorry you're not retorted gwent so don't pretend no one is sorry for anybody else nowadays there's no time and no inclination jack was always a fool perhaps he's best out of it i've just seen him dead he's better looking so than when alive she sprang up from her rocking chair in a blaze of indignation. You're brutal, she exclaimed with a half sob. Positively brutal. Not at all, he answered composedly. Only commonplace. It's you advanced women that are brutal, not we left behind men. Jack was a fool, I say. He staked the whole of his game on Morgana Royal, and he lost. That was the last straw. If he could have married her, he would have cleared all his debts over and over, and that's what he hoped for. The disappointment was too much for him. But, 
Didn't he love her? Lydia Herbert put the question almost imperatively. Mr. Sam Gwent raised his eyebrows quizzically. I guess you came out of the Middle Ages, he observed. What's love? Did you ever know a woman with millions of money who got loved? Not a bit of it. Her money is loved, but not herself. She's the encumbrance to the cash. Then, then, you mean to tell me Jack was only after the money? What else should he be after, the woman? There are thousands of women, all to be had for the asking. They pitch themselves at men headlong. No hesitation or modesty about them nowadays. Jack's asking would never have been refused by any one of them. But the millions of Morgana Royal are not to be got every day. Miss Herbert's rather thin lips tightened into a close line. She flicked some light teardrops away from her eyes with a handkerchief as fine as a cobweb delicately perfumed, and stood silently looking out on the view from the veranda. You see, pursued Gwent in his cold, deliberate accents, Jack was ruined financially, and he has all but ruined me. Now he has taken himself out of the way with a pistol shot and left me to face the music for him. Morgana Royal was his only chance. She led him on. She certainly led him on. He thought he had her. Then, just as he was about to pin the butterfly to his specimen card, away it flew. Cute butterfly, interjected Miss Herbert. Maybe, maybe not. We shall see. Anyway, Jack's game is finished. And I suppose this is why, as you say, Morgana has gone off in the midst of many social duties? Was Jack one of her social duties? Gwent gazed at her with an unrevealing placidity. No, not exactly, he replied. I give her credit for not knowing anything of his intention to clear out, though I don't think she would have tried to alter his intention if she had. Miss Herbert still surveyed the scenery. Well, I don't feel so sorry for him now you tell me it was only the money he was after, she said. I thought he was a finer character. You're talking Middle Ages again, interrupted Gwent. Who wants fine characters nowadays? The object of life is to live, isn't it? And to live means to get all you can for your own pleasure and profit. Take care of number one, and let the rest of the world do as it likes. It's quite your method, though you pretend it isn't. You're not very polite she said. Now why should I be? he pursued argumentatively. What's politeness worth unless you want to flatter something for yourself out of somebody? I never flatter, and I'm never polite. I know just how you feel. You haven't got as much money as you want, and you're looking about for a fellow who has. Then you'll marry him, if you can. You, as a woman, are doing just what Jack did as a man. But if you miss your game, I don't think you'll commit suicide. You're too well balanced for that. And I think you'll succeed in your aims if you're careful. If I'm careful, she echoed questioningly. Yes, if you want a millionaire, especially that old rascal you're after. Don't dress too loud. Don't show all your back. Leave some for him to think about. Don't paint your face. Let it alone and be, or pretend to be, very considerate of folks' feelings. That'll do. Here endeth the first lesson, she said. Thanks, Preacher Gwent. I guess I'll worry through. I guess you will, he answered slowly. I wish I was as certain of anything in the world as I am of that. She was silent. The corners of her mouth twitched slightly as though she sought to conceal a smile. She watched her companion furtively as he took a cigar from a case in his pocket and lit it. I must go and fix up the funeral business, he said. Jack is gone and his remains must be disposed of. That's my affair. Just now his mother's crying over him, and I can't stand that sort of thing. It gets over me. Then you actually have a heart, she suggested. I suppose so. I used to have. But it isn't the heart. That's only a pumping muscle. I conclude it's the head. He puffed two or three rings of smoke into the clear air. You know where she's gone? He asked, suddenly. Morgana? Yes. Lydia Herbert hesitated. I think I know, she replied at last. But I'm not sure. 
Well, I'm sure, said Gwent. She's after the special quarry that has given her the slip. Roger Seaton. He went to California a month ago. Then she's in California? Certain. Mr. Gwent took another puff at his cigar. You must have been in Washington when everyone thought that he and she were going to make a matrimonial tie of it, he went on. Why nothing else was talked of. She nodded. I know, I was there. But a man who has set his soul on science doesn't want a wife. And what about a woman who has set her soul in the same direction? he asked. She shrugged her shoulders. Oh, that's all popcorn. Morgana is not a scientist. She's hardly a student. She just imagines she can do things, but she can't. Well, I'm not so sure. And Gwent looked ruminative. She's got a smart way of settling problems while the rest of us are talking about them. To her own satisfaction only, said Miss Herbert ironically. Certainly not to the satisfaction of anybody else. She talks the wildest nonsense about controlling the world. Imagine it, a world controlled by Morgana. She gave an impatient little shake of her skirts. I do hate these sorts of mysterious philosophizing women, don't you? The old days must have been ever so much better, when it was all poetry and romance and beautiful idealism, when Dante and Beatrice were possible. Gwent smiled sourly. They never were possible, he retorted. Dante, like all poets, was a regular humbug. Any peg served to hang his stuff on, from a child of nine to a girl of eighteen. The stupidest thing ever written is what he called his new life, or Vita Nuova. I read it once, and it made me pretty nice sick. Think of all that twaddle about Beatrice denying him her most gracious salutation. That any creature claiming to be a man could drivel along in such a style beats me altogether. It's perfectly lovely, declared Miss Herbert. You've no taste in literature, Mr. Gwent. I've no taste for humbug, he answered. That's so. I guess I know the difference between tragedy and comedy, even when I see them side by side. He flicked a long burnt ash from his cigar. I've had a bit of comedy with you this morning. Now I'm going to take up the tragedy. I tell you there's more written in Jack's dead face than in all Dante. The tragedy of a lost gamble for money, she said with a scornful uplift of her eyebrows. He nodded. That's so. It upsets the mental balance of a man more than a lost gamble for love. And he walked away. Lydia Herbert, left to herself played idly with the leaves of the vine that clambered about the high wooden columns of the veranda where she stood, admiring the sparkle of her diamond bangle, which, like a thin circlet of dewdrops, glittered on her slim wrist. Now and then she looked far out to the sea gleaming in the burning sun, and allowed her thoughts to wander from herself and her elegant clothes to some of the social incidents in which she had taken part during the past couple of months. She recalled the magnificent ball given by Morgana Royal at her regal home, when all the fashion and frivolity of the noted four hundred were assembled, and when the one whispered topic of conversation among gossips was the possibility of the marriage of one of the richest women in the world to a shabbily clothed scientist without a penny save what he earned with considerable difficulty. Morgana herself played the part of an enigma. She laughed, shook her head, and moved her daintily attired person through the crowd of her guests, with all the gliding grace of a fairy vision in white draperies showered with diamonds, but gave no hint of special favour or attention to any man, not even to Roger Seaton, the scientist in question, who stood apart from the dancing throng in a kind of frowning disdain looking on, much as one might fancy a forest animal looking at the last gambols of prey it purposed to devour. He had taken the first convenient interval to disappear, and as he did not return, Miss Herbert had asked her hostess what had become of him. Morgana, her cheeks flushed prettily by a just-finished dance, smiled in surprise at the question. "'How should I know?' she replied. "'I am not his keeper.' But you are interested in him, Lydia suggested. Interested? Oh, yes, 
who would not be interested in a man who says he can destroy half the world if he wants to he assumes to be a sort of deity you know jove and his thunderbolts in the shape of a man in a badly cut suit of modern clothes isn't it fun she gave a little peal of laughter and every one in the room tonight thinks i am going to marry him and are you not can you imagine it me married lydia lydia do you take me for a fool she laughed again then grew suddenly serious to think of such a thing fancy me giving my life into the keeping of a scientific wizard who if he chose could reduce me to a little heap of dust in two minutes and no one any the wiser thank you the sensational press has been pretty full lately of men's brutalities to women and i have no intention of adding myself to the list of victims men are brutes they were born brutes and brutes they will remain then you don't like him persisted lydia moved in spite of herself by curiosity and also by a vague wonder at the strange brilliancy of complexion and eyes which gave to morgana a beauty quite unattainable by features only you're not set on him morgana held up a finger listen she said isn't that a lovely valse doesn't the music seem to sweep round and tie us all up in a garland of melody how far far above all these twirling human microbes it is as far as heaven from earth if we could really obey the call of that music we should rise on wings and fly to such wonderful worlds as it is we can only hop round and round like motes in a sunbeam and imagine we are enjoying ourselves for an hour or two but the music means so much more she paused enwrapped then in a lighter tone went on and you think i would marry i would not marry an emperor if there was one worth having which there isn't and as for roger seaton i certainly am not set on him as you so elegantly put it and he is not set on me we're both set on something else she was standing near an open window as she spoke and she looked up at the dark purple sky sprinkled with stars she continued slowly and with emphasis i might possibly i might have helped him to that something else if i had not discovered something more she lifted her hand with a commanding gesture as though unconsciously then let it drop at her side lydia herbert looked at her perplexedly you talk so very strangely she said morgana smiled yes i know i do she admitted i am what old scotswomen call fay you know i was born away in the hebrides my father was a poor herder of sheep at one time before he came over to the states i was only a baby when i was carried away from the islands of mist and rain but i was fay from my birth what is fay interrupted miss herbert it's just everything that everybody else is not morgana replied fay people are magic people they see what no one else sees they hear voices that no one else hears voices that whisper secrets and tell of wonders as yet undiscovered she broke off suddenly we must not stay talking here she resumed all the folks will say we are planning the bridesmaids dresses and that the very day of the ceremony is fixed but you can be sure that i am not going to marry anybody least of all roger seaton you like him though i can see you like him of course i like him he's a human magnet he draws you fly towards him as if he were a bit of rubbed sealing wax and you a snippet of paper but you soon drop off oh that valse isn't it entrancing and swinging herself round lightly like a bell-flower in a breeze she danced off alone and vanished in the crowd of her guests lydia herbert recalled this conversation now as she stood looking from the vine-clad veranda of her hotel towards the sea and again saw as in a vision the face and eyes of her fay friend a face by no means beautiful in feature 
but full of a sparkling attraction which was almost irresistible. Nothing in her, had declared New York society generally, except her money and her hair, but not even that unless she lets it down. Lydia had seen it so let down, once and only once, and the sight of such a glistening rope of gold had fairly startled her. All your own? she had gasped, and with a twinkling smile and comic hesitation of manner, Morgana had answered, I, I think it is. It seems so. I don't believe it will come off unless you pull very hard. Lydia had not pulled hard, but she had felt the soft rippling mass falling from head to far below the knee, and had silently envied the owner its possession. It's a great bother, Morgana declared. I never know what to do with it. I can't dress it fashionably one bit, and when I twist it up it's so fine it goes into nothing and never looks the quantity it is. However, we must all have our troubles. With some it's teeth, with others it's ankles. We're never quite all right. The thing is to endure without complaining. And this curious creature who talked so very strangely possessed millions of money. Her father, who had arrived in the States from the wildest north of Scotland with practically not a penny, had so gathered and garnered every opportunity that came his way, that every investment he touched seemed to turn to five times its first value under his fingers. When his wife died very soon after his wealth began to accumulate, he was beset by women of beauty and position eager to take her place, but he was adamant against all their blandishments, and remained a widower, devoting his entire care to the one child he had brought with him as an infant from the highland hills, and to whom he gave a brilliant but desultory and uncommon education. Life seemed to swirl round him in a glittering ring of gold, of which he made himself the centre. And when he died suddenly, from overstrain, as the doctors said, people were almost frightened to name the vast fortune his daughter inherited, accustomed as they were to the counting of many millions. And now? California, mused Lydia. Sam Gwent thinks she has gone there after Roger Seaton. But what can be her object if she doesn't care for him? It's far more likely that she started for Sicily. She's having a palace built there for her small self to live in, all by her lonesome. Well, she can afford it. And with a short sigh she let go her train of thought and left the veranda. It was time to change her costume and prepare effects, to dazzle and bewilder the uncertain mind of a crafty old Croesus who, having freely enjoyed himself as a bachelor up to his present age of seventy-four, was now looking about for a young strong woman to manage his house and be a nurse and attendant for him in his declining years, for which service, should she be suitable, he would concede to her the name of wife, in order to give stability to her position. And Lydia Herbert herself was privately quite aware of his views. Moreover, she was entirely willing to accommodate herself to them for the sake of riches and a luxurious life, and the settlement she meant to insist upon if her plans ripened to fulfilment. She had no great ambitions, few women of her social class have, to be well housed, well fed and well clothed, and enabled to do the fashionable round without hindrance. This was all she sought, and of romance, sentiment, emotion or idealism, she had none. Now and again she caught the flash of a thought in her brain higher than the level of material needs, but dismissed it more quickly than it came, as ridiculous, absolute nonsense, like Morgana. And to be like Morgana meant to be what cynics designate an impossible woman, independent of opinions, and therefore not understood of the people. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four. Why do you stare at me? You have such big eyes. Morgana, dotted only in a white silk nightgown, sitting on the edge of her bed with her small rosy toes peeping out beneath the tiny frill of her thin garment, looked at the broad-shouldered, handsome girl Manella, who had just brought in her breakfast tray, and now stood regarding her with an odd expression of mingled admiration and shyness. Such big eyes, she repeated, like the great headlamps flaring out of that motor brain of yours. What do you see in me? Manella's brown skin flushed crimson. Something I have never seen before, she answered. You are so small and white, not like a woman at all. Morgana laughed merrily. Not like a woman? Oh dear, what am I like then? Manella's eyes grew darker than ever in the effort to explain her thought. I do not know, she said, hesitatingly. But once, here in this garden, we found a wonderful butterfly with white wings, all white. It was resting on a scarlet flower. We all went out to look at it, because it was unlike any other butterfly we had ever seen. Its wings were like velvet or swan's down. You remind me of that butterfly. Morgana smiled. Did it fly away? Oh, yes, very soon, and an hour or so after it had flown, the scarlet flower where it had rested was dead. Most thrilling, and Morgana gave a little yawn. Is that breakfast, yes? Stay with me while I have it. Are you the head chambermaid at the plaza? Manella shrugged her shoulders. I do not know what I am. I do everything I am asked to do as well as I can. Obliging creature, and are you well paid? As much as I want, Manella answered indifferently. But there is no pleasure in the work. Is there pleasure in any work? If one works for a person one loves, surely yes. The girl murmured, as if she was speaking to herself, the days would be too short for all the work to be done. Morgana glanced at her, and the flash of her eyes had the grey blue of lightning. Then she poured out the coffee and tasted it. Not bad, she commented. Did you make it? Manella nodded, and went on talking at random. I dare say it is not as good as it ought to be, she said. If you had brought your own maid, I should have asked her to make it. Women of your class like their food served differently to us poor folk. I don't know their ways. Morgana laughed. You quaint, handsome thing. What do you know about it? What, in your opinion, is my class? Manella pulled nervously at the ends of the bright-coloured kerchief she wore knotted across her bosom, and hesitated a moment. Well, for one thing, you are rich, she said at last. There is no mistaking that. Your lovely clothes, you must spend a fortune on them. Then, all the people here wonder at your automobile. And your chauffeur says it is the most perfect one ever made. And all these riches make you think you ought to have everything just as you fancy it. I suppose you ought, I am not sure. I don't believe you have much feeling. You couldn't, you know. It is not as if you wanted something very badly, and there was no chance of you getting it. Your money would buy all you could desire. It would even buy you a man. Morgana paused in the act of pouring out a second cup of coffee, and her face dimpled with amusement. Buy me a man, she echoed. You think it would? Of course it would, Manella averred if you wanted one, which I dare say you don't. For all I know, you may be like the man who is living in the consumption hut on the hill. He ought to have a woman, but he doesn't want one. Morgana buttered her little breakfast roll very delicately. The man who lives in the consumption hut on the hill, she repeated slowly, and with a smile. What man is that? I don't know. 
and Manella's large, dark eyes filled with a strangely wistful perplexity. He is a stranger, and he is not ill at all. He is big and strong and healthy, but he has chosen to live in the house of the dying, as it is sometimes called, where people from the plaza go when there is no more hope for them. He likes to be quite alone. He thinks and writes all day. I take him milk and bread. It is all he orders from the plaza. I would be his woman. I would work for him from morning till night. But he will not have me. Morgana raised her eyes, glittering with the fey light in them that often bewildered and rather scared her friends. You would be his woman. You are in love with him? she said. Something in her look checked Manella's natural impulse to confide in one of her own sex. No, I am not, she answered coldly. I have said too much. Morgana smiled, and stretching out her small white hand, adorned with its sparkling rings, laid it caressingly on the girl's brown wrist. You are a dear, she murmured lazily. Just a dear. A big, beautiful creature with a heart. That's the trouble. Your heart. You found a man living selfishly alone, scribbling what he perhaps thinks are the most wonderful things ever put on paper, when they are very likely nothing but rubbish, and it enters into your head that he wants mothering and loving. He doesn't want anything of the sort. And you want to love and mother him. Oh, heavens! Have you ever thought what loving and mothering mean? Manella drew a quick, soft breath. All the world, surely, she answered with emotion. To love, to possess the one we love, body and soul, and to mother a life born of such love, that must be heaven. The smile flitted away from Morgana's lips, and her expression became almost sorrowful. You are like a trusting animal, she said, an animal all innocent of guns and steel traps, you poor girl. I should like you to come with me, out of these mountain solitudes, into the world. What is your name? Manella. Manella what? Manella Soriso, the girl answered. I am Spanish by both parents. They are dead now. I was born at Monterey. Morgana began to hum softly. Under the walls of Monterey, at dawn the bugles began to play. Come forth to thy death, Victor Galbraith. She broke off, then said, You have not seen many men. Oh, yes, I have. And Manella tossed her head airily. Men all more or less alike. Greedy for dollars, fond of smoke and cinema women. I do not care for them. Some have asked me to marry, but I would rather hang myself than be wife to one of them. Morgana slid off the edge of her bed and stood upright, her white silk nightgown falling symmetrically round her small figure. With a dexterous movement she loosened the knot into which she had twisted her hair for the night, and it fell in a sinuous coil like a golden snake from head to knee. Manella stepped back in amazement. Oh, she cried, how beautiful! I have quite as much in quantity, but it is black and heavy, ugly, no good. And he, that man who lives in the hut on the hill, says there is nothing he hates so much as a woman with golden hair. How can he hate such a lovely thing? Morgana shrugged her shoulders. Each one to his taste, she said airily. Some like black hair, some red, some gold, some not brown. But does it matter at all what men think or care for? To me it is perfectly indifferent. And you are quite right to prefer hanging to marriage. I do myself. Fascinated by her wonderful elfin look, as she stood like a white iris in its silken sheath, her small body's outline showing dimly through the folds of her garment, Manella drew nearer, somewhat timidly. Ah, but I do not mean that I prefer hanging to real, 
true marriage she said when one loves it is different in love i would rather hang than not give myself to the man i love give myself in all i am and all i have and you you who look so pretty and wonderful almost like a fairy do you not feel like that too morgana laughed a little laugh sweet and cold as rain tinkling on glass no indeed she answered i have never felt like that i hope i shall never feel like that to feel like that is to feel like the female beasts of the field who only wait and live to be used by the males giving all they are and all they have poor creatures the bull does not love the cow he gives her a calf when the calf is born and old enough to get along by itself it forgets its mother just as its mother forgets it while the sire is blissfully indifferent to both it's really the same thing with human animals especially nowadays only we haven't the honesty to admit it no manella sariso with your good looks you ought to be far above feeling like that you are a nobler creature than the cow no wonder men despise women who are always on the cow level she laughed again and tripped lightly to the looking-glass i must dress she said and you can take a message to my chauffeur and tell him to get everything ready to start i've had a lovely night's rest and i am quite fit for a long run oh are you going and manella gave a little cry of pain i am sorry i do want you to stay morgana's eyes flashed mingled humour and disdain you quaint creature why should i stay there's nothing to stay for if there is nothing to stay for why did you come this was an unexpected question the result of a subconscious suggestion in manella's mind which she herself could not have explained morgana seemed amused what did i come for really i hardly know i am full of odd whims and fancies and i like to humour myself in various ways i think i wanted to see a bit of california that's all then why not see more of it persisted manella enough is better than too much laughed morgana i am easily bored this plaza hotel would bore me to death what do you want me to stay for to see your man on the mountain no manella replied with sudden sharpness no i would not like you to see him he would either hate you or love you the grey-blue lightning flash glittered in morgana's eyes you are a curious girl she said slowly you might be a tragic actress and make your fortune on a stage with that voice and that look and yet you stay here as help in a sanatorium well it's a dull dreary way of living but i suppose you like it i don't like it declared manella vehemently i hate it but what am i to do i have no home and no money i must earn my living somehow will you come away with me said morgana i'll take you at once if you like manella stared in a kind of childlike wonderment her big dusky eyes grew brilliant then clouded with a sombre sadness thank you signora she answered pronouncing the spanish form of address with a lingering sweetness it is very good of you but i should not please you i do not know the world and i am not quick to learn i am better where i am a little smile dreamy and mysterious crept round morgana's lips yes perhaps you are she said i understand you would not like to leave him i am sure that is so you want to feed your big bear regularly with bread and milk yes you poor deluded child courage you may still have a chance to be as you say his woman and when you are i wonder how you will like it she laughed and began to brush her shining hair out in two silky lengths on either side 
manella gazed and gazed at the glittering splendour till she could gaze no more for sheer envy and then she turned slowly and left the room alone morgana continued brushing her hair meditatively then twisting it up in a great coil out of her way she proceeded with her toilette everything of the very finest and daintiest was hers to wear from the silken hose to the delicate lace camisole and when she reached the finishing point in her admirably cut summer serge gown and becoming close-fitting hat she studied herself from head to foot in the mirror with fastidious care to be sure that every detail of her costume was perfect she was fully aware that she was not a newspaper camera beauty and that she had subtle points of attraction which no camera could ever catch and it was just these points which he knew how to emphasize i hate untidy travellers she would say horrors of men and women in oilskins smelling of petrol no goblin ever seen in a nightmare could be uglier than the ordinary motorist she had no luggage with her save an adaptable suitcase which she declared held everything this she quickly packed and locked ready for her journey then she stepped to the window and waved her hand towards the near hill and the hut of the dying fool of a bear man she said apostrophizing the individual she chose to call by that name here you come along to a wild place in california running away from me and here you find a sort of untutored female savage eager and willing to be your woman well why not she's just the kind of thing you want to fetch wood draw water cook food and bear children and when the children come they'll run about the hill like savages themselves and yell and dance and be greedy and dirty and you'll presently wonder whether you are a civilized man or a species of unthinking baboon you will be living the baboon life and your brain will grow thicker and harder as you grow older and your great scientific discovery will be buried in the thickness and hardness and never see the light of day all this if she is your woman it's a great if of course but she's big and handsome with a beautiful body and splendid strength and i never heard of a man who could resist beauty and strength together as for me and my vulgar wealth as you call it i am a little wisp of straw not worth your thought or so you assume no good bear not till we come to a tussle if we ever do she took up her gloves and handbag and went downstairs entering the broad airy flower-bordered lounge of the plaza with a friendly nod and smile to the bookkeeper in the office where she paid her bill her chauffeur a smart frenchman in quiet livery was awaiting her with an assistant groom or page beside him we go on to-day madame he inquired yes we go on she replied as quickly and as far as possible just fetch my valise it's ready packed in my room the groom hurried away to obey this order and morgana glancing around her saw that she was an object of intense curiosity to some of the hotel inmates who were in the lounge men and women both her grey-blue eyes flashed over them all carelessly and lighted on manella who stood shrinking aside in a corner to her she beckoned smilingly come and see me off she said take a look at my car and see how you'd like to travel in it manella pursed her lips and shook her head i'd rather not she murmured it's no use looking at what one can never have morgana laughed as you please she said you are an odd girl but you are quite beautiful don't forget that tell a man on the mountain that i said so quite beautiful good-bye she passed through the lounge with a swift grace of movement and entered her sumptuous limousine lined richly in corded rose silk and fitted with every imaginable luxury like a queen's boudoir on wheels while manella craned her neck forward to see the last of her her valise was quickly strapped in place and in another minute to the sound of a high silvery bugle note which was the only sort of hooter she would tolerate 
the car glided noiselessly away down the broad dusty white road its polished enamel and silver points glittering like streaks of light vanishing into deeper light as it disappeared there goes the richest woman in america said the hotel clerk for the benefit of anyone who might care to listen to the announcement morgana royal is that so drawled a sallow-faced man reclining in an invalid chair she's not much to look at and he yawned expansively he was right she was not much to look at but she was more than looks ever made so with sorrow and envy thought manella who instinctively felt that though she herself might be something to look at and quite beautiful she was nothing else she had never heard the word fay the mystic glamour of the western highlands was shut away from her by the wide barrier of many seas and curtains of cloud and therefore she did not know that fay women are a race apart from all other women in the world. End of chapter 4secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 5 that evening at sunset manella made her way towards the hill and the house of the dying moved by she knew not what strange impulse she had no excuse whatever for going she knew that the man living up there in whom she was so much interested had as much food for three days as he asked for or desired and that he was likely to be vexed at the very sight of her yet she had an eager wish to tell him something about the wonderful little creature with lightning eyes who had left the plaza that morning and had told her manella that she was quite beautiful pride and an innocent feminine vanity thrilled her if another woman thinks so it must be so she argued being aware that women seldom admire each other she walked swiftly with head bent and was brought to a startled halt by meeting and almost running against the very individual she sought who in his noiseless canvas shoes and with his panther-like tread had come upon her unawares checked in her progress she stood still her eyes quickly lifted her lips apart in her adoration of the strength and magnificent physique of the stranger whom she knew only as a stranger she thought he looked splendid as a god descending from the hill far from feeling godlike he frowned as he saw her where are you going he demanded brusquely the rich colour warmed her cheeks to a rose red that matched the sunset i was going to see if if you wanted anything she stammered almost humbly you know i do not he said you can spare yourself the trouble she drew herself up with a slight air of offence if you want nothing why do you come down into the valley she asked you say you hate the plaza i do and he spoke almost vindictively but at the moment there's someone there i want to see her black eyes opened inquisitively a man no strange to say a woman a sudden light flashed on her mind i know she exclaimed but you will not see her she has gone what do you mean he asked impatiently what do you know oh i know nothing and there was a sobbing note of pathos in her voice but i feel here and she pressed her hands against her bosom something tells me that you have seen her the little wonderful white woman sweetly perfumed like a rose with her silks and jewels and her fairy car and her golden hair ah you said you hated a woman with golden hair is that the woman you hate he stood looking at her with an amused half scornful expression hate is too strong a word he answered she isn't worth hating 
her brows contracted in a frown i do not believe that she said you are not speaking truly more likely it is i think you love her he caught her roughly by the arm stop that he exclaimed angrily you are foolish and insolent whether i love or hate anybody or anything is no affair of yours how dare you speak to me as if it were she shrank away from him her lips quivered and tears welled through her lashes forgive me oh forgive she murmured pleadingly i am sorry so you ought to be he retorted you manella imagine yourself in love with me yes you do and you cannot leave me alone no amorous man ever cadged round for love as much or as shamelessly as an amorous woman then you see another woman on the scene and though she's nothing but a stray visitor at the plaza where you help wash up the plates and dishes you suddenly conceive a lot of romantic foolery in your head and imagine me to be mysteriously connected with her oh for god's sake don't cry it's the most awful bore there's nothing to cry for you've set me up like a sort of doll in a shrine and you want to worship me well i simply won't be worshipped as for your little wonderful white woman sweetly perfumed like a rose i don't mind saying that i know her and i don't mind also telling you that she came up the hill last night to ferret me out step by step manella drew nearer her eyes blazing she went to see you she did that in the darkness like a thief or a serpent he laughed aloud no thief and no serpent in it he said and no darkness but in the full light of the moon such a moon it was too a regular stage moon a perfect setting for such an actress in her white gown and her rope of gold hair yes it was very well planned effective in its way though it left me cold ah but it did not leave you cold cried manella else you would not have come down to see her to-day you say she went to ferret you out of course she did he interrupted her she would ferret out any man she wanted for the moment forests could not hide him caves could not cover him if she made up her mind to find him i had hoped she would not find me but she has however you say she is gone the colour had fled from manella's face she was pale and rigid she will come back she said stiffly i hope not and he threw himself carelessly down on the turf to rest come and sit beside me here and tell me what she said to you but manella was silent her dark passionate eyes rested upon him with a world of scorn and sorrow in their glowing depths come he repeated don't stare at me as if i were some new sort of reptile i think you are she said coldly you seem to be a man but you have not the feelings of a man oh have i not and he gave a light gesture of indifference i have the feelings of a modern man the culture of perfect super-german yes that is so sentiment is the mere fly-trap of sensuality the feeler thrust out to scent the prey but once the fly is caught the trap closes do you understand no of course you don't you are a dreadfully primitive woman i did not think you were german she said nor did i and he laughed nor am i i said just now that i had the culture of a super german and a super german means something above every other male creature except himself he cannot get away from himself nor can i that's the trouble come a baby manella sit down here beside me very slowly and very reluctantly she did as he requested she sat on the grass some three or four paces off he stretched out a hand to touch her but she pushed it back very decidedly he smiled i mustn't make love to you this morning eh he queried all right i don't want to make love it doesn't interest me i only want to put you in a good temper you are like a rumpled pussy-cat your fur must be stroked the right way you will not stroke it so said manella disdainfully no no never again oh dire tragedy and he stretched himself out on the turf with his arms above his head but what does it matter give me your news silly child 
what did the little wonderful white woman say to you you want to know i think so i am conscious of a certain barbaric spirit of curiosity like that of a savage who sees a photograph of himself for the first time yes i want to know what the modern feminine said to the primitive manella gave an impatient gesture i do not understand all your fine words she said but i will answer you i told her about you how you had come to live in the hut for the dying on the hill rather than at the plaza and how i took to you all the food you asked for and she seemed amused amused he echoed yes amused she laughed she looks very pretty when she laughs and and she seemed to fancy he lifted himself upright in a sitting posture seemed to fancy what that i was not bad to look at and manella gathering sudden boldness lifted her dark eyes to his face she said i could tell you that she thinks me quite beautiful yes quite beautiful he smiled a smile that was more like a sneer so you are i've told you so often there needs no ghost from the grave to emphasize the fact but she the purring cat she told you to repeat her opinion to me because can you guess why no simpleton because she wishes you to convey to me the message that she considers me your lover and that she admires my taste now she'll go back to new york full of the story the subtle little devil but i am not your lover and never shall be not even for half an hour manella sprang up from the turf where she had been sitting i know that she said and her splendid eyes flashed proud defiance i know i have been a fool to let myself care for you i do not know why i did it was an illness but i am well now you are well now good oh let us be joyful keep well manella and be quite beautiful as you are to be quite beautiful is a fine thing not so fine as it used to be in the greek period still it has its advantages i wonder what you will do with your beauty as he spoke he rose stretching and shaking himself like a forest animal what will you do with it he repeated you must give it to somebody you must transmit it to your offspring that's the old law of nature it's getting a bit monotonous still it's the law now she the wonderful white woman she's all for upsetting the law fortunately she's not beautiful she is exclaimed manella i think her so he looked down upon her from his superior height with tolerant amusement really you think her so and she thinks you so quite a mutual admiration society and both of you obsessed by the same one man i pity that man the only thing for him to do is to keep out of it no manella think as you like she is not beautiful you are beautiful but she is clever you are not clever you may thank god for that she is outrageously unnaturally cursedly clever and her cleverness makes her see the sham of life all through the absurdity of birth that ends in death the freakishness of civilization to no purpose and she's out for something else she wants something newer than sex attraction and family life her husband would bore her to extinction the care of children would send her into a lunatic asylum manella looked bewildered i cannot understand she said a woman lives for husband and children some women do he answered not all there are a good few who don't want to stay on the animal level men try to keep them there but it's a losing game nowadays foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but we cannot fail to see that when mother fox has reared her puppies she sends them off about their own business and doesn't know them any more likewise mother bird does the same nature has no sentiment we have because we cultivate artificial feelings we imagine love when we only want something that pleases us for the moment to live as you say for husband and children would make a woman a slave a great many women are slaves but they are beginning to get emancipated and the woman with the golden hair whom you so much admire 
is emancipated. Manella gave a slight disdainful movement of her head. That only means she is free to do what she likes, she said. To marry or not to marry, to love or not to love. I think if she loved at all, she would love very greatly. Why did she go so secretly in the evening to see you? I suppose she loves you. A sudden red flush of anger coloured his brow. Yes, he answered with a kind of vindictive slowness. I suppose she does. You, Manella, are after me as a man merely. She is after me as a brain. You would steal my physical liberty. She would steal my innermost thought. And you will both be disappointed. Neither my body nor my brain shall ever be dominated by a woman. He turned from her abruptly, and began the ascent that led to his solitary retreat. Once he looked back. Don't let me see you for two days at least, he called. I've more than enough food to keep me going. He strode on, and Manella stood watching him, her tall, handsome figure silhouetted against the burning sky. Her dark eyes were moist with suppressed tears of shame and suffering. She felt herself to be wronged and slighted undeservedly. And beneath this personal emotion came now a smarting sense of jealousy. For in spite of all he had said, she felt that there was some secret between him and the little wonderful white woman which she could not guess and which was probably the reason for his self-sought exile and seclusion. I wish now I had gone with her, she mused, for if I am quite beautiful as she said, she might have helped me in the world. I might have become a lady. She walked slowly and dejectedly back to the plaza knowing in her heart that lady or no lady, her rich beauty was useless to her, inasmuch as it made no effect on the one man she had elected to care for, unwanted and unasked. Certain physiologists teach that the law of natural selection is that the female should choose her mate, but the difficulty along this line of argument is that she may choose where her choice is unwelcome and irresponsive. Manella was a splendid type of primitive womanhood, healthy, warm-blooded, and full of hymeneal passion. As a wife she would have been devoted, as a mother superb in her tenderness. But measured by modern standards of advanced and restless femininity, she was a mere drudge, without the ability to think for herself or to analyse subtleties of emotion. Intellectuality had no part in her. Most people's talk was for her meaningless and she had not the patience to listen to any conversation that rose above the food and business of the day. She was confused and bewildered by everything the strange recluse on the hill said to her. She could not follow him at all. And yet the purely physical attraction he exercised over her nature drew her to him like a magnet, and kept her in a state of feverish craving for a love she knew she could never win. She would have gladly been his servant on the mere chance and hope that possibly in some moment of abandonment he might have yielded to the importunity of her tenderness. Adonis himself, in all the freshness of his youth, never exercised a more potent spell upon enamoured Venus than this plain, big, bearded man over the lonely, untutored Californian girl, with the large loveliness of a goddess and the soul of a little child. What was the singular fascination which, like the pull of a magnetic storm on telegraph wires, forced a woman's tender heart under the careless foot of a rough creature as indifferent to it as to a flower he trampled in his path? Nature might explain it in some unguarded moment of self-betrayal. But nature is jealous of her secrets. They have to be coaxed out of her in the slow course of centuries. And with all the coaxing, the subtle work of her woven threads between the like and the unlike remains an unsolved mystery. End of chapter 5《of the Secret Power》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christoph. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 6. From California to Sicily is a long way. It used to be considered far longer than it is now, but in these magical days of aerial and motor travelling, distance counts but little. Indeed, as almost nothing to the mind of any man or woman brought up in America, and therefore accustomed to hustle. Morgana Royal had hustled the whole business, staying in Paris a few days only, in Rome but two nights, and now here she was, as if she had been spirited over sea and land by supernatural power, seated in a perfect paradise garden of flowers, and looking out on the blue Mediterranean with dreamy eyes, in which the lightning flash was nearly, if not wholly, subdued. About quarter of a mile distant, and seen through the waving tops of pines and branching oleander, stood the house to which the garden belonged. A restored palace of ancient days, built of rose marble on the classic lines of Greek architecture. Its restoration was not quite finished. Numbers of busy workmen were employed on the façade and surrounding lodger, and now and again she turned to watch them, with a touch of invisible impatience in her movement. A slight smile sweetened her mouth as she presently perceived one figure approaching her, a lithe, dark, handsome man who, when he drew near enough, lifted his hat with a profoundly marked reverence, and, had she extended her hand, raised it to his lips. "'A thousand welcomes, madame,' he said, speaking in English with a scarcely noticeable foreign accent. "'Last night I heard you had arrived, but could hardly believe the good fortune. You must have travelled quickly.' "'Never quickly enough for my mind,' she answered. "'The whole world moves too slowly for me.' "'Ah, you must carry that complaint to the Buen d'Or,' he said gaily. "'Perhaps he will condescend to spin this rolling planet a little faster. "'But in my mind time flies far too rapidly. "'I have worked, we all have worked, to get this place finished for you. "'Yet much remains to be done,' she interrupted him. The interior is quite perfect, she said. You have carried out my instructions more thoroughly than I imagined could be possible. It is now an abode for fairies to live in, for poets to dream in, for women to love in, he said, with a sudden warmth in his dark eyes. She looked at him, laughing. <laughs> you poor Marchese, she said. Still you think of love. I really believe Italians keep all the sentiment of Le Moine age in their hearts. Other peoples are gradually letting it go. You are like a child believing in childish things. You imagine I could be happy with a lover, or several lovers, to moon all day and embrace all night. Oh, fee, what a waste of time. And in the end, nothing is so fatiguing. She broke off a spray of flowering laurel, and hit him with it playfully on the hand. Don't moon or spoon, caro amico. What is it all about? Do I leave you nothing on which to write poetry? I find you, out in Sicily, a delightful poor nobleman with a family history going back to the Caesars. Handsome, clever, with beautiful ideas, and I choose and commission you to restore and rebuild for me a fairy palace out of a half-ruined ancient one, because you have taste and skill. And I know you can do everything, when money is no object, and you have done, and are doing it all perfectly. Why then spoil it by falling in love with me? Fie, fie! She laughed again, and, rising, gave him her hand. Hold that, she said, and while you hold it, tell me of my other palace, the one with wings. He clasped her small white fingers in his own sun-browned palm, and walked beside her, bareheaded. Ah! And he drew a deep breath. 
That is a miracle. What we called your impossible plan has been made possible. But who would have thought that a woman— Stop there, she interrupted. Do not repeat the old gander cackle of barbaric men, who, while owing his every comfort as well as the continuance of his race to woman, denied her every intellectual initiative. Who would have thought that a woman could do anything but bend low for a man with grovelling humanity, saying, My lord, here am I, the waiting vessel of your lordship's pleasure. Possess me, or I die. We have changed that beggarly attitude. Her eyes flashed, her voice rang out. The little fingers he held stiffened resolutely in his clasp. He looked at her with a touch of anxiety. Pardon me, I did not mean, he stammered. In a second her mood changed, and she laughed. No, of course you did not mean anything, Marquies. You are naturally surprised that my idea, which was little more than an idea, has resolved itself into a scientific fact. But you would have been just as surprised if the conception had been that of a man instead of a woman. Only you would not have said so. She laughed again, a laugh of real enjoyment, then went on. Now tell me, what of my white eagle? What movement? What speed? Amazing! And the Marquis slowed his voice to almost a whisper. I hardly dare speak of it. It is something supernatural. We have carried out your instructions to the letter. The thing is living, in all respects, save life. I made the test with the fluid you gave me. I charged the cell secretly. None of the mechanics saw what I did, and when she rose in the air, they were terrified. Brave souls, said Morgana, and now she withdrew her hand from his grasp. So you went up alone. I did. The steering was easy. She obeyed the helm. It was as though she were a light yacht in the sea, wind and tide in her favour, but her speed outran every airship I have ever known, as also the height to which she ascends. We will take a trip in her tomorrow, pour passer le temps, said Morgana. You shall choose a place for us to go. Nothing can stop us, nothing on this earth or in the air, and nothing can destroy us. I can guarantee that. Giglio Rivardi gazed at her wonderingly. His dark, deep southern eyes expressed admiration with a questioning doubt commingled. "'You are very sure of yourself,' he said gently. "'Of course, one cannot but marvel that your brain should have grasped in so short a time what men all over the world are still trying to discover. Men are slow animals,' she said lightly. "'They spend years in talking instead of in doing. Then again, when one of them really does something, all the rest are up in arms against him, and more years are wasted in trying to prove him right or wrong. I, as a mere woman, ask nobody for an opinion. I risk my own existence, spend my own money, and have nothing to do with governments. If I succeed, I shall be sought after fast enough, but I do not propose to either give or sell my discovery. Surely you will not keep it to yourself. Why not? The world is too full of inventions as it is, and it is not the least grateful to its inventors or explorers. It would make the fool of a film a threefold millionaire, but it would leave a great scientist or a noble thinker to starve. No, no, let it swing on its own round. I shall not enlighten it. She walked on, gathering a flower here and there, and he kept place beside her. The men who are working here, he at last ventured to say, are deeply interested. You can hardly expect them not to talk among each other, and in the outside clubs and meeting places of the wonderful mechanism on which they have been engaged. They have been at it now steadily for fifteen months. Do I not know it? And she turned her head to him, smiling. Have I not paid their salaries regularly, and yours? I do not care how they talk or where. 
They have built the white eagle, but they cannot make her fly, not without me. You were as brave as I thought you would have been when you decided to fly alone, trusting the means which I gave you, and which alone can give. She broke off and was silent for a moment. Then, laying her hand lightly on his arm, she added, I thank you for your confidence in me. As I have said, you were brave. You must have felt that you risked your life on a chance. Nevertheless, for once, you allowed yourself to believe in a woman. Not only for once, but for always would I so believe in such a woman, if she would permit me, he answered in a low tone of intense passion. She smiled. Ah, the old story. My dear Marquise, do not fret your intellectual perception uselessly. Think what we have in store for us. Such wonders as none yet have explored. The mysteries of the high and the low, the light and the dark, and in those far-off spaces strewn with stars, we may even hear things that no mortal yet has heard. And what is the use of it all? he suddenly demanded. She opened her blue eyes in amaze. The use of it? You ask the use of it? Yes, the use of it, without love, he answered, his voice shaken with a sudden emotion. Madonna, forgive me. Listen with patience for one moment, and think of the whole world, mastered and possessed, but without anyone to love in it, without anyone to love you. Suppose you could command the elements. Suppose every force that science could bestow were yours, and yet no love for you, no love in yourself for anyone. What would be the use of it all? Think, Madonna. She raised her delicate eyebrows in a little surprise. A faint smile was on her lips. Dear Marquise, I do think, I have thought, she answered, and I have observed, love, such as I imagined it when I was quite a young girl, does not exist. The passion called by that name is too petty and personal for me. Men have made love to me often, not as prettily perhaps as you do, but in America at least love means dollars. Yes, truly. Any man would love my dollars and take me with them, just thrown in. You, perhaps. I should love you if you were quite poor, he interposed vehemently. She laughed. Would you? Don't be angry if I doubt it. If I were quite poor, I could have not given you your big commission here. This house would not have been restored to its former beauty, and the white eagle would still be a bird of the brain and not of the air. No, you very charming, Macase. I should not have the same fascination for you without my dollars, and I may tell you that the only man I ever felt disposed to like, just a little, is a kind of rude brute who despises my dollars and me. His brows knitted involuntarily. Then there is some man you like? he asked stiffly. I'm not sure, she answered lightly. I said I felt disposed to like him, but that's only in the spirit of contradiction, because he detests me, and it's a sort of duel between us of sheer intellectuality, because he is trying to discover, in the usual slow, laborious, calculating methods of man, the very thing I have discovered. He's on the verge, but not to cross it. And so, he may outstrip you and the Marchese's eyes glittered with sudden anger. He may claim your discovery as his own. Morgana smiled. She was ascending the steps of the lodger, and she paused a moment in the full glare of the Sicilian sunshine, her wonderful gold hair shining in it with the hue of a daffodil. I think not, she said, though of course it depends on the use he makes of it. He, like all men, wishes to destroy... I, like all women, wish to create. One or two of the workmen, who were busy polishing the rose marble pilasters of the lodger, here saluted her. She returned their salutations with an enchanting smile. How delightful it all is, she said. 
I feel the real use of dollars at last. This beautiful palazzo, in one of the loveliest places in the world. All the delicious flowers running down in garlands, to the very shore of the sea and liberty, to enjoy life as one wishes to enjoy it, without hindrance or argument, without even the hindrance and argument of love. <laughs> she laughed, and gave a mirthful upward glance at the Marchese's somewhat sullen countenance. Come and have luncheon with me. You are the major domo for the present. You have engaged the servants, and you know the run of the house. You must show me everything, and tell me everything. I have quite a nice chaperone. Such a dear old lady of title, as they say in the morning post, so it's all quite right and proper. Only she doesn't know a word of Italian and very little French. But that's quite British, you know. She passed smiling into the house, and he followed. End of chapter 6 Recording by Christoph Chapter 7 of The Secret Power This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doodles555 the Secret Power by Marie Corelli. 7. Perhaps there is no lovelier effect in all nature than a Sicilian sunset, when the sky is one rich blaze of color and the sea below reflects every vivid hue as in a mirror, when the very air breathes voluptuous indolence, and all the restless work of man seems an impertinence rather than a necessity. Morgana, for once, in her quick, restless life, felt the sudden charm of sweet peace and holy tranquility as she sat or rather reclined at ease in a long lounge chair after dinner in her rose marble loggia facing the sea and watching the intense radiance of the heavens burning into the still waters beneath. She had passed the afternoon going over her whole house and gardens and to the Marchese Giulio Rivardi had expressed herself completely satisfied, while he, to whom unlimited means had been entrusted to carry out her wishes, wondered silently as to the real extent of her fortune, and why she should have spent so much in restoring a palazzo for herself alone. An occasional thought of the only man she had said she was disposed to like teased his brain, but he was not petty-minded or jealous. He was keenly and sincerely interested in her intellectual capacity, and he knew, or thought he knew, the nature of woman. He watched her now as she reclined, a small slim figure in white, with the red glow of the sun playing on the gold, uptwisted coil of her hair. A few people of the neighborhood had joined her at dinner, and these were seated about, sipping coffee and chatting in the usual frivolous way of after-dinner guests. One or two of them were English, who had made their home in Sicily. The others were traveling Americans. "'I guess you're pretty satisfied with your location, Miss Royal,' said one of these, a pleasant-faced gray-haired man who for four or five years past had wintered in Sicily with his wife, a frail little creature always on the verge of the next road. It would be difficult to match this place anywhere. You only want one thing to complete it. Morgana turned her lovely eyes indolently towards him over the top of the soft feather fan she was waving lightly to and fro. One thing? What is that? she queried. A husband. She smiled. The usual appendage, she said, to my mind, quite unnecessary, and likely to spoil the most perfect environment. Through, though the Marchese Rivardi did ask me today what was the use of my pretty palazzo and gardens without love, a sort of ethical conundrum. She glanced at Rivardi as she spoke. He was rolling a cigarette in his slim brown fingers, and his face was impassively intent on his occupation. Well, that's so, and her American friend looked at her kindly. Even a fairy palace and a fairy garden might prove lonesome for one. And boresome for two, laughed Morgana. My dear Colonel Boyd, it is not everyone who is fitted for matrimony, and there exist so many that are eminently fitted. We can surely allow a few exceptions. I am one of those exceptions. A husband would be excessively tiresome to me, and very much in my way. Colonel Boyd laughed heartily. You won't always think so, he said. Such a charming little woman must have a heart somewhere. Oh, yes, dear, chimed in his fragile, invalid wife. I'm sure you have a heart. 
Morgana raised herself on her cushions to a sitting posture and looked round her with a curious little air of defiance. A heart I must have, she said. Otherwise I could not live. It is a necessary muscle. But what you call heart, and what the dear elusive poets write about, is simply brain. That is to say, an impulsive movement of the brain, suggesting the desirability of a particular person's companionship. And we elect to call that love? On that mere impulse people marry. It's a good impulse, said Colonel Boyd, still smiling broadly. It founds families and continues the race. Ah, uh, yes, but I often wonder why the race should be continued at all, said Morgana. The time is ripe for a new creation. A slow footfall sounded on the garden path, and the tall figure of a man clad in the everyday ecclesiastical garb of the Roman church ascended the steps of Logia. Don Aloysius, quickly exclaimed the Marchese, and every one rose to greet the newcomer, Morgana receiving him with a profound reverence. He laid his hand on her head with a kindly touch of benediction. So the dreamer has come to her dream, he said in soft accents, and it has not broken like an air bubble. It still floats and shines. As he spoke, he courteously saluted all present by a bend of his head and stood for a moment gazing at the view of the sea in the dying sunset. He was a very striking figure of a man, tall and commanding an air and attitude, with a fine face which might be called almost beautiful. The features were such as one sees in classic marvels. The full, clear eyes were set somewhere widely apart under the shelving brows that denoted a brain with intelligence to use it, and the smile that lighted his expression as he looked from the sea to his fair hostess with a benignant sweetness. Yes, he continued, you have realized your vision of loveliness, have you not? Our friend Giulio Rivardi has carried out all of your plans? Everything is perfect, said Morgana, or will be when it is finished. The workmen still have things to do. All workmen always have things to do, said Don Aloysius, tranquilly, and nothing is ever finished. And you, dear child, you are happy? She flushed and paled under his deep, steady gaze. I, I think so, she murmured. I ought to be. The priest smiled and after a pause took the chair which the Marchi Rivardi offered him. The other guests in the loggia looked at him with interest, fascinated by his grave charm of manner. Morgana resumed her seat. I ought to be happy, she said, and of course I am. Or I shall be. Man never is but always to be blessed, quoted Colonel Boyd, and woman the same. I have been telling this lady, Reverend Father, that maybe she will find her palazzo a bit lonesome without someone to share its pleasures. Don Aloysius looked around with a questioning glance. What does she think herself about it? he asked mildly. I have not thought at all, said Morgana quickly. I can always fill it with friends. No end of people are glad to win winter in Sicily. But will such friends care for you or your happiness? suggested the Marchese pointedly. Morgana laughed. Oh no, I don't expect that. Nowadays no one really cares for anybody else's happiness but their own. Besides, I should be much too busy to want company. I am bent on all sorts of discoveries, you know. I want to dive deeper than ever a plummet sounded. You will only find deeper depths, said Don Aloysius slowly, and in the very deepest depth of all is God. There's a sudden hush as he spoke. He went on in gentle accents. How wonderful it is that he should be there, and yet here. No one need dive deep to find him. He is close to us as our very breathing. Ah, and he sighed. I am sorry for all the busy discoverers. They will never arrive at the end. And meanwhile, they miss a clue, a little secret, by the way. Another pause ensued. Then Morgana spoke in a very quiet and submissive tone. Dear Don Aloysius, you are a religious, as they say, and naturally you mistrust all seekers of science, science which is upsetting to your doctrine. Aloysius raised a deprecating hand. My child, there is no science that can upset the source of all science. The greatest mathematician that lives did not institute mathematics. He only copies the existing divine law. That is perfectly true, said the Marchese Rivardi. But la signora royale means that the dogma of the church is in opposition to scientific discovery. I have not found it so, said Don Aloysius, tranquilly. We have believed in what you call your wireless telephony for centuries. When the sanctus bell rings at mass, we think and hope a message from our Lord comes to every worshipper whose soul is in tune with the heavenly current. That is one of your scientific discoveries. And there are hundreds of others which the church has incorporated through a mystic foreknowledge and prophetic instinct. 
No, I find nothing upsetting in science. The only students who are truly upset, both physically and morally, are they who seek to discover God while denying his existence. There followed a silence. The group in the loggia seemed for the moment mesmerized by the priest's suave, calm voice, steady eyes, and noble expression. A bell rang slowly and sweetly, a call to prayer in some not far distant monastery, and the first glimmer of the stars began to sparkle faintly in the darkening heavens. A little sigh from Morgana stirred the stillness. If anyone could always live in this sort of mood, she suddenly exclaimed. There's a lovely peace in the glow of the sunset and the perfume of the flowers. And you, Don Aloysius, talking beautiful things. Why then, one would be perpetually happy and good, but such living would not be life. One must go with the time. Don Aloysius smiled indulgently. Must one? Is it so vitally necessary? If I might take the liberty to go on speaking, I would tell you a story, a mere tradition, but it might weary you. A general chorus of protest from all present assured him of their eagerness to hear. As if you could weary anybody, Morgana said. You never do, only you have an effect upon me, which is not very flattering to my self-love. You make me feel so small. You are small, physically, said Don Aloysius. Do you mind that? Small things are always the sweetest. She flushed and turned her head away as she caught the Marchese Rivardi's eyes fixed upon her. You should not make pretty compliments to a woman, Reverend Father, she said lightly. It is not your vocation. His grave face brightened and he laughed with real heartiness. Dear lady, what do you know of my vocation, he asked. Will you teach it to me? No, I'm sure you will not try. Listen now. As you all give me permission, let me tell you of certain people who once went with the time and decided to stop en route, and are still at a stopping place. Perhaps some of you who travel far and often have heard of the Brazen City? Each one looked at the other inquiringly, but with no responsive result. Those who visit the East know of it, went on Aloysius, and some say they have seen a glimpse of its shining towers and cupolas in the far distance. However, this may be, tradition declares that it exists, and it was then founded by St. John, the beloved disciple. You recall that when our Lord was asked when and how John should die, he answered, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So, as we read, the rumor went forth that John was the one disciple for whom there should be no death. And now, to go on with the legend, it is believed by many that deep in the as yet unexplored depths of the deserts of Egypt, miles and miles over rolling sandwise, which once formed the bed of the vast ocean, there stands a great city whose roofs and towers are seemingly of brass, a city barricaded and built in by walls of brass and guarded by the gates of brass. Here dwells a race apart, a race of beautiful human creatures who have discovered the secret of perpetual youth and immortality on this earth. They have seen the centuries come and go, the flight of time touches them not. They only await the day when the whole world would be free to them, that world to come which is not made for the many, but the few. All the discoveries of modern science are known to them, our inventions are their common everyday appliances, and on the wings of air and rays of light they hear and know all that goes on in every country. Our wars and politics are no more to them than the wars and politics of ants in the ant hills. They have passed beyond all trivialities such as these. They have discovered the secret of life's true enjoyment, and they enjoy. That's a fine story, if true, said Colonel Boyd. But all the same, it must be dull work living shut up in a city with nothing to do, doomed to be young and to last forever. Morgana had listened intently. Her eyes were brilliant. Yes, I think it would be dull after a couple of hundred years or so, she said. One would have tested all of life's possibilities and pleasures by then. I'm not so sure of that, put in Marchese Rivardi. With youth, nothing could become tiresome. Youth knows no ennui. Some of the other listeners to the conversation laughed. I cannot agree to that, said a lady who had not yet spoken. Nowadays, the very children are bored and ever looking for something new. It is just as if the world were played out in another form of planet expected. That is where we retain the vitality of our faith said Don Aloysius. We expect, we hope, we believe in an immortal progress towards an ever higher good. But I think even a soul may grow tired, said Morgana suddenly, so tired that even the highest good may seem hardly worth possessing. There is a moment's silence. Povera figlia, murmured Aloysius, hardly above his breath, but she caught the whisper and smiled. 
I am too analytical and pessimistic, she said. Let us all go for a ramble among the flowers and down to the sea. Nature is the best talker, for the very reason that she has no speech. The party broke up in twos and threes and left the loggia for the garden. Rivardi remained a moment behind, obeying a slight sign from Aloysius. She is not happy, said the priest. With all her wealth and all her gifts of intelligence, she is not happy, nor is she satisfied. Do you not find it so? No woman is happy or satisfied till love has kissed her on the mouth and eyes, answered Rivardi, with a touch of passion in his voice. But who will convince her of that? She is satisfied with her beautiful surroundings. All the work I have designed for her has pleased her, and she has found no fault. And she has paid you loyally, interpolated Aloysius. Do not forget that. She has made your fortune, and no doubt she expects you to stop at that and go no further in an attempt to possess herself as well as her millions. The Marchese flushed hotly under the quiet gaze of the priest's steady dark eyes. It is a great temptation, went on Aloysius gently, but you must resist it, my son. I know what it would mean to you, the restoration of your grand old home, that home which received a Roman emperor in the long ago days of history, and which presents now to your eyes so desolate a picture of with its crumbling walls and decaying gardens, beautiful in their wild desolation. Yes, I know all this. I know how you would like to rehabilitate the ancient family and make the venerable genealogical tree sprout forth into fresh leaves and branches by marriage with a strange little creature whose vast wealth sets her apart in such loneliness. But I doubt the wisdom or the honor of such a course. I also doubt whether she would make a fitting wife for you or for any man. The Marchese raised his eyebrows expressively with the slightest shrug of his shoulders. You may doubt that of every modern woman, he said. Few are really fitting for marriage nowadays. They want something different, something new. God alone knows what they want. Don Aloysius sighed. I, God alone knows. And God alone will decide what to give them. It must be something more sensational than husband and children, said Rivardi a trifle bitterly. Only a primitive woman would care for these. The priest laid a gentle hand on his shoulder. Come, come, do not be cynical, my son. I think with you that if anything can find an entrance to a woman's soul, it is love. But the woman must be capable of loving. That is a difficulty with the little millionaire's royale. She is not capable. He uttered the last word slowly and with emphasis. Rivardi gave him a quick searching glance. You seem to know that as a certainty, he said. How and why do you know it? Aloysius raised his eyes and looked straight ahead of him with a curious, far-off, yet searching intensity. I cannot tell you how or why, he answered. You would not believe me if I told you that sometimes, in this wonderful world of ours, beings are born who are neither man nor woman, and you partake of a nature that is not so much human as elemental and ethereal, or might one not almost say atmospheric, that is, though generated of flesh and blood, they are not altogether flesh and blood, but possess other untested and unproved essences mingled in their composition, of which as yet we can form no idea. We grow up in utter ignorance of the greatest of mysteries, life, and with all our modern advancement, we are utterly unable to measure or to account for life's many and various manifestations. In the very early days of imaginative prophecy, the elemental nature of certain beings was accepted by men accounted wise in their own time. In the long ago discredited assertions of the Count de Gibalis and others of his mystic cult, I am not entirely sure that there does not exist some ground for their beliefs. Life is many-sided. Humanity can only be one facet of the diamond. Giulio Rivardi had listened with surprised attention. He seemed to imply then, he said, that this rich woman, Morgana Royale, is hardly a woman at all, a kind of sexless creature incapable of love. Incapable of the usual kind of so-called love, yes, answered Aloysius. But of love and other forms, I can say nothing, for I know nothing. She may be capable of a passion deep and mysterious as life itself. But come, we might talk all night and arrive no closer to solving of this little feminine problem. You are fortunate in your vocation of artist and designer, to have been chosen by her to carry out her conceptions of structural and picturesque beauty. Let the romance stay there. And do not try to become the husband of a sphinx. He smiled, resting his hand on the Marchesa's shoulder with easy familiarity. See where she stands, he continued, and they both looked towards a beautiful flower-bordered terrace at the verge of the gardens overhanging the sea where, for the moment, Morgana stood alone, a small white figure bathed in the deep rose afterglow of the sunken sun, like a pearl dropped in a cup of red wine, ready to dissolve and disappear. 
His voice had a strange thrill in it, and Julia looked at him curiously. You admire her very much, my father, he said, with a touch of delicate irony in his tone. I do, my son, responded Aloysius, composedly, but only as a poor priest may, at a distance. The Marchese glanced at him again quickly, almost suspiciously, and seemed about to say something further, but checked himself, and the two walked on to join their hostess, side by side together. End of chapter 7 The Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lena Emsley. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 8. Early dawn peered through the dark sky like the silvery light of a pale lamp carried by an advancing watchman and faintly illumined the outline of a long, high, vastly extending wooden building, which at about a mile distance from Morgana's palazzo ran parallel with the seashore. The star-sparkle of electric lamps within showed it to be occupied, and the murmur of men's voices and tinkle of working tools suggested that the occupants were busy. The scarcely visible sea made pleasant little kissing murmurs on the lip edges of the sand, and nature drowsing in misty space seemed no more than the formless void of the traditional beginning of things outside the building which by its shape though but dimly defined among shadows was easily recognizable as a huge aerodrome the tall figure of giulio rivardi paced slowly up and down like a sentinel on guard he whose marquisate was inherited from many noble sicilian houses renowned in caesar's day apparently found as much satisfaction in this occupation as any warrior of a roman legion might have experienced in guarding the tent of his emperor and every now and then he lifted his eyes to the sky with a sense of impatience at the slowness of the sun's rising in his mind he reviewed the whole chapter of events which during the past three years had made him the paid vassal of a rich woman's fancy his entire time taken up and all the resources of his inventive and artistic nature which were exceptionally great drawn upon for the purpose of carrying out designs which at first seemed freakish and impossible but which later astonished him by the extraordinary scientific acumen they displayed as well as by their adaptability to the forces of nature then the money the immense sums which this strange creature morgana royal had entrusted to him and with it all the keen business aptitude she had displayed, knowing to a centime how much she had spent, though there seemed no limit to how much she yet intended to spend. He looked back to the time when he had first seen her, when on visiting Sicily, apparently as an American tourist only, she had taken a fancy to a ruined palazzo, once an emperor's delight, but crumbling slowly away among its glorious gardens, and had purchased the whole thing then and there. Her guide to the ruins at that period had been Don Aloysius, a learned priest, famous for his archaeological knowledge, and it was through Don Aloysius that he, the Marchesa Rivardi, had obtained the commission to restore to something of its pristine grace and beauty the palace of ancient days. And now everything was done, or nearly done but much more than the palazzo had been undertaken and completed, for the lady of many millions had commanded an airship to be built for her own personal use and private pleasure, with an aerodrome for its safe-keeping and anchorage. The airship was the crux of the whole business, for the men employed to build it were confident that it would never fly, and laughed with one another as they worked to carry out a woman's idea and a woman's design. How could it fly without an engine? they very sensibly demanded, for an engine there was none. However, they were paid punctually and most royally for their labours, and when, despite their ominous predictions, the ship was released on her trial trip, manipulated by Giulio Rivardi, who ascended in her alone, sailing the ship with an ease and celerity hitherto unprecedented, they were more scared than enthusiastic. Surely some devil was in it, for how could the thing fly without any apparent force to propel it? How was it 
that its enormous wings spread out on either side as by self-volition and moved rhythmically like the wings of a bird in full flight every man who had worked at the design was more or less mystified they had according to plans and instructions received plumed the airship for electricity in a new and curious manner but there was no battery to generate a current two small boxes or chambers made of some mysterious metal which would not fuse under the strongest heat were fixed one at either end of the ship these had been manufactured secretly in another country and sent to sicily by morgana herself but so far they contained nothing they seemed unimportant they were hardly as large as an ordinary petrol can holding a gallon when rivardi had made a trial ascent he had inserted in each of these boxes a cylindrical tube made to fit an interior socket as a candle fits into a candlestick all the workmen watched him waiting for a revelation but he made none he was only particular and precise as to the firm closing down of the boxes when the tubes were in and then in a few minutes the whole machine began to palpitate noiselessly like a living thing with a breathing heart and to the amazement and almost fear of all who witnessed what seemed to be a miracle the ship sprang up like a bird springing from the ground and soared free and away into space its vast white wings cleaving the air with a steady rise and fall of rhythmic power once aloft she sailed in level flight apparently at perfect ease and after several rapid runs and circlings descended slowly and gracefully landing her pilot without shock or jar he was at once surrounded and was asked a thousand questions which it was evident he could not answer how can i tell he replied to all interrogations the secret is the secret of a woman a woman man's pretty toy man's patient slave how should a woman master any secret engineers and mechanics laughed scornfully and shrugged their shoulders yet yet the great airship stared them in the face as a thing created a thing of such power and possibility as seemed wholly incredible and now the creator the woman had arrived the woman whose rough designs on paper had been carefully followed and elaborated into actual shape and there was a tense state of expectation among all the workers awaiting her presence meanwhile the lantern gleam in the sky broadened and the web of mist which veiled the sea began to lift and giulio rivardi pacing to and fro halted every now and then to look in the direction of a path winding downward from the mainland to the shore in watchful expectation of seeing an elfin figure more spirit-like than mortal floating towards him through the dividing vapours of the morning the words of don aloysius haunted him strangely though his common sense sharply rejected the fantastic notions to which they had given rise she morgana royal was not capable of love the priest had implied and yet at times only at times she seemed eminently lovable at times again only at times he was conscious of a sweeping passion of admiration for her that well-nigh robbed him of his self-control but a strong sense of honour held him in check he never forgot that he was her paid employee and that her wealth was so enormous that any man presuming too personally upon her indulgence could hardly be exonerated from ulterior sordid aims and while he mused somewhat vexedly on all the circumstances of his position the light widened in the heavens showing the very faintest flush of rose in the east as an indication of the coming sun he lifted his eyes at last he exclaimed with relief as he saw a small gliding shadow among shadows approaching him the figure of morgana so wrapped in a grey cloak and hood as to almost seem part of the slowly dispersing mists of the morning she pushed back the hood as she came near showing a small eager white face in which the eyes glittered with an almost unearthly brightness i have slept till now she said imagine all night through without waking 
So lazy of me. But the long rest has done me good, and I am ready for anything. Are you? You look very solemn and morose, like a warrior in bronze. Anything gone wrong? Not that I am aware of, he replied. The men are finishing some small detail of ornament. I have only looked in to tell them you are coming. And are they pleased? Madame, they are not of a class to be either pleased or displeased, he said. They are instructed to perform certain work, and they perform it. In all that they have been doing for you, according to your orders, I truly think they are more curious than interested. A streak of rose and silver flared through the sky, flushing the pallor of Morgana's face as she lifted it towards him, smiling. Quite natural, she said. No man is ever interested in woman's work, but he is always curious. Woman is a many-cornered maze, and man is always peeping round one corner or another in the hope to discover her, but he never does. Rivardi gave an almost imperceptible shrug. Never? he queried. Never, she affirmed emphatically. Don't be sarcastic, Amico. Even in this dim morning light I can see the scornful curve of your upper lip. You really are very good-looking, you know, and you imply the same old Garden of Eden story of man giving away woman as a wholly incomprehensible bad job. Adam flung her back as a reproach to her creator. The woman thou gavest me. Oh, that woman, and that apple. But he had to confess. I did eat. He always eats. He eats everything woman can give him. He will even eat her if he gets the chance. She laughed and pointed to the brightening sky. See, tis almost morning as Shakespeare's Juliet remarked. But I would not have thee gone, not unless I go also. Whither shall we fly? He looked at her, moved as he often was by a thrill of admiration and wonder. It is for you to decide, he answered. You know the best possibilities and the risks. I know the possibilities perfectly, she said. But I know nothing of risks. There are none. This is our safety. And she drew out from the folds of her cloak two small packets of cylindrical form. This emanation of nature's greatest force will keep us going for a year if needful. Oh, man, I do not mean you particularly, but man generally. Why could you not light on this little, little clue? Why was it left to a woman? Come. Let us see the white eagle in its nest. It shall spread its wings and saw today. We will give it full liberty. The dawn was spreading in threads of gold and silver and blue all over the heavens, and the sea flushed softly under the deepening light as she went towards the aerodrome, he walking slowly by her side. Are you so sure, he said? Will you not risk your life in this attempt? She stopped abruptly. My life? What is it? The life of a midge in the sun? It's no good to me unless I can do something with it. I would live forever if I could, here on this dear little ball of earth. I do not want a better heaven. The heaven which the clergy promises is so remarkably unattractive. But I run no risk of losing my life or yours in our aerial adventures. We carry the very essence of vitality with us. Come, I want to see my flying palace. When I was a small child I used to feed my fancy on the Arabian Nights, and most dearly did I love the story of Aladdin and his palace that was transported through the air. I used to say, I will have a flying palace myself, and now I have realized my dream. That remains to be proved, said Rivardi. With all our work, we may not have entirely carried out your plan. If not, it will have to be carried out, returned Morgana tranquilly. There is no reason, moral or scientific, why it should not be carried out. We have all the forces of nature on our side. He was silent, and accompanied her as she walked to the aerodrome and entered it. There were half a dozen or more men within, all working but they ceased every movement as they saw her. 
while she, on her part, scarcely seemed to note their presence. Her eyes were uplifted and fixed on a vast, smooth, oblong object, like the body of a great bird with shut wings, which swung from the roof of the aerodrome and swayed lightly to and fro, as though impelled by some mysterious breathing force. Morgana's swift glance travelled from its one end to the other with a flash of appreciation, while at the same time she received the salutations of all the men who advanced to greet her. "'You have done well, my friends,' she said, speaking in fluent French. "'This beautiful creature you have made is a perfect thing. From outside, what of the interior?' A small, dark, intelligent-looking man, in evident command of the rest, smiled and shrugged his shoulders. "'Ah, signora, it is as you commanded,' he answered. "'It is beautiful, like a chrysalis for a butterfly. But a butterfly has the avantage. It comes to life to use its wings.' "'Quite true, Monsieur Gaspar,' and Morgana gave him a smile as sunny as his own. "'But what is life? Is it not a composition of many elements, and should we not learn to combine such elements to vitalize our white eagle? It is possible. With God all things are possible, quoted the Marquesa Rivardi, but with man? We are taught that God made man in his image. In the image of God created he him. If this is true, all things should be possible to man, said Morgana quietly to men, and to that second thought of the Creator, woman. And we mustn't forget that second thoughts are best. She laughed while a man called Gaspar stared at her, and laughed also for company. Now let me see how I shall be housed in the air. And with very little assistance she climbed into the great bird-shaped vessel, through an entrance so deftly contrived that it was scarcely visible an entrance which closed almost hermetically when the ship was ready to start, air being obtained through other channels. Once inside, it was easy to believe in fairyland. Not a scrap of any sort of mechanism could be seen. There were two exquisitely furnished saloons, one a kind of boudoir or drawing-room, where everything that money could buy or luxury suggest as needful or ornamental was collected and arranged with thoughtful selection and perfect taste. A short passage from these apartments led at one end to some small, daintily fitted sleeping rooms beyond. At the other was the steering cabin and accommodation for the pilot and observer. The whole interior was lined with what seemed to be a thick, rose-coloured silk of a singularly smooth and shining quality, but at a sign from Morgana, Rivardi and Gaspar touched some hidden spring which caused this interior covering to roll up completely, thus disclosing a strange and mysterious installation beneath. Every inch of wall space was fitted with small circular plates of some thin shining substance set close together so that their edges touched, and in the centre of each plate or disc was a tiny white knob resembling the button of an ordinary electric bell. There seemed to be at least two or three thousand of these discs. Seen all together in a close mass, they somewhat resembled the suckers on the tentacles of a giant octopus. Morgana, sitting herself in an easy chair of the richly carpeted drawing room of her air palace, studied every line, turn, and configuration of this extraordinary arrangement with a keenly observant and criticizing eye. The Marquesa Rivardi and Gaspar watched her expression anxiously. You are satisfied? asked Rivardi at last. It is as you planned? She turned towards Gaspar with a smile. What do you think about it? she queried. You are an expert in modern scientific work. You understand many of the secrets of natural force. What do you think? Madame, I think as I have always thought, a body without soul. What is soul? she said. Is it not breath, the breath of life? Is it not said that God made man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul? And what is the breath of life? 
is it not composed of such elements as are in the universe and which we may all discover if we will and use to our advantage you cannot deny this come marquesa and you monsieur gaspar call to them below to set this eagle free we will fly into the sunrise for an hour or two no farther as we're not provisioned madame stammered gaspar i am not prepared you are frightened my friend and Magona smiled laying her little white hand soothingly on his arm but if i tell you there is no cause for fear will you not believe me do you not think i love my own life oh yes i love it so much that i seek to prolong it not risk it by sudden loss nor would i risk your life or his and she looked towards rivardi he is not frightened he will come with me wherever i go now monsieur gaspar see here is our breath of life and she held up before his eyes the two cylindrically shaped packages she had previously shown to rivardi the marquesa has already had some experience of it here she unfastened the wrappings of the packages and took out two tubes made of some metallic substance which shone like the purest polished gold i will fix these in myself will you open the lower end chamber first please silently the two men obeyed her gesture and opened the small compartment fixed at what might be called the hull end of the airship the interior was seen to be lined with the same round discs which covered the walls of the vessel every disc closely touching its neighbour with extreme caution and delicacy morgana set one of the tubes she held upright in the socket made to receive it and as she did this fine sharp needle-like flashes of light broke from it in a complete circle filling the whole receptacle with vibrating rays which instantly ran round each disc and glittered in and out among them like a stream of quicksilver as soon as this manifestation occurred morgana beckoned to her two assistants to shut the compartment they did so with scarcely an effort yet it closed down with a silent force and tenacity that suggested some enormous outward pressure yet pressure there seemed none and now a sudden throbbing movement pulsated through the vessel its huge folded wings stirred quick tell them below to lose no time open the shed and let her rise when the contact is once established there will not be a half second to spare hurriedly the man gaspar though obviously terrified shouted the necessary orders while morgana went to the other end of the ship where rivardi opened for her the second compartment into which she fixed the second tube once again the circular flashes broke out but this time directly the compartment was closed down the shining stream of light was seen to run rapidly and completely round the interior of the vessel touching every disc that lined the walls as with the sparkling point of a jewel the wings of the ship palpitated as with life and began to spread open let her go cried morgana away to your place pilot and she waved a commanding hand as rivardi sprang to the steering wheel hold her fast keep her steady straight towards the sunrise as she spoke a wonderful thing happened every disc that lined the interior of the ship started throbbing like a pulse every little white knob in the centre of each disc vibrated with an extraordinary rapidity of motion which dazzled the eyes like the glittering of swiftly falling snow and gaspar obeying morgana's sign drew down at once all the rose silk covering which completely hid the strange mechanism from view there was absolutely no noise in this intense vibration there was no start or jar or any kind of difficulty when the airship released from bondage suddenly rose like an actual living bird sprang through the vast opening gateway of the aerodrome and as it sprang spread out its wings as though by its own volition in one moment it soared straight upright far far into space and the men who were left behind stood staring amazedly after it themselves looking no more than tiny black pinheads below then with a slow diving grace it righted itself as it were 
and as if it had its own will selected the particular current of air on which to sail it travelled with a steady swiftness in absolute silence its great wings moved up and down with a noiseless power and rhythm for which there seemed no possible explanation and morgana turned her face now delicately flushed with triumph on the pale and almost breathless gaspar smiling as she looked at him her eyes questioning his he seemed stricken dumb with astonishment his lips moved but no words issued from them you believe me now do you not she said we have nothing further to do but to steer the force we use recreates itself as it works it cannot become exhausted to slow down and descend to earth one need only open the compartments at either end then the vibration grows less and less and like a living creature the white eagle sinks gently to rest you see there is no cause for fear while she yet spoke the light of the newly risen sun bathed her in its golden glory the long dazzling beams filtering through mysterious apertures inserted cunningly in the roof of the vessel and mingling with the roseate hues of the silken sheathing that covered its walls so fired with light she looked ethereal a very spirit of air or flame and rivardi just able to see her from his steering place began to think that there was some truth in the strange words of don aloysius sometimes in this wonderful world of ours beings are born who are neither men nor women and who partake of a nature that is not so much human as elemental or might one not almost say atmospheric at the moment morgana seemed truly atmospheric a small creature so fine and fair as to almost suggest an effervescent form about to melt away in mist some sudden thrill of superstitious fear moved gaspar to make the sign of the cross and mutter an ave morgana heard him and smiled kindly i am not an evil spirit my friend she said you need not exorcise me i am nothing but a student with a little more imagination than is common and in the moving force which carries our ship along i am only using a substance which as our scientists explain has an exceptional capacity for receiving the waves of energy emanating from the sun and giving them off and the giving off of those waves we move it is all natural and easy and like every power existent in the universe is meant for our comprehension and use you cannot say you feel any sense of danger we are sailing with greater steadiness than any ship at sea there is scarcely any consciousness of movement and without looking out and down we should not realize we are so far from earth indeed we are going too far now we do not realize our speed too far said gaspar nervously madame if we go too far we may also go too high we may not be able to breathe she laughed that is a very remote possibility she said the waves of energy which bear us along are concerned in our own life supply they make our air to breathe our heat to warm all the same it is time we returned we are not provisioned she called to rivardi and he with the slightest turn of the wheel altered the direction in which the airship moved so that it travelled back again on the route by which it had commenced its flight soon very soon the dainty plot of earth looking no more than a gay flower bed where morgana's palazzo was situated appeared below and then acting on instructions gaspar opened the compartments at either end of the vessel the vibrating rays within dwindled by slow degrees their light became less and less intense their vibration less powerful till very gradually with a perfectly beautiful motion expressing absolute grace and lightness the vessel descended towards the aerodrome it had lately left and all the men who were waiting for its return gave a simultaneous shout of astonishment and admiration as it sank slowly towards them folding its wings as it came with the quiet ease of a nesting bird flying home so admirably was the distance measured between itself and the great shed of its local habitation that it glided into place as though it had eyes to see its exact whereabouts and came to a standstill 
within a few seconds of its arrival. Morgana descended, and her two companions followed. The other men stood silent, visibly inquisitive yet afraid to express their curiosity. Morgana's eyes flashed over them all with a bright, half-laughing tolerance. "'I thank you, my friends,' she said. "'You have done well the work I entrusted you to do, under the guidance of Marquesa Rivardi, and you can now judge for yourselves the result. It mystifies you, I can see. You think it is a kind of black magic. Not so. Unless all our modern science is black magic as well, born of the influence of those evil spirits who, as we are told in tradition, descended in rebellion from heaven and lived with the daughters of man. From these strange lovers sprang a race of giants, symbolical, I think, of the birth of the sciences, which mingle in their composition the active elements of good and evil. You have built this airship of mine on lines which have never before been attempted. You have given it wings which are plumed like the wings of a bird, not with quills, but with channels, many and minute, to carry the runlets of the emanation from the substance held in the containers at either end of the vessel. Its easy flight, therefore, should not surprise you. Briefly, we have filled a piece of mechanism with the composition or essence of life. That is the only answer I can give to your inquiring looks. Let it be enough. But, madame, ventured Gaspard, that composition or essence of life, what is it? There was an instant's silence. Every man's head craned forward eagerly to hear the reply. Morgana smiled strangely. That, she said, is my secret. End of chapter 8of The Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Vaughan McCarthy. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 9. And now you have attained your object, what is the use of it? said Don Aloysius. The priest was pacing slowly up and down the old half-ruined cloister of an old half-ruined monastery, and beside his stately black-robed figure moved the small aerial form of Morgana, clad in summer garments of pure white, her golden head uncovered to the strong Sicilian sunshine, which came piercing in sword-like rays through the arches of the cloister, and filtered among the clustering leaves which hung in cool twining bunches from every crumbling grey pillar of stone. What is the use of it? he repeated, his calm eyes resting gravely on the little creature gliding sylph-like beside him. Suppose your invention outreaped every limit of known possibility. Suppose your airship to be invulnerable and surpassing in speed and safety everything ever experienced. Suppose it could travel to heights unimaginable, what then? Suppose even that you could alight on another star, another world than this. What purpose is served? What peace is gained? What happens? Morgana stopped abruptly in her walk beside him. I have not worked for peace or happiness, she said and there was a thrill of sadness in her voice. Because to my mind, neither peace nor happiness exist. From all we can see, and from the little we can learn, I think the maker of the universe never meant us to be happy or peaceful. All nature is at strife with itself, incessantly laboring for such attainment as can hardly be won. All things seem to be haunted by fear and sorrow. And yet it seems to me that there are remedies for most of our evils in the very composition of the elements. 
if we were not ignorant and stupid enough to discourage our discoverers on the verge of discovery. My application of a certain substance, known to scientists, but scarcely understood, is an attempt to solve the problem of swift aerial motion by light and heat, light and heat being the chiefest supports of life. To use a force giving out light and heat continuously seemed to me the way to create and command equally continuous movement. I have, I think and hope, fairly succeeded, and in order to accomplish my design, I have used wealth that would not have been at the service of most inventors. Wealth which my father left to me quite unconditionally, but were I able to fly with my white eagle to the remotest parts of the Milky Way itself, I should not look to find peace or happiness. Why? The priest's simple query had a note of tender pity in it. Morgana looked up at him with a little smile, but her eyes were tearful. Dear Don Aloysius, how can I tell why? Nobody is really happy, and I cannot expect to have what is denied to the whole world. Aloysius resumed his slow walk to and fro, and she kept quiet pace with him. Have you ever thought what happiness is? he asked. Then, have you ever felt it for a passing moment? Yes, she answered quickly, but only at rare intervals. Oh, so rare. Poor little rich child, he said kindly. Tell me some of those intervals. Cannot they be repeated? Let us sit here. And he moved towards a stone bench which fronted an ancient disused well in the middle of the square of the cloistered court. A well around which a crimson passion flower twined in a perfect arch of blossom. What was the first interval? He sat down and the sunshine sent a dazzling ray on the silver crucifix he wore, giving it the gleam of a great jewel. Morgana took her seat beside him. Interval one, he said playfully. What was this little lady's first experience of happiness? When she played with her dolls? No, oh no, cried Morgana with sudden energy. That was anything but happiness. I hated dolls. Abominable little effigies. Don Aloysius raised his eyebrows in surprise and amusement. Horrid little stuffed things of wood and wax and sawdust, continued Morgana emphatically, with great beads for eyes, or eyes made to look like beads, and red cheeks and red lips with a silly smile on them. Of course they are given to girl children to encourage the maternal instinct, as it is called, to make them think of babies, but I never had any maternal instinct. And real babies have always seemed to me as uninteresting as sham ones. Dear child, you were a baby yourself once, said Aloysius gently. A shadow swept over her face. Do you think I was? she queried meditatively. I cannot imagine it. I suppose I must have been. But I never remember being a child at all. I had no children to play with me. My father suspected all children of either disease or wickedness, and imagined I would catch infection of body or of soul by association with them. I was always alone, alone, yet not lonely. She broke off a moment, and her eyes grew dark with the intensity of her thought. No, never lonely. And the very earliest interval of happiness I can recall was when I first saw the inside of a sunray. Don Aloysius turned to look at her, but said nothing. She laughed. Dear Father Aloysius, what a wise priest you are. Not a word falls from those beautifully set lips of yours. If you were a fool, so many men are, you would have repeated my phrase, the inside of a sunray, with an accent of scornful incredulity and you would have stared at me with all a fool's contempt. But you are not a fool. You know, or you perceive instinctively, exactly what I mean, the inside of a sunray. It was disclosed to me suddenly, a veritable miracle. I have seen it many times since, 
but not with all the wonder and ecstasy of the first revelation. I was so young, too. I told a renowned professor at one of the American colleges just what I saw, and he was so amazed and confounded at my description of rays that had taken the best scientists years to discover that he begged to be allowed to examine my eyes. He thought there must be something unusual about them. In fact, there is. And after his examination, he seemed more puzzled than ever. He said something about an exceptionally strong power of vision, but frankly admitted that power of vision alone would not account for it. Anyhow, I plainly saw all the rays within one ray. There were seven. The ray itself was, or so I fancied, the octave of colour. I was little more than a child when this interval of happiness, perfect happiness, was granted to me. I felt as if a window had been opened for me to look through it into heaven. Do you believe in heaven? asked Aloysius suddenly. She hesitated. I used to, in those days. As I have just said, I was only a child, and heaven was a real place to me. Even the angels were real presences. And you have lost them now? She gave a little gesture of resignation. They left me, she answered. I did not lose them. They simply went. He was silent. His fine, calm features expressed a certain grave patience, but nothing more. She resumed. That was my first experience of real happiness. Till then, I had lived the usual monotonous life of childhood, doing what I was told and going whither I was taken. But the disclosure of the sun ray was a key to individuality and seemed to unlock my prison doors. I began to think for myself and to find my own character as a creature apart from others. My second experience was years after, just when I left school and when my father took me to see the place where I was born, in the north of Scotland. Oh, it is such a wild corner of the world. Beautiful craggy hills and deep, dark lakes. Rough moorlands, purple with heather, and such wonderful skies at sunset. The cottage where my father had lived as a boy when he herded sheep is still there. I have bought it for myself now. It is a little stone hut of three rooms and another one about a mile off where he took my mother to live, and where I came into the world. I have bought that too. Yes, I felt a great thrill of happiness when I stood there, knee-deep among the heather, my father clasping my hand, and looking with me on those early scenes of his boyhood, when he had scarcely a penny to call his own. Yet he was sad, very sad, and told me then, that he would give all his riches to feel as light of heart and free from care as he did in those old days. And then, then we went to see old Ellison. Here she broke off. A strange light came into her eyes, and she smiled a little. I think I had better not tell you about old Ellison, she said. Why not? And Don Aloysius returned her smile. If old Allison has anything to do with your happiness, I should like to hear. Well, you see, you are a priest, went on Morgana slowly, and she is a witch. Oh yes, truly, a real witch. There is no one in all that part of the Highlands that does not know of her and the power she has. She is very, very old. Some folks say she is more than a hundred. She knew my father and grandfather. She came to my father's cottage the night I was born and said strange things about a May child. I was born in May. We went, as I tell you, to see her and found her spinning. She looked up from her wheel as we entered, but she did not seem surprised at our coming. Her eyes were very bright, not like the eyes of an old person. She spoke to my father at once. Her voice was very clear and musical. Is it you, John Royal? She said. And you have brought your fay lass along with you. 
That was the first time I ever heard the word fay. I did not understand it then. And do you understand it now? asked Aloysius. Yes, she replied. I understand it now. It is a wonderful thing to be born fay, but it is a kind of witchcraft, and you would be displeased. At what should I be displeased? And the priest bent his eyes very searchingly upon her. At the fact, which none can disprove, that there are things in heaven and earth which are beyond our immediate knowledge, that there are women strangely endowed with premonitory instincts and preternatural gifts? Dear child, there is nothing in all this that can or could displease me. My faith, the faith of my church, is founded on the preternatural endowment of a woman. She lifted her eyes to his, and a little sigh came from her lips. Yes, I know what you mean, she said, but I am sure you cannot possibly realize the weird nature of old Alison. She made me stand before her, just where the light of the sun streamed through the open doorway, and she looked at me for a long time with such a steady piercing glance that I felt as if her eyes were boring through my flesh. Then she got up from her spinning and pushed away the wheel and stretched out both her hands towards me, crying out in quite a strange, wild voice, Morgana, Morgana, go your ways, child begotten of the sun and shower, go your ways. Little had mortal father or mother to do with your making, for you are of the fey folk. Go your ways with your own people. You shall hear them whispering in the night and singing in the morning, and they shall command you, and you shall obey. They shall beckon, and you shall follow. Nothing of mortal flesh and blood shall hold you. No love shall bind you, no hate shall wound you. The clue is given into your hand, the secret is disclosed, and the spirits of air and fire and water have opened a door that you may enter in. Hark! I can hear their voices calling, Morgana, Morgana! Go your ways, child, go hence and far. The world is too small for your wings. She looked so fierce and grand and terrible that I was frightened. I was only a girl of sixteen, and I ran to my father and caught his hand. He spoke quite gently to Alison, but she seemed quite beyond herself and unable to listen. Your way lies down a different road, John Royal, she said. You that herded sheep on these hills, and that now hoard millions of money, of what use to you is your wealth? You are but the worker, gathering gold for her, the fay child born in an hour of May moonlight. You must go, but she must stay. Her own folk have work for her to do. Then my father said, Dear Alison, don't frighten the child. And she suddenly changed in her tone and manner. Frighten her? she muttered. I would not frighten her for the world. And my father pushed me towards her and whispered, Ask her to bless you before you go. So I just knelt before her, trembling very much, and said, Dear Alison, bless me. And she stared at me and lifted her old brown wrinkled hands and laid them on my head. Then she spoke some words in a strange language as to herself, and afterwards she said, Spirit of all that is and ever shall be, Bless this child who belongs to thee, and not to man. Give her the power to do what is commanded to the end. And at this she stopped suddenly, and bending down she lifted my head into her two hands, and looked at me hard. Poor child, poor child, never a love for you, never a love. Alone are you, alone you must be. Never a love for a fay woman. And she let me go, and sat down again to her spinning wheel. Nor would she say another word, neither to me, nor to my father. And you call this your second experience of happiness? said Don Aloysius wonderingly. What happiness did you gain by your interview with this old Alison? Ah, and Morgan smiled. 
You would not understand me if I tried to explain. Everything came to me. Yes, everything. I began to live in a world of my own. She paused, and her eyes grew dark and pensive. And I have lived in it ever since. That is why I say my visit to old Allison was my second experience of happiness. I've seen her again many times since then, but not with quite the same impression. She is alive still? Oh yes, I often fancy she will never die. There was a silence of some minutes. Morgana rose, and crossing over to the old well, studied the crimson passion flowers which twined about it with almost loving scrutiny. How beautiful they are, she said, and they seem to serve no purpose save that of simple beauty. That is enough for many of God's creatures, said Aloysius. To give joy and recreate joy is the mission of perfection. She looked at him wistfully. Alas, poor me, she sighed. I can neither give joy nor create it. Not even with all your wealth? Not even with all my wealth, she echoed. Surely you, a priest, know what a delusion wealth really is so far as happiness goes. Mere happiness. Of course you can buy everything with it, and there's the trouble. When everything is bought, there's nothing left. And if you try to help the poor, they resent it. They think you are doing it because you are afraid of them. Perhaps the worst of all things to do is to help artists. Artists of every kind. For they say you want to advertise yourself as a generous patron. Oh, I've tried it all, and it's no use. I was just crazy to help all the scientists. Once. But they argued and quarrelled so much as to which society deserved most money that I dropped the whole offer and started scientizing myself. There is one man I tried to lift out of his brain bog, but he would have none of me, and he is still in his bog. Oh, there is one man, said Aloysius with a smile. Yes, good father. And Morgana left the passion flowers and moved slowly back to her seat on the stone bench. There is one man, he was my third and last experience of happiness. When I first met him, my whole heart gave itself in one big pulsation. But like a wave of the sea, the pulsation recoiled, and never again beat on the grim rock of human egoism. She laughed gaily, and a delicate colour flushed her face. But I was happy while the wave lasted, and when it broke, I still played on the shore with its pretty foam bells. You loved this man? And the priest's grave eyes dwelt on her searchingly. I suppose so, for the moment. Yet no, it was not love. It was just an attraction. He was, he is, clever, and thinks he can change the face of the world, but he is fooling with fire. I tell you I tried to help him, for he is deadly poor, but he would have none of me, nor of what he calls my vulgar wealth. This is a case in point where wealth is useless, you see? Don Aloysius was silent. Then, Morgana went on, Alison is right. The witchery of the northern highlands is in my blood. Never a love for me. Alone I am. Alone I must be, never a love for a fay woman. Over the priest's face there passed a quiver as of sudden pain. You wrong yourself, my child, he said slowly. You wrong yourself very greatly. You have a power of which you appear to be unconscious, a great, a terrible power. You compel interest. You attract the love of others, even if you yourself love no one. You draw the very soul out of a man. He paused abruptly. Morgana raised her eyes. 
the blue lightning gleam flashed in their depths. Ah, yes, she half whispered. I know I have that power. Don Aloysius rose to his feet. Then, if you know it, in God's name, do not exercise it, he said. His voice shook, and with his right hand he gripped the crucifix he wore as though it were a weapon of self-defense. Morgana looked at him wonderingly for a moment, then drooped her head with a strange little air of sudden penitence. Aloysius drew a quick, sharp breath, as of one in effort, then he spoke again unsteadily. I mean, he said, smiling forcedly, I mean you should not, you should not break the heart of, of the poor Giulio, for instance. It would not be kind. She lifted her eyes again and fixed them on him. No, it would not be kind, she said softly. Dear Don Aloysius, I understand, and I will remember. She glanced at a tiny diamond set watch bracelet on her wrist. How late it is! Nearly all the morning gone. I have kept you so long, listening to my talk. Forgive me. I will run away now, and leave you to think about my intervals of happiness. Will you? They are so few compared to yours. Mine? he echoed amazedly. Yes, indeed, yours. Your whole life is an interval of happiness, between this world and the next because you are satisfied in the service of God. A poor service, he said, turning his gaze away from her elfin figure and shining hair. Unworthy, shameful, marred by sin at every moment. A priest of the church must learn to do without happiness, such as ordinary life can give, and without love, such as a woman may give. But, after all, the sacrifice is little. She smiled at him, sweetly, tenderly. Very little, she said. So little that it is not worth a regret. Goodbye, but not for long. Come and see me soon. Moving across the cloister with her light step, she seemed to float through the sunshine like a part of it. And as she disappeared, a kind of shadow fell though no cloud obscured the sun. Don Aloysius watched her till she had vanished, then turned aside into a small chapel opening out into the cloistered square, a chapel which formed part of the monastic house to which he belonged as superior, and there, within that still, incense-sweetened sanctuary, he knelt before the noble, pictured, head of the man of sorrows, in silent confession and prayer. End of chapter 9《Of the Secret Power》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lena Emsley the Secret Power by Marie Corelli Chapter 10 Roger Seaton was a man of many philosophies. He had one for every day in the week, yet none wherewith to thoroughly satisfy himself. While still a mere lad, he had taken to the study of science as a duck takes to water. No new discovery, or even suggestion of a new discovery, missed his instant and close attention. His avidity for learning was insatiable. His intense and insistent curiosity on all matters of chemistry gave a knife-like edge to the quality of his brain, making it sharp, brilliant, and incisive. To him, the ordinary social and political interests of the world were simply absurd. The idea that the greater majority of men should be created for no higher purpose than those of an insect, just to live, eat, breed, and die, was to him preposterous. Think of it, he would exclaim, all this wondrous organization of our planet for that? For a biped so stupid as to see nothing in his surroundings but conveniences 
to satisfying his stomach and his passions. We men are educated chiefly in order to learn how to make money, and all we can do with the money when made is to build houses to live in, eat as much as we want and more, and breed children to whom we leave all the stuff we have earned, and who either waste it or add to it whichever suits their selfishness best. Such lives are absolutely useless. They repeat the same old round, leading nowhere. Occasionally, in the course of centuries, a real brain is born, and at once all who are merely bodies leap up against it, like famished wolves striving to tear it to pieces and devour it. If it survives the attack, its worth is only recognised long after its owner has perished. The whole scheme is manifestly unintelligent and ludicrous, but it is not intended to be so, of that I am sure there must be something else when urged to explain what he conceived as this something else he would answer there has always been something else in our environment something that stupid humanity has taken centuries to discover sound waves for example light rays electricity these have been freely at our service from the beginning electricity might have been used ages ago had not dull-witted man refused to find anything better for lighting purposes than an oil lamp or a tallow candle. If, in past periods, he had been told, there is something else, he would have laughed his informant to scorn. So, with our blundering methods of living, there is something else. Not after death, but now, and here. We are going about in the darkness with a candle when a great force of wider light is all around us, only awaiting connection and application to our uses. Those who heard him speak this way, and they were few, for Seaton seldom discussed his theories with others, convinced themselves that he was either a fool or a madman, the usual verdict given for any human being who dares break away from convention and adopt an original line of thought and action but they came to the conclusion that as he was direfully poor, and nevertheless refused various opportunities of making money, his folly or his madness would be brought home to him sooner or later by strong necessity, and that he would then either arrive at a sane everyday realisation of things as they are, or else be put away in an asylum and quietly forgotten. This being the sagacious opinion of those who knew him best, there was a considerable flutter in such limited American circles as call themselves upper. When the wealthiest young woman in the States, Morgana Royal, suddenly elected to know him, and to bring him into prominent notice at her parties. The most wonderful genius of the time, a man whose scientific discoveries might change the very face of the globe, and other fantastically exaggerated descriptions of her own which he himself strongly repudiated and resented. Gossip ran amok concerning the two, and it was generally agreed that if the madman of science were to become the husband of a woman multimillionaire, he would not have to be considered so mad, after all. But the expected romance did not materialise. There came apparently a gradual cooling off in the sentiments of both parties concerned and though Roger Seaton was still occasionally seen with Morgana, in her automobile, in her opera box, or at her receptions, his appearances were fewer, and other men, in fact many other men, were more openly encouraged and flattered, Morgana herself showing as much indifference towards him as she had at first shown interest. When, therefore, he suddenly left the social scene of action, his acquaintances surmised that he had got an abrupt dismissal, or, as they more brusquely expressed it, the game's up. He's lost his chance, they said, shaking their heads forlornly, and he's poorer than Job. He'll be selling newspapers in the cars for a living by and by. However, he was never met engaged in this lucrative way of business. He simply turned his back on everybody. Morgana Royal included, and so far as society was concerned, just disappeared. In the hut of the dying, on that lonely hill slope in California, he was happy, feeling a relief from infinite boredom, 
and thankful to be alone. He had much to think about, and much to do. Inhabited places and the movement of people were to him tedious and fatiguing, and he decided that nature, wild in a solitary and savage aspect, would suit his speculative and creative tendencies best. Yet, like all human beings, he had his odd, almost childlike moods, inexplicable even to himself. Moods illogical, almost pettish, and wholly incongruous with his own accepted principles of reasoning. For instance, he maintained that women had neither attraction nor interest for him. Yet he found himself singularly displeased when after two or three days of utter solitude, when he was rather eagerly expecting Manella to arrive with the new milk which was his staple food, a lanky, red-haired, ugly boy appeared instead of her. A boy who slouched along, swinging the milk pail in one hand and clutching a half-munched slice of pineapple in the other. Hello, called this individual. Not dead yet. For answer, Seaton strode forward, and taking the milk pail from him, gripped him by the dirty cotton shirt and gave him a brief but severe shaking. No, not dead yet, he said. You insolent young monkey, who are you? The boy wriggled in his captor's clutch and tried to squirm himself out of it. I'm Jake, the cause me Irish Jake, he gasped. Oh, blessed Mary, my breath. I clean the knives at the plaza. I'll clean knives for you presently, remarked Seaton with a threatening gesture. Yes, Irish Jake, I will. Who sent you here? She did. Oh, Mary, mother. The youth gave a further wriggle. Miss Ceriso, the girl they call Manella. She told me to say she's too busy to come herself. Seaton let go the handful of shirt he had held. Too busy to come herself, he repeated slowly, then smiled. Well, that's all right. Here he lifted the pail of milk, took it into his hut and brought it back empty, while Irish Jake, as the boy called himself, stood staring. Tell Miss Ceriso that I quite understand, and that I'm delighted to hear she's so busy. Now, let us see. Here he pulled some money out of his pocket and fingered a few dirty paper notes. There, Irish Jake, you'll find that's correct. And when you come here again, don't forget your manners, see? Then you may be able to keep that disgraceful shirt of yours on. Otherwise, it's likely to be torn off. If you are Irish, you should remember that in very ancient days there used to be manners in the Emerald Isle. Yes, positively. Fine, gracious, lovely manners. It doesn't look as if that will be ever any more. But we live in hope. Anyway, you, you young offspring of an Irish hybrid gorilla, you'd best remember what I say or there'll be trouble. And, here he made a mock solemn bow, my compliments to Mr. Riso. The red-haired youth remained for a moment stock still, with mouth and eyes open. Then snatching up the empty pail, he scampered down the hill slope in a lightning quick run. Seaton looked after him with an air of contemptuous amusement. Ugly little devil, he soliloquized. And yet nature made him, as she makes many hideous things, in a hurry, I presume, without any time for details or artistic finish. Well, here he stretched his arms out with a long sigh. And the silly girl is too busy to come. As if I could not see through that little game, she'd give her eyes to come. Fine eyes they are, too. She just thinks she'll pay me out for being rough with her the other day. She's got an idea that she'll vex me and make me want to see her. She's right. I am vexed, and I do want to see her. It was mid morning and the sun blazed down upon the hillside with the scorching breath of a volcano. He turned into his hut. It was a dark, cool little dwelling, comfortable enough for a single inhabitant. There was a camp bed in one corner, and there were a couple of wicker chairs made for easy transposition into full-length couches, if so required. 
a good-sized deal table occupied the centre of the living-room and on the table was a clear crystal bowl full of what appeared at first glance to be plain water but which on closer observation showed a totally different quality unlike water it was never still some interior bubbling perpetually moved it to sway and sparkle throwing out tiny flashes as though the smallest diamond cuttings were striving to escape from it while it exhaled around itself an atmosphere of extreme coldness and freshness like that of ice seaton threw himself indolently into one of the wicker chairs by the window a window which was broad and wide commanding a full view of distant mountains and far away to the left a glimpse of sea i am vexed and i want to see her he repeated speaking aloud to himself now why why am i vexed and why do i want to see her reason gives no answer if she were here she would bore me to death i could do nothing she would ask me questions and if i answered them she would not understand she is too stupid she has no comprehension of anything beyond simple primitive animalism now if it were morgana he stopped in his talk and started as if he had been stung some subtle influence stole over him like the perfumed mist of incense he leaned back in his chair and half closed his eyes what was the stealthy creeping magnetic power that like an invisible hand touched his brain and pulled at his memory and forced him to see before him a small elf-like figure clad in white with a rope of gold hair twisting snake-like down over its shoulders and glistening in the light of the moon for the moment he lost his usual iron mastery of will and let himself go on the white flood of a dream he recalled his first meeting with morgana one of accident not design in the great laboratory of a distinguished scientist he had taken her for a little girl student trying to master a few principles of chemistry and was astonished and incredulous when the distinguished scientist himself had introduced her as one of our most brilliant theorists on the future development of radioactivity such a description seemed altogether absurd applied to a little fair creature with beseeching blue eyes and gold hair they had left the laboratory together walking some way in company and charmed with each other's conversation then when closer acquaintance followed and he had learned her true position in social circles and the power she wielded owing to her vast wealth he at once withdrew from her as much as was civilly possible disliking the suggestion of any sordid motive for his friendship but she had so sweetly reproached him for this and had enticed him on yes he swore it within himself she had enticed him on in a thousand ways most especially by the amazing grip she had of scientific problems in which he was interested and which puzzled him but which she seemed to unravel as easily as she might unravel a skein of wool her clear brightness of brain and logical precision of argument first surprised him into unqualified admiration calling to his mind the assertion of a renowned physiologist that from the beginning woman had lived in another world than man formed of finer vibrations and consequently finer chemical atoms she is in touch with more subtle planes of existence and of sensation and ideation she holds unchallenged the code of life then admiration yielded to the usual undersense of masculine resentment against feminine intellectuality and a kind of smouldering wrath and opposition took the place of his former chivalry and the almost tender pleasure he had previously felt in her exceptional genius and ability and there came an evening why did he think of it now he wondered when after a brilliant summer ball given at the beautiful residence of a noted society woman on long island he had taken morgana out into their hostess's garden which sloped to the sea and they had strolled together almost unknowingly down to the shore where under the light of the moon the atlantic waves sunken to little dainty frills of lace-like foam broke murmuringly at their feet 
and he, turning suddenly to his companion, was all at once smitten by a sense of witchery in her looks as she stood, garmented in her white, vaporous ball gown, with diamonds in her hair and on her bosom, smitten with an overpowering lightning stroke of passion, which burnt his soul as a desert is burnt by the hot breath of the simoon, and yielding to its force, he had caught the small, fine, fairy creature in his arms, and kissed her wildly on lips and eyes and hair, and she, she had not resisted. Then, as swiftly as he had clasped her, he let her go, and stood before her in a strange spirit of defiance. Forgive me, he said, in low and even tones. I, I did not mean it. She lifted her eyes to his, half proudly, half appealingly. You did not mean it? she asked, quietly. An amazed scorn flashed into her face, clouding its former sweetness. Then she smiled coldly, turned away, and left him. In a kind of stupor he watched her go, her light figure disappearing by degrees, as she went up the ascending path from the sea to the house where gay music was still sounding for dancers not yet grown weary. And from that evening a kind of silence fell between them. They were separated as by an ice floe. They met often in the social round, but scarcely spoke more than the ordinary words of conventional civility, and Morgana apparently gave herself up to frivolity, coquetting with her numerous admirers and would-be husbands, in a casual, not to say heartless manner, which provoked Seaton past endurance so much so that he worked himself up into a kind of cynical detestation and contempt for her, both as a student of science and a woman of wealth. And yet, and yet, he had almost loved her. And a thing that goaded him to the quick was that so far as scientific knowledge and attainment were concerned, she was more than his equal. Irritated by his own quarrelsome set of sentiments which pulled him first this way and then that, he decided that the only thing possible for him was to put a great divide of distance between himself and her. This he had done. And to what purpose? Apparently merely to excite her ridicule, and to prick her human up to the mischievous prank of finding out where he had fled and following him. And she, even she, who had kept him aloof ever since that fatal moment on the seashore, had discovered him on this lonely hillside and taunted him with her light mockery, and actually said that to kiss him would be like kissing a bunch of nettles. She said that. She who for one wild moment he had held in his arms. Bah! He sprang up from his chair in a kind of rage with himself, as his thoughts crowded thick and fast one on the other. Why did he think of her at all? It was as if some external commanding force compelled him to do so. Then she had seen Manella, and had naturally drawn her own conclusions, based on the girl's rich beauty which was so temptingly set within his reach. He began to talk to himself aloud once more, picking up the thread of his broken converse where he had left it. If it were Morgana, it would be far worse than if it were Manella, he said. The one is too stupid, the other too clever. But the stupid woman would make the best wife, if I wanted one, which I do not, and the best mother, if I desired children, which I do not. The question is, what do I want? I think I know, but supposing I get it, shall I be satisfied? Will it fulfil my life's desire? What is my life's desire? He stood inert, his tall figure erect, his eyes full of strange and meditative earnestness, and for a moment he seemed to gather his mental forces together with an effort. Turning towards the table, where the bowl of constantly sparking fluid danced in tiny flashing eddies within its crystal prison, he watched its movement. There's the clue, he said. So little yet so much. Life that cannot cease, force that cannot die. For me, for me alone, this secret, to do with it what I will, 
to destroy or to recreate how shall i use it if i could sweep the planet clean of its greedy contentious human microbes and found a new race i might be a power for good but should i care to do this if god does not care why should i he lost himself anew in musing then rousing his mind to work he put paper pens and ink on the table and started writing busily only interrupting himself once for a light meal of dry bread and milk during a stretch of six or seven hours at the end of his self-appointed time he went out of the hut to see as he often expressed it what the sky was doing it was not doing much being a mere hot glare in which the sun was beginning to roll westwards slowly like a sinking fireball he brought out one of the wicker chairs from the hut and set it in the only patch of shade by the door stretching himself full length upon it and closing his eyes composed himself to sleep his face in repose was a remarkably handsome one a little hard in outline but strong nobly featured and expressive of power an ambitious sculptor would have rejoiced in him as a model for achilles he was as unlike the modern hideous type of man as he could well be and most particularly unlike any specimen of american that could be found on the whole huge continent in truth he was purely and essentially english of england one of the fine old breed of men nurtured among the winds and waves of the north for whom no labour was too hard no service too exacting no death too difficult provided the word was the bond his natural gifts of intellect were very great and profound study had ripened and rounded them to fruition certain discoveries in chemistry which he had tested were brought to the attention of his own country's scientists who in their usual way of accepting new light on old subjects smiled placidly shook their heads pooh-poohed and finally set aside the matter for future discussion but roger seaton was not of a nature to sink under a rebuff if the wise men of gotham in england refused to take first advantage of the knowledge he had to offer then the wise men of gotham in germany or the united states should have their chance he tried the united states and was received with open arms and open minds so he resolved to stay there for a few years at any rate and managed to secure a position with the tireless magician edison in whose workshops he toiled patiently as an underling obtaining deeper grasp of his own instinctive knowledge and further insight into an immense nature secret which he had determined to master alone he had not mastered it yet but he felt fairly confident that he was near the goal as he slept peacefully with the still shade of a heavily foliaged vine which ramped over the roof of the hut sheltering his face from the sun his whole form in its relaxed easy attitude expressed force in repose physical energy held in leash the sun sank lower its hue changing from poppy red to burning orange and presently a woman's figure appeared on the hill slope and cautiously approached the sleeper a beautiful figure of classic mould and line clothed in a simple white linen garb with a red rose at its breast it was manella she had taken extraordinary pains with her attire plain though it was something dainty and artistic in the manner of its wearing made its simplicity picturesque and the red rose at her bosom was effectively supplemented by another in her hair showing brilliantly against its rich blackness she stopped when about three paces away from the sleeping man and watched him with a wonderful tenderness her lips quivered sweetly her lovely eyes shone with a soft wistfulness she looked indeed as morgana had said of her quite beautiful instinctively aware in slumber that he was not alone seaton stirred opened his eyes and sprang up what manella he exclaimed i thought you were too busy to come she hung her head a little shamefacedly i had to come she answered there was no one else ready to bring this for you she held out a telegram he opened it and read it it was very brief 
shall be with you to-morrow, Gwent. He folded it and put it in his pocket. Then he turned to Manella, smiling. Very good of you to bring this, he said. Why didn't you send Irish Jake? He is taking luggage down from the rooms, she answered. Many people are going away today. Is that why you were so busy, he asked, the smile still dancing in his eyes. She gave a little toss of her head, but said nothing. And how fine we are today, he said, glancing over her with an air of undisguised admiration. White suits you, Manella. You should always wear it. For what fortunate man have you dressed yourself so prettily? She shrugged her shoulders expressively. For you. For me? Oh, Manella, what a frank confession. And what a contradiction you are to yourself. For did you not send word by that Irish monkey that you were too busy to come? And yet you dress yourself in white with red roses for me. And you come after all. Capricious child. Oh, Senora Soriso, how greatly honoured I am. She looked straight at him. You laugh, you laugh, she said, but I do not care. You can laugh at me all the time if you like, but you cannot help looking at me. Ah, yes, you cannot help that. A triumphant glory flashed in her eyes, red lips parted in a ravishing smile. You cannot help it, she repeated. That little white lady, that friend of yours, who you hate and love at the same time, she told me I was quite beautiful. I know I am, and you know it too. He bent his eyes upon her gravely. I have always known it, yes, he said, then paused. Dear child, beauty is nothing. She made a swift step towards him and laid a hand on his arm. Her ardent, glowing face was next to him. You do not speak truly, and her voice was tremulous. To a man, it is everything. Her physical fascination was magnetic, and for a moment he had some trouble to resist its spell. Very gently he put an arm round her, and with a tender delicacy of touch, unfastened the rose she wore at her bosom. There, dear, he said, I will keep this with me for company. It's like you except that it doesn't talk and doesn't ask for love. It has it without asking, she murmured. He smiled. Has it? Well, perhaps it has. He paused, then stooping his tall head, kissed her once on the lips as a brother might have kissed her. And perhaps one day, when the right man comes along, you will have it too. End of chapter 10of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathleen the secret power by marie corelli chapter 11 mr sam gwent stood in what was known as the floral hall of the plaza hotel so called because it was built in colonnades which opened into various vistas of flowers and clambering vines growing with all the luxuriance common to california he had just arrived and while divesting himself of a light dust overcoat interrogated the official at the inquiry office so he doesn't live here after all he said then where's he to be found mr seaton has taken the hill hut replied the bookkeeper the hut of the dying it is sometimes called he prefers it to the hotel the air is better for his lungs air lungs gwent sniffed contemptuously there's very little the matter with his lungs if he's the man i know where's this hut of the dying can i get there straight the bookkeeper touched a bell and manella appeared gwent stared openly here if prize beauties were anything was a real winner this gentleman wants mr seaton said the bookkeeper just show him the way up the hill sorry to trouble you said gwent raising his hat with a courtesy not common to his manner oh it is no trouble and manella smiled at him in the most ravishing way the path is quite easy to follow she preceded him out of the floral hall and across the great gardens now in the most brilliant bloom to a gate which she opened 
pointing with one hand towards the hill where the flat outline of the hut of the dying could be seen clear against the sky there it is she explained it is nothing of a climb even on the warmest day and the air is quite different up there to what it is down here better i suppose oh yes much better and is that why mr seaton lives in the hut on account of the air manella waved her hands expressively with a charming spanish gesture of indifference i suppose so how should i know he is here for his health sam gwent uttered a curious inward sound something between a grunt and a cough ah uh, i should like to know how long he's been ill manella again gave her graceful gesture surely you do know if you are a friend of his she said he looked keenly at her are you a friend of his she smiled almost laughed i i am only a help in the plaza i take him his food take him his food sam gwent growled out something like an oath what can't he come and get it for himself is he treated like a bear in the cage or a baby in a cradle manella gazed at him with reproachful soft eyes oh you are rough she said he pays for whatever little trouble he gives indeed it is no trouble he lives very simply only on new milk and bread i expect his health will not stand anything else though truly he does not look ill gwen cut her description short well thank you for showing me the way senora or senorita whichever you are i think you must be spanish senorita she said with gentle emphasis i am not married you are right that i am spanish such eyes as yours were never born of any blood but spanish said gwent i knew that at once that you are not married is a bit of luck for some man the man you will marry for the moment adios i shall dine at the plaza this evening and shall very likely bring my friend with me she shook her head smiling you will not how so because he will not come she turned away back towards the hotel and gwent started to ascend the hill alone here's a new sort of game he thought a game i should never have imagined possible to a man like roger seaton hiding himself up here in a consumption hut and getting a beautiful woman to wait on him and take him his food it beats most things i've heard of dollar sensation books aren't in it i wonder what morgana royal would say to it if she knew he's given her the slip this time halfway up the hill he paused to rest and saw seaton striding down at a rapid pace to meet him hello gwent hello the two men shook hands i got your wire at the beginning of the week said gwent and came as soon as i could get away it's been a stiff journey too but i wouldn't keep you waiting thanks it's as much your affair as mine said seaton the thing is ripe for action if you care to act it's quite in your hands i hardly thought you'd come but i sent you a reply wire oh yes that's all right but reply wires don't always clinch business yours arrived last night i wonder if it was ever delivered grumbled gwent it was addressed to the plaza hotel not to a hut on a hill seaton laughed you've heard all about it i see but the hut on the hill is a dependence of the plaza a sort of annex where dying men are put away to die peaceably you are not a dying man said gwent very meaningfully and i can't make out why you pretend to be one again seaton laughed i'm not pretending my dear gwent we're all dying men one may die a little faster than another but it's all the same sort of rot and rot and thereby hangs a tale what's the news in washington they walked up the hill slowly side by side not startling answered gwent then paused and repeated not startling there's nothing startling nowadays though some folks made a very good show of being startled when my nephew jack shot himself seaton stopped in his walk shot himself that lad was he insane of course according to the coroner everybody is called insane who gets out of the world when it's too difficult to live in some people would call it sane i call it just cowardice jack had lost his last chance you see morgana royal threw him over seaton paced along with a velvet-footed stride like a tiger on a trail had she led him on rather she leads all men on or they think she does she led you on at one time seaton turned upon him with a quick savage movement never i saw through her from the first she could never make a fool of me sam gwent gave a short cough expressing incredulity well washington thought you were the favorite catch and envied your luck certainly she showed a great preference for you can't you talk of something else interposed seaton impatiently gwent gave him an amused side glance why of course i can he responded but i thought i'd tell you about jack i'm sorry said seaton hastily conscious that he had been lacking in sympathy he was your heir i believe yes he might have been had he kept a bit straighter said gwent but heirs are no good anywhere or anyhow they only spend what they inherit and waste the honest work of a lifetime is that your prize palace he pointed to a hut which they had almost reached that's it answered seaton 
and i prefer it to any place ever built no servants no furniture no useless lumber just a place to live in enough for any man a tub was enough for diogenes commented gwent if we all lived in his way or your way it would be a poor lookout for trade however i presume you'll escape taxation here seaton made no reply but led the way into his dwelling offering his visitor a chair i hope you've had breakfast he said for i haven't any to give you you can have a glass of milk if you like gwent made a wire face i am not a good subject for primitive nourishment he said i've been weaned too long for it to agree with me he sat down his eyes were at once attracted by the bowl of restless fluid on the table what's that he asked roger seaton smiled enigmatically only a trifle he answered just health it's a sort of talisman germ proof dust proof disease proof no microbe of mischief however infinitesimal can exist near it and a few drops taken into the system revivify the whole if that's so your fortune's made said gwent give your discovery or recipe or whatever it is to the world to keep the world alive no thank you and the look of dark scorn on seaton's face was astonishing in its almost satanic expression that is precisely what i wish to avoid the world is overripe and overrotten, and it is overcrowded with a festering humanity that is inhuman, and worse than bestial in its furious grappling for self and greed. One remedy for the evil would be that no children should be born in it for the next thirty or forty years. The relief would be incalculable. A monstrous burden would be lifted, and there would be some chance of betterment. But as this can never be, other remedies must be sought and found it's pure hypocrisy to talk of love for children when every day we read of mothers selling their offspring for so much cash down lately in china during a spell of famine parents killed their daughters like young calves for food ugly facts like these have to be looked in the face it's no use putting them behind one's back and murmuring beautiful lies about mother love and such nonsense as for the old mosaic commandment honor thy father and mother it's ordinary newspaper reading to hear of boys and girls attacking and murdering their parents for the sake of a few dollars you've got the ugly facts by heart said gwen slowly but there's another and more cheerful outlook if you choose to consider it newspaper reading always gives the worst and dirtiest side of everything it wouldn't be newspaper stuff if it was clean newspapers remind me of the rotting heaps and gardens all the rubbish piled together till the smell becomes a nuisance then a good burning takes place of the whole collection and it makes a sort of fourth-rate manure he paused a moment then went on i'm not given to sentiment but i dare say there are still a few folks who love each other in this world and it's good to know of when they do my sister he paused again as if something stuck in his throat my sister loved her boy jack his death has driven her silly doctors say she will recover that it's only shock shock is answerable for a good many tragedies since the european war seaton moved impatiently but said nothing you're a bit on the fidgets resumed gwent placidly you want me to come to business and i will may i smoke his companion nodded and he drew out his cigar case selecting from it a particularly fragrant havana you don't do this sort of thing or i'd offer you one he said pity you don't it soothes the nerves but i know your fads you are too closely acquainted with the human organism to either smoke or drink well every man to his own method now what you want me to do is this to represent the force and meaning of a certain substance which you have discovered to the government of the united states and induce them to purchase it is that so that is so and roger seaton fixed his eyes on gwent's hard lantern-jawed face with a fiery intensity remember it's not child's play whoever takes what i can give holds the mastery of the world i offer it to the united states but i would have preferred to offer it to great britain being as i am an english man but the dilatory british men of science have snubbed me once and i do not intend them to have the chance of doing it again briefly i offer the united states the power to end wars and all thought or possibility of war forever no treaty of versailles or any other treaty will ever be necessary the only thing i ask in reward for my discovery is the government pledge to use it that is of course should occasion arise for my material needs which are small an allowance of a sum per annum as long as i live will satisfy my ambition the allowance may be as much or as little as is found convenient 
the pledge to use my discovery is the one all-important point it must be a solemn binding pledge never to be broken gwent puffed slowly at his cigar it's a bit puzzling he said when and where should it be used seaton stretched out a hand argumentatively now listen he said suppose two nations quarrel or rather their governments and their press force them to quarrel the united states possessing my discovery steps between and says very well the first move towards war the first gun fired means annihilation for one of you or both we hold the power to do this gwent drew his cigar from his lips annihilation he murmured annihilation for one or both just so absolute annihilation and seaton smiled with a pleasant air of triumph a holocaust of microbes the united states must let the whole world know of their ability to do this without giving away my discovery they must say to the nations we will have no more wars if innocent people are to be killed they can be killed quite as easily in one way as another and our way will cost nothing neither ships nor ammunition nor guns and of course the disputants will be given time to decide their own fate for themselves sam gwent holding his cigar between his fingers and looking meditatively at its glowing end smiled shrewdly all very well he said but you forget money interests money interests always start a war it isn't nations that do it it's companies your stuff won't annihilate companies all over the globe governments are not likely to damage their own financial moves suppose the united states government agreed to your proposition and took the sole possession and proprietorship of your discovery and gave you their written signed and sealed pledge to use it it doesn't at all follow that they would not break that pledge at the first opportunity in these days governments break promises as easily as eggshells and there would be ample excuse for breaking the pledge to you simply on the ground of inhumanity war is inhumanity said seaton the use of my discovery would be no worse than war granted but war makes money for certain sections of the community you must think of that and gwent's little shrewd eyes gleamed like bits of steel money money stores food clothing transport all these things in war mean fortunes to the contractors while the wiping out of a nation in your way would mean loss of money loss of life wouldn't matter it never does really matter not to governments but loss of money ah well that's a very different and much more serious affair a cynical smile twisted his features as he spoke and roger seaton standing opposite to him with his fine head well thrown back on his shoulders and his whole face alive with the power of thought looked rather like a viking expostulating with some refractory vassal so you think the united states wouldn't take my discovery he said or if they took it couldn't be trusted to keep a pledged word gwent shrugged his shoulders of course our government could be trusted as much as any other government in the world he said perhaps more but it would exonerate itself for breaking even a pledged word which necessitated an inhuman act involving loss of money see war is an inhuman act but it brings considerable gain to those who engineer it this makes all the difference between humanity and inhumanity well you are a senator and you ought to know replied seaton and if your opinion is against my offer i will not urge you to make it but as i live and stand here talking to you you may bet every dollar you possess that if neither the united states nor any other government will accept the chance i give it of holding the nations like dogs in leash i'll hold them myself i one single unit of the overteeming millions yes mr senator gwent i swear it i'll be master of the world end of chapter eleven Of, of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathleen the secret power by marie corelli chapter 12 gwent was silent with methodical care he flicked off the burnt end of his cigar and watched it where it fell as though it were something rare and curious he wanted a few minutes to think he gave a quick upward glance at the tall athletic figure above him with its magnificent head and flashing eyes and the words i'll be master of the world gave him an unpleasant thrill 
one man on the planet with power to destroy nations seemed quite a fantastic idea yet science made it actually possible he bethought himself of a book he had lately read concerning radioactivity in which he had been struck by the following passage radioactivity is an explosive of great violence the energy exerted is millions of times more powerful than the highest explosive substance yet made in our laboratories one bomb loaded with such energy would be equal to millions of bombs of the same size and energy as used in the trenches one's mind stands aghast at the thought of what could be possible if such power were used for destructive purposes a single aeroplane could carry sufficient to annihilate a whole army or lay the biggest city in ruins with the death of all its inhabitants the writer of the book in question had stated that so far no means had been found of conserving and concentrating this tremendous force for such uses but quint looking at roger seaton said within himself he's got it and this impression urging itself strongly in on his brain was sufficiently startling to give him a touch of what is called nerves after a considerably long pause he said slowly well master of the world is a pretty tall order now look here seaton you're a plain straight man and so am i as much as my business will let me what are you after anyway what is your aim and end you say you don't want money yet money is the chief goal of all men's ambition you don't care for fame though you could have it for the lifting of a finger and i suppose you don't want love seaton laughed heartily pushing back with a ruffling hand the thick hair from his broad open brow all three propositions are nil to me he said i suppose it is because i can have them for the asking and what satisfaction is there in any one of them a man only needs one dinner a day a place to sleep in and ordinary clothes to wear very little money is required for the actual necessaries of life enough can be earned by any day laborer as for fame whosoever reads the life of even one famous man will never be such a fool as to wish for the capricious plaudits of a fool public and love love does not exist not what i call love oh may i have your definition why yes of course you may love to my thinking means complete harmony between two souls like two notes that make a perfect chord the man must feel that he can thoroughly trust and reverence the woman the woman must feel the same towards the man and the sense of reverence is perhaps the best and most binding quality but nowadays what woman will you find worth reverence what man so free from drink and debauchery as to command it the human beings of our day are often less respectable than the beasts i can imagine love what it might be what it should be but till we have a very different and more spiritualized world the thing is impossible again gwent was silent for some minutes then he said apparently the spirit of destructiveness is strong in you as master of the world to quote your own words i presume that in the event of a nation or nations deciding on war you would give them a time limit to consider and hold conference with their allies and then if they were resolved to begin hostilities then i could and would wipe them off the face of the earth in twenty-four hours said seaton calmly from nations they should become mere dust heaps war makes its own dust heaps but with infinitely more cost and trouble the way of exit i offer would be cheap in comparison gwent smiled a grim smile well i come back to my former question he said suppose the occasion arose and you did all this what pleasure to yourself do you foresee the pleasure of clearing the poor old earth of some of its pestilential microbes answered seaton something of the same thankful satisfaction sir ronald ross must have experienced when he discovered the mosquito breeders of yellow fever and malaria and caused them to be stamped out the men who organize national disputes are a sort of mosquito infecting their fellow creatures with perverted mentality and disease they should be exterminated why not begin with the newspaper offices suggested gwent the purlieus of cheap journalism are the breeding places of the human malaria mosquito true and it wouldn't be a bad idea to stamp them out here seaton threw back his head with the challenging gesture which was characteristic of his temperament but what is called the liberty of the press it should be called the license of the press is more of an octopus than a mosquito cut off one tentacle it grows another it's entirely octopus in character too it only lives to fill its stomach oh come come and gwent's little steely eyes sparkled it's the safeguard of nations don't you know 
it stands for honest free speech truth patriotism justice good god burst out seaton impatiently when it does then the new world about which men talk so much may get a beginning honest free speech truth why modern journalism is one great lie advertised on hoardings from one end of the world to the other i agree said gwent and there you have the root and cause of war no need to exterminate nations with your destructive stuff you should get at the microbes who undermine the nations first when you can do that you will destroy the guilty and spare the innocent whereas your plan of withering a nation into a dust heap involves the innocent along with the guilty war does that said seaton curtly it does and your aim is to do away with all chance or possibility of war for ever good but you need to attack the actual root of the evil seaton's brow clouded into a frown you're a careful man gwent he said and in the main you are right i know as well as you do that the license of the press is the devil's finger in the cauldron of affairs stirring up strife between nations that would probably be excellent friends and allies if it were not for this license mischief but so long as the mob reads the lies so long will the liars flourish and my argument is that if any two peoples are so brainless as to be led into war by their press they are not fit to live no more fit than the mosquitoes that once made panama a graveyard gwynne smoked leisurely regarding his companion with unfeigned interest apparently you haven't much respect for life he said not when it is diseased life not when it is perverted life returned seaton then it is mere deformity and encumbrance for life itself in all its plenitude health and beauty i have the deepest most passionate respect it is the outward ray or reflex of the image of god stop there interrupted gwent you believe in god i do most utterly that is to say i believe in an all-pervading mind originating and commanding the plan of the universe we talk of ions and electrons but we are driven to confess that a supreme intelligence has the creation of electrons and directs them as to the formation of all existing things to that mind to that intelligence i submit my soul and i do not believe that this supreme mind desires evil or sorrow we create disaster ourselves and it is ourselves that must destroy it we are given free will if we will to create disease we must equally will to exterminate it by every means in our power i think i follow you said gwent slowly but now as regards this supreme intelligence i suppose you will admit that the plan of creation is a dual sort of scheme that is to say male and female created he them why of course and seaton smiled the question is superfluous i asked it went on gwent because you seem to eliminate the female element from your life altogether therefore so i take it you are not at your full strength either as a scientist or philosopher you are a kind of eagle trying to fly high on one wing you'll need the other there don't look at me in that savage way i'm merely making my own comments on your position you needn't mind them i want to get out of the tangle up of things you have suggested you fancy it would be easy to get the united states government to purchase your discovery and pledge themselves to use it on occasion for the complete wiping out of a nation any nation that decided to go to war and failing their acceptance or the acceptance of any government on these lines you propose doing the deed yourself well i can tell you straight away it's no use my trying to negotiate such a business the inhumanity of it is too palpable what of the inhumanity of war asked seaton that pays replied gwent with emphasis you don't or won't seem to recognize that blistering fact the inhumanity of war pays everybody concerned in it except the fellows who fight to order they are the raw material they get used up your business wouldn't pay and what won't pay is no good to anybody in this present sort of world seaton still standing erect bent his eyes on the lean hard features of his companion with eloquent scorn so everything must be measured and tested by money he said and yet you senators talk of reform of a new world of a higher code of conduct between man and man yes we talk interrupted gwent but we don't mean what we say we should never think of meaning it scribes and pharisees hypocrites quoted seaton with passionate emphasis just so 
the lord christ said it two thousand years ago and it's true to-day we haven't improved with an impatient movement seaton strode to the door of his hut and looked out at the wide sky then turned back again gwent watched him critically after all he said it isn't as if you wanted anything of anybody money is no object of yours if it were i should advise your selling your discovery to morgana royal she'd buy it and i tell you what she'd use it thanks and seaton nodded curtly i can use it myself true and gwent looked interestedly at his dwindling havana you can there followed a pause during which gwent thought of the strange predicament in which the world might find itself under the scientific rule of one man who had it in his power to create a terrific catastrophe without even showing his hand anyway seaton you surely want to make something out of life for yourself don't you what is there to be made out of it he asked well happiness the physical pleasure of living i am happy declared seaton and i entirely appreciate the physical pleasure of living but i should be happier and better pleased with life if i could rid the earth of some of its mischief disease and sorrow how about leaving that to the supreme intelligence interposed gwent that's just it the supreme intelligence led me to the discovery i have made and i feel that it has been given into my hands for a purpose gwent i am positive that this same supreme intelligence expects this creature man to help him in the involvement and work of the universe it is the only reasonable cause for man's existence we must help not hinder the scheme of which we are a part and wherever hindrance comes in we are bound to remove and destroy it the last ash of gwent's cigar fell to the floor and gwent himself rose from his chair well i suppose we've had our talk out he said i came here prepared to offer you a considerable sum for your discovery but i can't go so far as a government pledge so i must leave it to you you know here he hesitated you know a good many people would consider you mad seaton laughed oh that goes without saying did you ever hear of any scientist possessing a secret drawn from the soul of nature that was not called mad at once by his compeers and the public i can stand that accusation pray heaven i never get as mad as a wall street gambler you will if you gamble with the lives of nations said gwent let the nations beware how they gamble with their own lives retorted seaton you say war is a method of money-making let them take heed how they touch money coined in human blood i one man only but an instrument of the supreme intelligence i say and swear there shall be no more wars as he uttered these words there was something almost supernatural in the expression of his face his attitude proudly erect offered a kind of defiance to the world and involuntarily gwent looking at him thought of the verse in the third psalm i laid me down and slept i awaked for the lord sustained me i will not be afraid of ten thousands of the people that have set themselves against me round about no he would not be afraid gwent mused he is a man for whom there is no such thing as fear but if it knew the world might be afraid of him aloud he said well you may put it into war but you will never put an end to men's hatred and envy of one another and if they can't let the steam off in fighting they'll find some other way which may be worse if you come to consider it all nature is at war with itself it's a perpetual struggle to live and it's evident that the struggle was intended and ordained as universal law life would be pretty dull without effort and effort means war war against what against whom asked seaton against whatever or whoever opposes the effort replied gwent promptly there must be opposition otherwise effort would be unnecessary my good fellow you've got an idea that you can alter the fixed plan of things but you can't the cleverest of us are only like goldfish in a glass bowl they see the light through but they cannot get to it the old ship of the world will sail on its appointed way to its destined port and the happiest creatures are those who are content to sail with it in the faith that god is at the helm he broke off smiling at his own sudden eloquence then added by the by where is your laboratory haven't got one replied seaton briefly what haven't got one why how do you make your stuff 
seaton laughed you think i'm going to tell you mr senator gwent you take me for a greater fool than i am my stuff needs neither fire nor crucible the formula was fairly complete before i left washington but i wanted quiet and solitude to finish what i had begun it is finished now that's why i sent for you to make the proposition which you say you cannot carry through finished is it queried gwent abstractedly and you have it here in a finished state seaton nodded affirmatively then i suppose said gwent with a nervous laugh you could finish me if it suited your humor i could certainly and seaton gave him quite an encouraging smile i could reduce mr senator gwent into a small pinch of gray dust in about forty seconds without pain you wouldn't feel it i assure you it would be too swift for feeling thanks much obliged said gwent i won't trouble you this morning i rather enjoy being alive so do i declared seaton still smiling i could only state what i could do gwent stood at the door of the hut and surveyed the scenery you've a fine wild view here he said i think i shall stay at the plaza a day or two before returning to washington there's a very attractive girl there oh you mean manila said seaton carelessly yes she's quite a beauty she's the maid waitress or help of some sort at the hotel she's a good draw for male visitors said gwent many a man i know would pay a hundred dollars a day to have her wait upon him would you asked seaton amused well perhaps not a hundred dollars a day but pretty near it her eyes are the finest i've ever seen seaton made no comment you'll come and dine with me tonight won't you went on gwent you can spare me an hour or two of your company no thanks seaton replied don't think me a churlish brute but i don't like hotels or the people who frequent them besides we've done our business unfortunately there was no business doing said gwent sorry i couldn't take it on don't be sorry i'll take it on myself when the moment comes i would have preferred the fiat of a great government to that of one unauthorized man but if there's no help for it then the one man must act gwent looked at him with a grave intenseness which he meant to be impressive seaton these new scientific discoveries are dangerous tools he said if they are not handled carefully they may work more mischief than we dream of be on your guard why we might break up the very planet we live on some day very possible answered seaton lightly but it wouldn't be missed come i'll walk with you half way down the hill he threw on a broad palmetto hat as a shield against the blazing sun for it was now the full heat of the afternoon while gwent solemnly unfurled a white canvas umbrella which folded served him on occasion as a walking stick a greater contrast could hardly be imagined than that afforded by the two men the conventionally clothed stiff-jointed washington senator and the fine easy supple figure of his roughly garbed companion and manella watching them descend the hill from a coin of vantage in the plaza gardens criticized their appearance in her own special way poof she said to herself snapping her fingers in air he is so ugly that one man so dry and yellow and old but the other he is a god and she snapped her fingers again then kissed them towards the object of her admiration her object as unconscious and indifferent as any senseless idol ever worshipped by blind devotees end of chapter twelve Thirteen of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by kathleen the secret power by marie corelli chapter thirteen on his return to the plaza mr sam gwent tried to get some conversation with manella but found it difficult she did not wait on the visitors in the dining-room and gwent imagined he knew the reason why her beauty was of too brilliant and rianti a type to escape the notice and admiration of men whose open attentions were likely to be embarrassing to her and annoying to her employers she was therefore kept very much out of the way serving on the upper floors and was only seen flitting up and down the staircase or passing through the various corridors and balconies however when evening fell and its dark still heat made even the hotel lounge cooled as it was by a fountain in full play almost unbearable gwent strolling forth into the garden found her there standing near a thick hedge of myrtle which exhaled a heavy scent 
as if every leaf were being crushed between invisible fingers she looked up as she saw him approaching and smiled you found your friend well she said very well indeed replied gwent promptly in fact i never knew he was ill manella gave her peculiar little uplift of the head which was one of her many fascinating gestures he is not ill she said he only pretends that is all he has some reason for pretending i think it is love gwent laughed not a bit of it he's the last man in the world to worry himself about love manella glanced him over with quite a superior air ah perhaps you do not know and she waved her hands expressively there was a wonderful lady came here to see him some weeks ago she stole up the hill at night like a spirit a little little fairy woman with golden hair gwent pricked up his ears and stood at attention yes really you don't say so a little fairy woman sounds like a story she wore the most lovely clothes went on manella clasping her hands in ecstasy she stayed at the plaza one night i waited upon her i saw her in bed she had skin like satin and eyes like blue stars her hair fell nearly to her ankles she was like a dream and she went up the hill by moonlight all by herself to find him gwent listened with close interest and i presume she found him manella nodded and a sigh escaped her oh yes she found him he told me that and i am sure something tells me here and she pressed one hand against her heart by the way he spoke that he loves her you seem to be a very observant young woman said gwent smiling one would think you were in love with him yourself she raised her large dark eyes to his with perfect frankness i am she said i see no shame in that he is a fine man it is good to love him gwent was completely taken aback here was primitive passion with a vengeance passion which admitted its own craving without subterfuge manella's eyes were still uplifted in a kind of childlike confidence i am happy to love him she went on i wish only to serve him he does not love me oh no he loves her but he hates her too ah and she gave a little shivering movement of her shoulders there is no love without hate and when one loves and hates with the same heartbeat that is a love for life and death she checked herself abruptly then a simplicity which was not without dignity added i am saying too much perhaps but you are his friend and i think he must be very lonely up there mr senator gwent was perplexed he had not looked to stumble on a romantic episode yet here was one ready-made to his hand his nature was ill-attuned to romance of any kind but he felt a certain compassion for this girl so richly dowered with physical beauty and smitten with love for a man like roger seaton who according to his own account had no belief in love's existence and the fairy woman she spoke of who could that be but morgana royal after his recent interview with seaton his thoughts were rather in a whirl and he sought for a bit of commonplace to which he could fasten them without the risk of their drifting into greater confusion yet that bit of commonplace was hard to find with a woman's lovely passionate eyes looking straight into his and the woman herself a warm-blooded embodiment of exquisite physical beauty framed like a picture among the scented myrtle boughs under the dusky violet sky where glittered a few stars with the large fiery brilliance so often seen in california he coughed it was a convenient thing to cough it cleared the throat and helped utterance i i well i hardly think he is lonely he said at last hesitatingly perhaps you don't know it but he's a very clever man an inventor a great thinker with new ideas he stopped how could this girl understand him what would she know of inventors and thinkers with new ideas a trifle embarrassed he looked at her she nodded her dark head and smiled i know she said he is a god sam gwent almost jumped a god oh these women of what fantastic exaggerations they are capable a god she repeated nodding again complacently he can do anything i feel that all the time he could rule the whole world gwent's nerves jumped for the second time roger seaton's own words i'll be master of the world knocked repeatedly on his brain with an uncomfortable thrill he gathered up the straying threads of his common sense and twisted them into a tough string that's all nonsense he said as gruffly as he could he's not a god by any means i'm afraid you think too much of him miss miss er ceriso finished manella gently manella ceriso thank you and gwent sought for a helpful cigar which he lit you have a very charming name yes believe me you think too much of him you say that but are you not his friend 
her tone was reproachful but gwent was now nearly his normal business self again no i am scarcely his friend he replied friend is a big word it implies more than most men ever mean i just know him i've met him several times and i know he worked for a while under edison and and that's about all then i think he was cautious here i think i've seen him at the house of a very wealthy lady in new york a miss royal ah exclaimed manella that is the name of the fairy woman who came here gwent went on without heeding her she too is very clever she is also an inventor and a scientist and if it was she who came here i dare say it was it was probably because she wished to ask his advice and opinion on some of the difficult things she studies manella snapped her fingers as though they were castanets ah bah she exclaimed not at all no difficult thing takes a woman out by moonlight all in soft white and diamonds to see a man no difficult thing at all except to tempt him to love yes that is the way it is done and i begin to learn and you if you are not his friend what are you here for gwent began to feel impatient with this irrepressible prize beauty i came to see him at his own request on business he answered curtly the business is concluded and i go away to-morrow manella was silent the low chirping of a cicada hidden in the myrtle thicket made monotonous sweetness on the stillness moved by some sudden instinct which he did not attempt to explain to himself gwent decided to venture on a little paternal advice now don't you fly off in a rage at what i'm going to say he began slowly you're only a child to me so i am just taking the liberty of talking to you as a child don't give too much of your time or your thought to the man you call a god he's no more a god than i am but i tell you one thing he's a dangerous customer manella's great bright eyes opened wide like stars in the darkness dangerous how i do not understand dangerous repeated gwent shaking his head at her not to you perhaps for you probably wouldn't mind if he killed you so long as he kissed you first oh yes i know the ways of women god made them trusting animals ready to slave all their lives for the sake of a caress you are one of that kind you'd willingly make a doormat of yourself for seaton to wipe his boots on i don't mean that he's dangerous in that way because though i might think him so you wouldn't no what i mean is that he's dangerous to himself likely to run risks of his life here he paused checked by the sudden terror in the beautiful eyes that stared at him his life and manella's voice trembled you think he is here to kill himself no no bless my soul he doesn't intend to kill himself said gwent testily he's not such a fool as all that now look here try and be a sensible girl the man is here with an invention a discovery which might do him harm i don't say it will but it might you've heard of bombs haven't you time to explode at a given moment manella nodded her lips trembled and she clasped her hands nervously across her bosom well i believe i won't say it for certain that he's got something worse than that said gwent impressively and that's why he was chosen to live up on that hill in the hut of the dying away from everybody see and of course anything may happen at any moment he's plucky enough and is not the sort of man to involve any other man in trouble and that's why he stays alone now you know so you can put away your romantic notions of his being in love a very good thing for him if he were it might draw him away from his present occupation in fact the best that could happen to him would be that you should make him fall in love with you she gave a little cry with me yes with you why not why don't you manage it a beautiful woman like you could win the game in less than a week she shook her head sorrowfully you don't know him she said but he knows knows what she gave a despairing little gesture that i love him ah that's a pity said gwent men are curious monsters in their love appetites they always refuse the offered dish and ask for something that isn't in the bill of fare you should have pretended to hate him i could not pretend that said manila sadly but if i could it would not matter he does not want a woman oh doesn't he gwent was amused at her quaint way of putting it well he's the first man i ever heard of that didn't that's all bunkum my good girl probably he's crying for the moon what is that she asked wistfully crying for the moon just hankering after what can't be got lots of men are afflicted that way but they've been known to give up crying and content themselves with something else he would never content himself she said if she the woman that came here 
is the moon he will always want her even i want her you exclaimed gwent amazed yes i want to see her again a puzzled look contracted her brows since she spoke to me i have always thought of her i cannot get her out of my mind she just holds me yes in one of her little white hands there are few women like that i think women who hold the souls of others as prisoners till they choose to let them go mr senator gwent was fairly nonplussed this dark-eyed spanish beauty with her romantic notions was almost too much for him had he met her in a novel he would have derided the author of the book for delineating such an impossible character but coming in contact with her in real life he was not at a loss what to say especially as he himself was quite aware of the mysterious hold exercised by morgana royal on those whom she chose to influence either near or at a distance after a few seconds of deliberation he answered yes i should say there are very few women of that rather uncomfortable sort of habit the fewer the better in my opinion now miss manella ceruso remember what i say to you don't think about being held by anybody except by a lover and husband see play the game with such good looks as god has given you it should be easy win your god away from his thunderbolts before he begins havoc with them from his miniature olympus if he wants the moon and possibly he doesn't he won't say no to a star it's the next best thing seriously now and gwent threw away the end of his cigar and laid a hand gently on her arm be a good girl and think over what i've said to you marry him if you can it will be the making of him manella gazed about her in the darkness bewildered a glittering little mob of fireflies danced above her head like a net of jewels oh you talk so strangely she said you forget i am a poor girl i have no money neither is he and gwent gave a short laugh but he could make a million dollars to-morrow if he chose having only himself to consider he doesn't choose if he had you he'd change his opinion seaton's not the man to have a wife without keeping her in comfort i tell you again you can be the making of him you can save his life she clasped her hands nervously a little gasping sigh came from her lips oh santa madonna to save his life ah just that said gwent impressively think of it i'm not speaking lies that's not my way the man is making for himself what we in the european war called a danger zone where everybody not in the know was warned off hidden mines hidden mines he's got them that's so you can take my word it's no good looking for them no one will ever find them but himself and he thinks of nothing else but if he fell in love with you she gave a hopeless gesture he will not he thinks nothing of me nothing no though he says i am beautiful oh he says that does he and gwent smiled well he'd be a fool if he didn't ah but he does not care for beauty manella went on he sees it and he smiles at it but it does not move him gwent looked at her in perplexity not knowing quite how to deal with the subject he himself had started truth to tell his nerves had been put distinctly on edge by seaton's cool calculating and seemingly callous assertion as to the powers he possessed to destroy if he chose a nation and all sorts of uncomfortable scraps of scientific information gleaned from books and treatises suggested themselves vividly to his mind at this particular moment when he would rather have forgotten them as for example a pound weight of radioactive energy if it could be extracted in a short a time as we pleased instead of in so many million years could do the work of a hundred and fifty tons of dynamite this agreeable fact stuck in his brain as a bone may stick in a throat causing a sense of congestion then the words of one of the pulpit thunderers of new york rolled back on his ears this world would be destroyed not by the hand of god but by the willful and devilish malingering of man another pleasant thought and he felt himself to be a poor weak fool to even try to put up a girl's beauty a girl's love as a barrier to the output of a destroying force engineered by a terrific human intention it was like the old story of the scottish heroine who thrust a slender arm through the great staple of a door to hold back the would-be murderers of a king beauty does not move him she said she was right nothing was likely to move roger seaton from any purpose he had once resolved upon what to him was beauty merely a fortuitous concourse of atoms moving for a time in one personality what was a girl just the young female of the species no more and love 
sexual attraction of which there was enough and too much in seaton's opinion and the puzzled went wondered whether after all he would not have acted more wisely or diplomatically in accepting seaton's proposal to part with his secret to the united states government even with a proviso and state pledge that it was to be used should occasion arise rather than leave him to his own devices to do as he pleased with the apparently terrific potentiality of which he alone had the knowledge and the mastery and while his thoughts thus buzzed in his head like swarming bees manella stood regarding him in a kind of pitiful questioning like a child with a broken toy who cannot understand why it is broken as he did not speak at once she took up the thread of conversation you see how it is no use she said no use to think of his ever loving me but love for him ah that i have and that i will ever keep in my heart and to save his life i would myself gladly die went uttered a sound between a grunt and a sigh there it is you women always run to extremes gladly die indeed poor girl why should you die for him or for any man that's sheer sentimental nonsense there's not a man that ever lived or that ever will live that's worth the death of a woman that's so men think too much of themselves they've been killing women ever since they were born it's time they stopped a bit manella's beautiful eyes expressed bewilderment killing women is that what they do yes my good girl that is what they do the silly trusting creatures go to them like lambs and get their throats cut in marriage or out of it the throat cutting goes on for men are made of destructive stuff and love the sport of killing they are never satisfied unless they can kill something a bird a fox or a woman i'm a man myself and i know you would kill a woman manella's voice was a horrified whisper gwent laughed no not i my child i'm too old i've done with love-making and sport of all kinds i don't even drive a golf ball in make-believe that it's a woman i'm hitting as fast and far as i can oh yes you stare you are wondering why if i have such ideas i should suggest love-making and marriage to you well i don't actually recommend it but i am rather thinking more of your god than of you you might possibly help him a bit ah i'm not clever sighed manella no you're not clever thank god for it but you're devoted and devotion is sometimes more than cleverness he paused reflectively well i have to go away to-morrow it wouldn't be any use my staying on here in fact i'd rather be out of the way but i've a notion i may be able to do something for seaton in washington when i get back in the meantime i'll leave a letter for you to give him you will not write of me in that letter interrupted the girl hastily no you must not you could not gwent raised a deprecating hand don't be afraid my girl i'm not a cad i wouldn't give you away for the world i have no right to say a word about you and i shall not my letter will be a merely business one you shall read it if you like oh no she said at once with proud frankness i would not doubt your word gwent gave her a comprehensively admiring glance even in the dusk of evening her beauty shone with the brilliance of a white flower among the dark foliage what a sensation she would make in new york he thought with those glorious eyes and that hair and a vague regret for his lost youth moved him he was a very wealthy man and had he been in his prime he would have tried a matrimonial chance with this unspoiled beautiful creature it would have pleased him to robe her in queenly garments and to set the finest diamonds in her dark dresses so that she should be the wonder and envy of all beholders he answered her last remark with a kindly little nod and smile good you needn't doubt it ever he said if at any time you want a friend you can bet on sam gwent i'm a member of congress and you can always find me easily but remember my advice don't make a god of any man he can't live up to it as he spoke a sudden jagged flash of lightning tore the sky followed almost instantaneously by a long low snarl of thunder rolling through the valley great drops of rain began to fall come along let us get in and gwent caught manila's hand run and like children they ran together through the garden into the plaza lounge reaching it just before a second lightning flash and peal of thunder renewed double emphasis storm observed a long-faced invalid man in a rocking chair looking at them as they hurried in yes storm it is responded gwent releasing the hand of his companion good night miss soriso she inclined her head graceful smiling good night senor end of chapter thirteen
Chapter 14 of The Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trish E. Matson. What's the word now? Blogspot.com. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 14. Convention is still occasionally studied even in these unconventional days, and Morgana Royal, independent and wealthy young woman as she was, had subscribed to its rule and ordinance by engaging a chaperone, a dear old English lady of title, as she had described her, to the Marchese Rivardi. Lady Kingswood merited the description thus given of her, for she was distinctly a dear old English lady, and her title was the least thing about her, especially in her own opinion. There was no taint of snobbery in her simple, kindly disposition, and when her late husband, a distinguished military officer, had been knighted for special and splendid service in the war, she had only deplored that the ruin of his health and disablement by wounds prevented him from taking any personal pleasure in the honor. His death followed soon after the king's recognition of his merit, and she was left with his pension to live upon, and a daughter, who having married in haste, repented at leisure, being deserted by a drunken husband, and left with two small children to nourish and educate. Naturally, Lady Kingswood took much of their care upon herself, but the pension of a war widow will not stretch further than a given point, and she found it both necessary and urgent to think of some means by which she could augment her slender income. She was not a clever woman. She had no special talents. Her eyes would not stand her in good stead for plain sewing, and she could not even manage a typing machine. But she had exquisitely gentle manners. She was well-bred and tactful, and, rightly judging that good breeding and tact are valuable assets in some quarters of the new society, she sought, through various private channels, for a post as companion, or chaperone, to one lady. Just when she was rather losing hope as to the success of her effort, the one lady came along in the elfin personality of Morgana Royal, who, after a brief interview in London, selected her with a decision as rapid as it was inexplicable, offering her a salary of five hundred a year which to Lady Kingswood was a small fortune. "'You will have nothing to do but just be pleasant,' Morgana had told her, smilingly, "'and enjoy yourself as you like. Of course, I do not expect to be controlled or questioned. I am an independent woman and go my own way, but I'm not at all modern. I don't drink or smoke or dope or crave for male society. I think you'll find yourself all right.' and Lady Kingswood had indeed found herself all right. Her own daughter had never been so thoughtful for her comfort as Morgana was, and she became day by day more interested and fascinated by the original turn of mind and the bewitching personality of the strange little creature for whom the ordinary amusements of society seemed to have no attraction. And now, installed in her sumptuously fitted rooms in the Palazzo d'Oro, Morgana's Sicilian paradise, she almost forgot there was such a thing as poverty, or the sordid business of making both ends meet. Walking up and down the rose marble loggia, and looking out to the exquisite blue of the sea, she inwardly thanked God for all his mercies, and wondered at the exceptional good luck that had brought her so much peace, combined with comfort and luxury, in the evening of her days. She was a handsome old lady. Her refined features, soft blue eyes, and white hair were a composition for an eighteenth-century French miniature, and her dress combined quiet elegance with careful taste. She was inflexibly loyal to her stated position. She neither questioned nor controlled Morgana, or attempted to intrude an opinion as to her actions or movements. And if, as was only natural, she felt a certain curiosity 
concerning the aims and doings of so brilliant and witch-like a personality, she showed no sign of it. She was interested in the Marchese Rivardi, but still more in the priest, Don Aloysius, to whom she felt singularly attracted, partly by his own dignified appearance and manner, and partly by the leaning she herself had toward the Catholic faith, where woman is made sacred in the person of the Holy Virgin, and deemed worthy of making intercession with the divine. She knew, as we all in our innermost souls know, that it is a symbol of the greatest truth that can ever be taught to humanity. The special morning on which she walked, leaning slightly on a silver knob stick up and down the loggia, and looked at the sea, was one of rare beauty even in Sicily, the sky being of that pure ethereal blue for which one can hardly find a comparison in color, and the ocean below it reflecting it, tone for tone, as in a mirror. In the terraced garden, half lost among the intertwining blossoms, Morgana moved to and fro, gathering roses, her little figure like a white rose itself set in among the green leaves. Lady Kingswood watched her with kindly, half-compassionate eyes. It must be a terrible responsibility for her to have so much money, she thought. She can hardly know what to do with it, and somehow I do not think she will marry. At that moment, Morgana came slowly up the steps cut in the grass bordered on either side by flowers, and approached her. Here are some roses for you, dear Duchess, she said, Duchess being the familiar or pet name she elected to call her by. Specially selected, I assure you. Are you tired, or may I have a talk? Lady Kingswood took the roses with a smile, touching Morgana's cheek playfully with one of the paler pink buds. A talk by all means, she replied. How can I be tired, dear child? I'm a lazy old woman, doing nothing all day but enjoy myself. Morgana nodded her golden head approvingly. That's right, I'm glad, she said. It's what I want you to do. It's a pretty place, this Palazzo d'Oro, don't you think? More than pretty, it's a perfect paradise, declared Lady Kingswood emphatically. Well, I'm glad you like it, went on Morgana, because then you won't mind staying here and looking after it when I'm away. I'll have to go away quite soon. Lady Kingswood controlled her first instinctive movement of surprise. Really? she said. That seems a pity, as you only arrived so recently. Morgana gave a wistful glance around her at the beautiful gardens and blue sea beyond. Yes, perhaps it is a pity, she said with a light shrug of her shoulders. But I have a great deal to do, and ever so much to learn. I told you, didn't I? that I have had an airship built for me quite on my own lines, an airship that moves like a bird and is quite different from any other airship ever made or known. Yes, you told me something about it, answered Lady Kingswood. But you know, my dear, I am very stupid about all these wonderful new inventions. Progress of science, they call it. Well, I'm rather afraid of the progress of science. I'm an old-fashioned woman, and I cannot bear to hear of aeroplanes and airships and poor wretched people falling from the sky and being dashed to pieces. The solid earth is quite enough for my old feet, as long as they will support me. Morgana laughed. You, dear Duchess, she said affectionately. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to travel in my airship. I wouldn't so try your nerves for the world, though it is an absolutely safe ship. Nothing, and she emphasized the word, nothing can upset it or drive it out of its course unless natural law itself is upset. Now let us sit here, and she drew two wicker chairs into the cool shadow of the loggia and set them facing the sea, and have our talk. I've begun it. I'll go on. Tell me, and she nestled down among the cushions, watching Lady Kingswood seat herself in slower less supple fashion. Tell me, what does it feel like to be married? Lady Kingswood opened her eyes, surprised and amused. 
"'What does it feel like, my dear?' "'Oh, surely you know what I mean,' pursued Morgana. "'You have been married. "'Well, when you were first married, were you very, very happy? "'Did your husband love you entirely, without a thought for anybody or anything else? "'And were you all in all to each other?' Lady Kingswood was quite taken aback by the personal directness of these questions, but, deciding within herself that Morgana must be contemplating marriage on her own behalf, answered simply and truthfully, My husband and I were very fond of each other. We were the best of friends and good companions. Of course he had his military duties to attend to, and was often absent. And you stayed at home and kept house, interpolated Morgana musingly. I see. That is what all wives have to do. But I suppose he just adored you? Lady Kingswood smiled. Adore is a very strong word to use, my dear, she said. I doubt if any married people adore each other. If they can be good friends and rub along pleasantly through all the sorrows and joys of life together, they should be satisfied. And you call that love, said Morgana, with a passionate thrill in her voice. Love! Love that is blood within the veins of time, just rubbing along pleasantly together. Dear Duchess, that wouldn't suit me. Lady Kingswood looked at her with interested, kind eyes. But then, what would suit you? she queried. You know you mustn't expect the impossible. What the world calls the impossible is always the possible, said Morgana, and only the impossible appeals to me. This was going beyond the boundary line of Lady Kingswood's brain capacity, so she merely remained agreeably quiescent. And when your child was born, pursued Morgana, did you feel a wonderful ecstasy, a beautiful peace and joy? A love so great that it was as if God had given you something of his own to hold and keep? Lady Kingswood laughed outright. My dear, you are too idealistic. Having a baby is not at all a romantic business, quite the reverse. And babies are not interesting till they begin to take notice, as the nurses say. Then, when they get older and have to go to school, you soon find out that you have loved them far more than they have loved or ever will love you. As she said this, her voice trembled a little, and she sighed. I see. I think I quite understand, said Morgana. And it is just what I have always imagined. There is no great happiness in marriage. If it is only a matter of rubbing along pleasantly together, Two friends can always do that without any sex attraction, or tying themselves up together for life. And it's not much joy to bring children into the world and waste treasures of love on them, if after you have done all you can, they leave you without a regret, like the birds that fly from a nest when once they know how to use their wings. Lady Kingswood's eyes were sorrowful. My daughter was a very pretty girl, she said. Her father and I were proud of her looks and charm of manner. We spared every shilling we could to give her the best and most careful education, and we surrounded her with as much pleasure and comfort at home as possible. But at the first experience of society and the flattery of strangers, she left us. Her choice of a husband was most unfortunate, but she would not listen to our advice, though we had loved her so much. She thought he loved her more. Morgana lifted her eyes. The fay light was glittering in them. Yes, she thought he loved her. That's what many a woman thinks, that he, the particular he, loves her. But how seldom he does! How much more often he loves himself! You must not be cynical, my dear, said Lady Kingswood, gently. Life is certainly full of disappointments, especially in love and marriage. But we must endure our sorrows patiently, and believe that God does everything for the best. This was the usual panacea which the excellent lady offered for all troubles, and Morgana smiled. Yes, 
"'It must be hard work for God,' she said. "'Cruel work, to do everything for the best, and to find it being turned into the worst, by the very creatures one seeks to benefit, must be positive torture.' "'Well, dear Duchess, I ask you all these questions about love and marriage, just to know if you could say anything that might alter my views. But you have confirmed them. I feel that there is no such thing in the world as the love I want, and marriage without it would be worse than any imagined hell. So I shall not marry." Lady Kingswood face expressed a mild tolerance. You say that just now, she said, but I think you will alter your mind some day. You would not like to be quite alone always, not even in the Palazzo d'Oro. You are quite alone? Ah, but I am an old woman, my dear. I have lived my day. That's not true, said Morgana decisively. You have not lived your day, since you are living now. And if you are old, that is just a reason why you should not be alone. But you are. Your husband is dead, and your daughter has other ties. So even marriage left you high and dry on the rocks, as it were, till my little boat came along and took you off them." "'A very welcome little boat,' said Lady Kingswood, with feeling. "'A rescue in the nick of time.' "'Never mind that,' and Morgana waved her pretty hand expressively. My point is that marriage, just marriage, has not done much for you. It is what women clamor for and scheme for, and nine out of ten regret the whole business when they have had their way. There are so many more things in life worth winning." Lady Kingswood looked at her interestedly. She made a pretty picture just then in her white morning gown, seated in a low basket chair with pale blue silk cushions behind her on which her golden head rested with the brightness of a daffodil. So many more things, she repeated. My airship, for instance. It's worth all the men and the marriages I've ever heard of. My beloved white eagle, my own creation, my baby. Such a baby, she laughed. But I must learn to fly with it alone. I hope you will do nothing rash, said Lady Kingswood mildly. She was very ignorant of modern discovery and invention, and all attempt to explain anything of the kind to her would have been a hopeless business. I understand that it is always necessary to take a pilot and an observer in these terrible sky machines. She was interrupted by a gay little peal of laughter from Morgana. Terrible! Oh, dear Duchess, you are too funny! There's nothing terrible about my sky machine. Do you ever read poetry? No? Well, then, you don't know that lovely and prophetic line of Keats. Beautiful things made new for the surprise of the sky children. Poets are always prophetic, that is, real poets, not modern verse mongers. And I fancy Keats must have imagined something in the far distant future, like my white eagle. For it really is a beautiful thing made new a beautiful natural force put to new uses, and who knows, I may yet surprise those sky children." Lady Kingswood mind floundered helplessly in this flood of what, to her, was incomprehensibility. Morgana went on in the sweet, fluting voice which was one of her special charms. "'If you haven't read Keats, you must have read at some time or other The Arabian Nights and the story of Sindbad the Sailor? Yes. You think you have? Well, you know how poor Sintbad got into the Valley of Diamonds and waited for an eagle to fly down and carry him off. That's just like me. I've been dropped into a Valley of Diamonds and often wondered how I should escape. But the eagle has arrived. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you, said Lady Kingswood. I'm rather dense, you know. Surely your Valley of Diamonds, if you mean wealth, has made your eagle possible? Morgana nodded. Exactly. If there had been no Valley of Diamonds, there would have been no eagle. But, all the same, this little female Sindbad is glad to get out of the valley." Lady Kingswood laughed. My dear child, if you are making a sort of allegory on your wealth, you are not out of the valley, nor are you likely to be. Morgana sighed. 
"'My vulgar wealth,' she murmured. "'What? Vulgar?' "'Yes, a man told me it was.' "'A vulgar man himself, I should imagine,' said Lady Kingswood, warmly. Morgana shrugged her shoulders carelessly. "'Oh, no, he isn't. He's eccentric, but not vulgar. He's aristocratic to the tips of his toes, and English. That accounts for his rudeness. Sometimes, you know, only sometimes, Englishmen can be very rude. But I'd rather have them so. It's a sort of well-bred clumsiness, like the manners of a Newfoundland dog. It's not the make-a-dollar air of American men. You are quite English yourself, aren't you? queried her companion. No, not English in any sense. I'm pure Celtic of Celt, from the farthest highlands of Scotland. But I hate to say I'm Scotch, as slangy people use that word for whiskey. I'm just highland-born. My father and mother were the same, and I came to life a wild moor among mists and mountains and stormy seas. I'm always glad of that. I'm glad my eyes did not look there first on a city. There's a tradition in the part of Scotland where I was born which tells of a history far, far back in time when sailors of Phoenicia came to our shores. Men greatly civilized when we were all but savages, and they made love to the highland women and had children by them. Then, when they went away back to Egypt, they left many traces of Eastern customs and habits which remain to this day. My father used always to say that he could count his ancestry back to Egypt. It pleased him to think so, and it did nobody any harm. Have you ever been to the East? asked Lady Kingswood. No, but I'm going. My white eagle will take me there in a very short time. But as I've already told you, I must learn to fly alone. What does the Marchese Rivarde say to that? I don't ask him, replied Morgana indifferently. What I may decide to do is not his business. She broke off abruptly, then continued. He is coming to luncheon, and afterwards you shall see my airship. I won't persuade you to go up in it. I couldn't, said Lady Kingswood emphatically. I've no nerve for such an adventure. Morgana rose from her chair, smiling kindly. "'Dear Duchess, be quite easy in your mind,' she said. "'I want you very much on land, but I shall not want you in the air. "'You will be quite safe and happy here in the Palazzo d'Oro.' She turned as she saw the shadow of a man's tall figure fall on the smooth marble pavement of the loggia. "'Ah, here is the Marchese. We were just speaking of you.' "'Trop honore he murmured, as he kissed the little hand she held out to him, in the Sicilian fashion of gallantry. I fear I am perhaps too early. Oh, no, we were about to go in to luncheon. I know the hour by the bell of the monastery down there. You hear it? A soft ting-ting-tong rang from the olive and ilex woods below the palazzo, and Morgana, listening, smiled. Poor Don Aloysius, she said. He will go now to his soup meg, and we to our poulet, sauce bechamel, and he will be quite as contented as we are. More so, probably, said Rivardi, as he courteously assisted Lady Kingswood, who was slightly lame, to rise from her chair. He is one of the few men in life who have found peace. Morgana gave him a keen glance. You think he has really found it? I think so. Yes, he has faith in God a great support that has given way for most of the peoples of this world. Lady Kingswood looked pained. I am sorry to hear you say that. I am sorry myself to say it, my lady, but I fear it is true, he rejoined. It is one sign of a general break-up. Oh, you are right, you are very right, exclaimed Morgana suddenly and with emphasis. We know that when even one human being is unable to recognize his best friend, we say, poor man, his brain is gone. It's the same thing with a nation, or a world, when it is so ailing that it cannot recognize the friend who brought it into being, who feeds it, keeps it, and gives it all it has. We must say the same thing. Its brain is gone. Rivardi was surprised at the passionate energy she threw into these words. You feel that deeply, he said, and yet, pardon me, you do not assume to be religious? 
Marchese, I assume nothing, she answered. I cannot pretend. To assume or to pretend would hardly serve the creator adequately. Creative or natural force is so far away from sham that one must do more than assume. One must be! Her voice thrilled on the air, and Lady Kingswood, who was crossing the loggia, leaning on her stick, paused to look at the eloquent speaker. She was worth looking at just then, for she seemed inspired. Her eyes were extraordinarily brilliant, and her whole personality expressed a singular vitality coupled with an ethereal grace that suggested something almost superhuman. Yes, one must be, she repeated. I have not been a student of science so long without learning that there is no assuming anything in the universe. One must see straight, and think straight, too. I could not assume religion, because I feel it, in the very depths of my soul. As Don Aloysius said the other day, it is marvelous how close we are to the source of all life, and yet we imagine we are far away. If we could only realize the truth of the divine nearness and work with it and in it, we should make discoveries worth knowing. We work too much with ourselves and of ourselves. She paused, then added slowly and seriously, I have never done any work that way. I have always considered myself nothing. The force I have obeyed was and is everything. And so, being nothing, you still made your airship possible, said Rivardi, smiling indulgently at her fantastic speech. She answered him with unmoved and patient gravity. It is, as you say, being nothing myself, and owning myself to be nothing, the force that is everything made my airship possible. End of chapter 14 15 of The Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 15. Two or three hours later, the White Eagle was high in air above the Palazzo d'Oro. Down below, Lady Kingswood stood on the seashore by the aerodrome, watching the wonderful ship of the sky with dazzled, scared eyes. Amazed at the lightning speed of its ascent and the steadiness of its level flight, she had seen it spread its great wings as by self-volition and soar out of the aerodrome, with Morgana seated inside like an elfin queen in a fairy car. She had seen the Marchese Giulio Rivardi take the helm with the assistant Gaspard, now no longer a prey to fear, beside him. Up, up and away they had flown, waving to her till she could see their forms no longer, till the white eagle itself looked no bigger than a dove soaring in the blue. And while she waited, even this faint dove image vanished. She looked in every direction, but the skies were empty. To her there was something very terrifying in this complete disappearance of human beings in the vast stretches of the air. They had gone so silently, too, for the white eagle's flight made no sound, and though the afternoon was warm and balmy, she felt chilled with the cold of nervous apprehension. Yet they had all assured her there was no cause for alarm. They were only going on a short trial trip and would be back to dinner. Nothing more than a run in a motor car, Morgana said, gaily. Nothing more, but to Lady Kingswood it seemed much more. She belonged to simple Victorian days, days of quiet home life and home affections, now voted deadly dull, and all the rushing to and fro and gadding about of modern men and women worried and distressed her, for she had the plain common sense to perceive that it did no good either to health or morals, and led nowhere. She looked wistfully out to sea, the blue Sicilian sea, so exquisite in tone and play of pure reflections, and thought how happy a life lived after the old sweet ways might be, 
for a brilliant little creature like Morgana, if she could win a good man's love, as Shakespeare puts it. And yet, was this not rather harking back to mere sentiment, often proved delusive? Her own good man's love had been very precious to her, but it had not fulfilled all her heart's longing, though she considered herself an entirely commonplace woman. And what sort of man would it be that could hold Morgana? As well try to control a sunbeam or a lightning flash as the restless vital and intellectual spirit that had, for the time being, entered into feminine form, showing itself nevertheless as something utterly different and superior to women as they are generally known. Some thoughts such as these, though vague and disconnected, passed through Lady Kingswood's mind as she turned away from the seashore to reascend the flower-bordered terraces of the Palazzo d'Oro, and it was with real pleasure that she perceived on the summit of the last flight of grassy steps the figure of Don Aloysius. He was awaiting her approach and came down a little way to meet her. I saw the airship flying over the monastery, he explained, greeting her, and I was anxious to know whether La Signora had gone away into the skies or was still on earth. She has gone, I suppose? Yes, she has gone, sighed Lady Kingswood, and the Marchese with her, and one assistant. Her nerve is simply astonishing. You did not think of venturing on a trip with her yourself? And the priest smiled kindly as he assisted her to ascend the last flight of steps to the loggia. No, indeed, I really could not. I feel I ought to be braver, but I cannot summon up sufficient courage to leave terra firma. It seems altogether unnatural. Then what will you do when you are an angel, dear lady? queried Aloysius playfully. You will have to leave terra firma then. Have you ever thought of that? She smiled. I am afraid I don't think, she said. I take my life on trust. I always believe that God who brought me here will take care of me there, wherever there is. You understand me, don't you? You speak English so well that I'm sure you do. Yes, I understand you perfectly, he replied. That I speak English is quite natural, for I was educated at Stonyhurst in England. I was then for a time at Fort Augustus in Scotland and studied a great many of the strange traditions of the Highland Celts, to which mystic people Miss Royal by birth belongs. Her ancestry has a good deal to do with her courage and character. While he spoke, Lady Kingswood gazed anxiously into the sky, searching it north, south, east, west, for the first glimpse of the returning white eagle, but there was no sign of it. You must not worry yourself went on the priest, putting a chair for her in the loggia and taking one himself. If we sit here we shall see the airship returning, I fancy, by the western line, certainly near the sunset. In any case, let me assure you, there is no danger. No danger? Absolutely none. Lady Kingswood looked at him in bewildered amazement. Surely there must be danger, she said. The terrible accidents that happen every day to these flying machines. Yes, but you speak of ordinary flying machines, said Aloysius. This white eagle is not an ordinary thing. It is the only one of its kind in the world, the only one scientifically devised to work with the laws of nature. You saw it ascend? I did. It made no sound? None. Then how did its engines move, if it had engines, pursued Aloysius? Had you no curiosity about it? I'm afraid I hadn't. I was really too nervous. Morgana begged me to go inside, but I could not. Don Aloysius was silent for a minute or two, out of gentle tolerance. He recognized that Lady Kingswood belonged to the ordinary class of good, kindly women not overburdened with brains, to whom thought, particularly of a scientific or reflective nature, would be a kind of physical suffering. And how fortunate it is that there are, and always will be, such women. Many of them are gifted with the supreme talent of making happiness around themselves. 
and in this way they benefit humanity more than the often too self-absorbed student of things which are frequently past finding out. I understand your feeling, he said at last, and I hardly wonder at your very natural fears. I must admit that I think human daring is going too fast and too far. The science of today is not tending to make men and women happier, and after all, happiness is the great goal. A slight sigh escaped him, and Lady Kingswood looked at his fine, composed features with deep interest. Do you think God meant us to be happy? she asked gently. It is a dubious question, he answered. When we view the majesty and loveliness of nature, we cannot but believe we were intended to enjoy the splendid treasures of beauty freely spread out before us. Then again, if we look back thousands of years and consider the great civilizations of the past that have withered into dust and are now forgotten, we cannot help wondering why there should be such a waste of life for apparently no purpose. I speak in a secular sense. Of course, my church has but one reply to doubt, or what we call despair of God's mercy, that it is sin. We are not permitted to criticize or question the divine. And surely that is best, said Lady Kingswood, and surely you have found happiness, or what is nearest to happiness, in your beautiful faith. His eyes were shadowed by deep gravity. Milady, I have never sought happiness, he replied. From my earliest boyhood I felt it was not for me. Among the comrades of my youth, many started the race of life with me. Happiness was the winning post they had in view, and they tried many ways to reach it, some through ambition, some through wealth, some through love but I have never chanced to meet one of them who was either happy or satisfied. My mind was set on nothing for myself except this, to grope through the darkness for the great mind behind the universe, to drop my own ego into it as a drop of rain into the sea, and so to be content. And in this way I have learned much, more than I consider myself worthy to know. Modern science of the surface kind not the true deep discoveries, has done its best to detach the raindrop from the sea. But it has failed. I stay where I have plunged my soul. He spoke, as it were, to himself, with the air of one inspired. He had almost forgotten the presence of Lady Kingswood, who was gazing at him in a rapture of attention. Oh, if only I could think as you do, she said in a low tone. Is it truly the Catholic Church that teaches these things? The Catholic Church is the sign and watchword of all these things, he answered. Not only that, but its sacred symbols, though ancient enough to have been adopted from Babylonia and Chaldea, are actually the symbols of our most modern science. Catholicism itself does not as yet recognize this. Like a blind child stumbling towards the light, it has felt the discoveries of science long before discovery. In our sacraments there are the hints of the transmutation of elements. The Sanctus Bill suggests wireless telegraphy or telepathy, that is to say, communication between ourselves and the divine unseen, and if we are permitted to go deeper, we shall unravel the mystery of that rising from the dead, which means renewed life. I am a prejudiced priest, of course, and he smiled gravely. But with all its mistakes, errors, crimes, if you will, that it is answerable for since its institution, through the sins of unworthy servants, Catholicism is the only creed with the true seed of spiritual life within it. The only creed left standing on a firm foundation in this shaking world. He uttered these words with passionate eloquence and added, There are only three things that can make a nation great. The love of God, the truth of man, the purity of woman. Without these three, the greatest civilization existing must perish, no matter how wide its power or how vast its wealth. 
ignorant or vulgar persons may sneer at this as the obvious, but it is the obvious sun alone that rules the day. Lady Kingswood's lips trembled. There were tears in her eyes. How truly you speak, she murmured. And yet we live in a time when such truths appear to have no influence with people at all. Every one is bent on pleasure, on self. As every one was in the cities of the plain, he said, and we may well expect another rain of fire. Here, lifting his eyes, he saw in the soft blush rose of the approaching sunset a small object like a white bird flying homeward across the sea. Here it comes, he exclaimed, not the rain of fire, but something more agreeable. I told you, did I not, milady, that there was no danger? See! Lady Kingswood looked where he pointed. Surely that is not the airship, she said. It is too small. At this distance it is small, answered Aloysius. But wait, watch, and you will soon perceive its great wings. What a marvelous thing it is! Marvelous, and a woman's work! They stood together, gazing into the reddening west, thrilled with expectancy, while with a steady swiftness and accuracy of movement, the bird-like object, which at the first glimpse had seemed so small, gradually loomed larger, with nearer vision its enormous wings spreading wide and beating the air rhythmically, as though the true pulsation of life impelled their action. Neither Lady Kingswood nor Don Aloysius exchanged a word, so absorbed were they in watching the White Eagle arrive, and not till it began to descend towards the shore did they relax their attention and turn to each other with looks of admiration and amazement. How long have they been gone? asked Aloysius then. Lady Kingswood glanced at her watch. Barely two hours. At that moment, the white eagle swooped suddenly over the gardens, noiselessly and with an enormous spread of wing that was like a white cloud in the sky, then gracefully swerved aside towards its shed or aerodrome, folding its huge pinions as of its own will, and sliding into its quarters as easily as a hand may slide into a loose-fitting glove. The two interested watchers of its descent and swift run home had no time to exchange more than a few words of comment before Morgana ran lightly up the terrace, calling to them with all the gaiety of a child returning on a holiday. "'It was glorious!' she exclaimed. "'Just glorious! We've been to Naples. Crowds gathered in the street to stare at us. We were ever so high above them and they couldn't make us out as we moved so silently. Then we hovered for a bit over Capri. The island looked like a lovely jewel shining with sun and sea. And now here we are, home in plenty of time to dress for dinner. You see, dear Duchess, you need not have been nervous. The White Eagle is safer than any railway train, and ever so much pleasanter. Well, I'm glad you've come back all right, said Lady Kingswood. It's a great relief. I certainly was afraid. Oh, you must never be afraid of anything, laughed Morgana. It does no good. We are all too much afraid of everything and everybody, and often when there's nothing to be afraid of. Am I not right, most reverend Father Aloysius? And she turned with a radiant smile to the priest, whose serious dark eyes rested upon her, with an expression of mingled admiration and wonder. I'm so glad to find you here with Lady Kingswood. I'm sure you told her there was no danger for me, didn't you? Yes, I thought so. Now do stay and dine with us, please. I want you to talk to the Marchese Rivarde. He's rather cross. He cannot bear me to have my own way. I suppose all men are like that. They want women to submit, not to command. She laughed again. See, here he comes, with the sulky air of a naughty boy. This, as Rivardi slowly mounted the terrace steps and approached. I'm off to dress for dinner. Come, Duchess, we'll leave the men to themselves. She slipped her arm through Lady Kingswood's and hurried her away. Don Aloysius was puzzled by her words, and, as Rivardi came up to him, raised his eyebrows interrogatively. The Marchese answered the unspoken query by an impatient shrug. Altro, she's impossible, he said irritably. 
wild as the wind, uncontrollable. She will kill herself, but she does not care. What has she done? asked Aloysius, smiling a little. Has she invented something new? A parachute in which to fall gracefully, like a falling star? Nothing of the kind, retorted Rivardi, vexed beyond all reason at the priest's tranquil air of good-humored tolerance. But she insists on steering the airship herself. She took my place today. Well? Well, you think that nothing? I tell you, it is very serious, very foolhardy. She knows nothing of aerial navigation. Was her steering faulty? Rivardi hesitated. No, it was wonderful, he admitted reluctantly, especially for a first attempt. And now she declares she will travel with the White Eagle alone, alone. Think of it. That little creature alone in the air, with a huge airship under her sole control? The very idea is madness. Have patience, Julio, said Don Aloysius gently. I think she cannot mean what she says in this particular instance. She is naturally full of triumph at the success of her invention, an amazing invention, you must own, and her triumph makes her bold. But be quite easy in your mind. She will not travel alone. She will, she will, declared Rivardi passionately. She will do anything she has a mind to do, as well try to stop the wind as stop her. She has some scheme in her brain, so fantastic vision of that brazen city you spoke of the other day. Don Aloysius gave a sudden start. No, not possible, he said. She will not pursue a phantasm, a dream. He spoke nervously, and his face paled. Rivardi looked at him curiously. There is no such place, then? he asked. It is only a legend? Only a legend, replied Aloysius slowly. Some travelers say it is a mirage of the desert. Others tell stories of having heard the bells in the brazen towers ring. But no one, no one, and he repeated the words with emphasis, has ever been able to reach even the traditional environ of the place. Our hostess, and he smiled, is a very wonderful little person, but even she will hardly be able to discover the undiscoverable. Can we say that anything is undiscoverable? suggested Rivardi. Don Aloysius thought a moment before replying. Perhaps not, he said at last. Our life all through is a voyage of discovery wherein we have no certainty of the port of arrival. The puzzling part of it is that we often discover what has been discovered before in ages past, where the discoverers seem to make no use of their discoveries. And so we lose ourselves in wonder, and often in weariness. He sighed, then added, Had we not better go in and prepare to meet our hostess at dinner? And Julio, unbend your brows. You must not get angry with your charming benefactress. If you do not let her have her way, she will never let you have yours. Rivardi gave a resigned gesture. Oh, mine, I must give up all hope. She will never think of me more than as a workman who has carried out her design. There is something very strange about her. She seems at certain moments to withdraw herself from all the interests of mere humanity. Today, for instance, she looked down from the airship on the swarming crowds in the streets of Naples and said, Poor little microbes, how sad it is to see them crawling about and festering down there. What is the use of them? I wish I knew. Then, when I ventured to suggest that possibly they were more than microbes, they were human beings that loved and worked and thought and created, she looked at me with those wonderful eyes of hers and answered, Microbes do the same, only we don't take the trouble to think about them. But if we knew their lives and intentions, I dare say we should find they are quite as clever in their own line as we are in ours. What is one to say to a woman who argues in this way? Don Aloysius laughed gently. But she argues quite correctly after all. My son, you are like the majority of men. They grow impatient with clever women. They prefer stupid ones. In fact, they deliberately choose stupid ones to be the mothers of their children. Hence the ever-increasing multitude of fools. 
he moved towards the open doors of the beautiful lounge hall of the palazzo, Rivardi walking at his side. But you will grant me a measure of wisdom in the advice I gave you the other day. The little millionaires is unlike other women. She is not capable of loving, not in the way loving is understood in this world. Therefore do not seek from her what she cannot give. As for her flying alone, leave that to the fates. I do not think she will attempt it. They entered the palazzo just as a servant was about to announce to them that dinner would be served in a quarter of an hour, and their talk, for the time being, ended. But the thoughts of both men were busy, and unknown to each other, centered round the enigmatical personality of one woman who had become more interesting to them than anything else in the world. So much so, indeed, that each, in his own private mind, wondered what life would be worth without her. End of chapter 15 Recorded by Trish E. Matson. What's the word now? Blogspot.com Dean of the Secret Power this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 16 That evening Morgana was in one of her most bewitching moods. Even the old Highland word fay scarcely described her many brilliant variations from grave to gay, from gay to romantic, and from romantic to a kind of humorous satiric vein which moved her to utter quick little witticisms which might have seemed barbed with too sharp a point were they not so quickly covered with a sweetness of manner which deprived them of all malice she looked her best too she had robed herself in a garment of pale shimmering blue which shone softly like the gleam of moonbeams through crystal her wonderful hair was twisted up in a coronal held in place by a band of diamonds. Tiny diamonds twinkled in her ears, and a star of diamonds glittered on her breast. Her elfin beauty, totally unlike the beauty of accepted standards, exhaled a supple influence as a lily exhales fragrance, and the knowledge she had of her own charm combined with her indifference as to its effect upon others gave her a dangerous attractiveness as she sat at the head of her daintily adorned dinner-table she might have posed for a fairy queen in days when fairies were still believed in and queens were envied and giulio rivardi's thoughts were swept to and fro in his brain by cross-currents of emotion which were not altogether disinterested or virtuous for years his spirit had been fretted and galled by poverty he the descendant of a long line of proud sicilian nobles had been forced to earn a precarious livelihood as an art decorator and adviser to newly rich people who had neither taste nor judgment teaching them how to build restore or furnish their houses according to the pure canons of art in the knowledge of which he excelled and now when chance or providence had thrown morgana in his way morgana with her millions and an enchanting personality he inwardly demanded why should he not win her to have and to hold for his own he was a personable man nobly born finely educated was it possible that he had not sufficient resolution and force of character to take the precious citadel by storm these ideas flitted vaguely across his mind as he watched his fair hostess talking now to don aloysius now to lady kingswood and sometimes flinging him a light word of badinage to rally him on what she chose to call his sulks he can't get over it she declared smiling poor marchese giulio that i should have dared to steer my own airship was too much for him and he can't forgive me i cannot forgive your putting yourself into danger said rivardi you ran a great risk 
you must pardon me if i hold your life too valuable to be lightly lost it is good of you to think it valuable and her wonderful blue eyes were suddenly shadowed with sadness to me it is valueless my dear exclaimed lady kingswood how can you say such a thing only because i feel it replied morgana i dare say my life is not more valueless than other lives they are all without ultimate meaning if i knew quite positively that i was all in all to some one being who would be unhappy without me to whom i could be helper and inspirer i dare say i should value my life more but unfortunately i have seen too much of the modern world to believe in the sincerity of even that one being could i find him or her i am very positively alone in life no woman was ever more alone than i but is not that your own fault suggested don aloysius gently quite she answered smiling i fully admit it i am what they call difficult i know i do not like society or its amusements which to me seem very vulgar and senseless i do not like its conversation which i find excessively banal and often coarse i cannot set my soul on tennis or golf or bridge so i am quite an outsider but i am not sorry i should not care to be inside the human menagerie too much barking biting scratching and general howling among the animals it wouldn't suit me she laughed lightly and continued that's why i say my life is valueless to any one but myself and that's why i'm not afraid to risk it in flying the white eagle alone her hearers were silent indeed there was nothing to be said whatever her will or caprice there was no one with any right to gainsay it rivardi was inwardly seething with suppressed irritation but his handsome face showed no sign of annoyance save in an extreme paler and gravity of expression i think said don aloysius after a pause i think our hostess will do us the grace of believing that whatever she has experienced of the world in general she has certainly won the regard and interest of those whom she honors with her company at the present moment and his voice had a thrill of irresistible kindness and whatever she chooses to do and however she chooses to do it she cannot avoid involving such affection and interest as those friends represent dear father aloysius interrupted morgana quickly and impulsively forgive me i did not think i am sure you and the marchese and lady kingswood have the kindest feeling for me but but and aloysius smiled but it is a little lady that will not be commanded or controlled yes that is so however this may be let us not imagine that in the rush of commerce and the marvels of science the world is left empty of love love is still the strongest force in nature morgana's eyes flashed up then drooped under their white lids fringed with gold you think so she murmured to me love leads nowhere except to heaven said aloysius there followed a silence it was broken by the entrance of a servant announcing that coffee was served in the loggia they left the dinner-table and went out into the wonder of a perfect sicilian moonlight all the gardens were illumined and the sea beyond with wide strands of silver spreading on all sides falling over the marble pavements and steps of the loggia and glistening on certain white flowering shrubs with the smooth sheen of polished pearl the magical loveliness of the scene made lovelier by the intense silence of the hour held them as with a binding spell and morgana standing by one of the slender columns which not only supported the loggia but the whole palazzo di oro as with the petrified stems of trees made a figure completely in harmony with her surroundings could anything be more enchantingly beautiful sighed lady kingswood one ought to thank god for eyes to see it and many people with eyes would not see it at all said don aloysius they would go indoors shut the shutters and play bridge but those who can see it are the happiest and he quoted on such a night as this when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees and they did make no noise on such a night trollius methinks mounted the trojan walls and sighed his soul towards the grecian tents where cressid lay you know your shakespeare said rivardi who would not know him replied aloysius one is not blind to the sun ah poor shakespeare said morgana 
what a lesson he gives us miserable little moderns in the worth of fame so great so unapproachable and yet doubted and slandered and reviled three hundred years after his death by envious detractors who cannot write a line but what does that matter returned aloysius envy and detraction in their blackness only emphasize his brightness just as a star shines more brilliantly in a dark sky one always recognizes a great spirit by the littleness of those who strive to wound it if it were not great it would not be worth wounding shakespeare might have imagined my airship said morgana suddenly he was perhaps dreaming vaguely of something like it when he wrote about a winged messenger of heaven when he bestrides the lazy pacing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air the white eagle sails upon the bosom of the air quite true said the marchese rivardi looking at her as she stood bathed in the moonlight a nymph-like figure of purely feminine charm as unlike the accepted idea of a science scholar as could well be imagined and the manner of its sailing is a mystery which you only can explain surely you will reveal this secret especially when so many rush into the aircraft business without any idea of the scientific laws by which you uphold your great design much has been said and written concerning new schemes for air vessels moved by steam that is so like men interrupted morgana with a laugh they will think of steam power when they are actually in possession of electricity and they will stick to electricity without moving the one step further which would give them the full sense of radioactivity they will bungle to the end and their bungling is always brought about by an ineffable conceit of their own so-called logical conclusions poor dears they get there at last and in the course of centuries find out what they could have discovered in a month if they had opened their minds as well as their eyes well then help them now said rivardi give them the chance to learn your secret morgana moved away from the column where she had leaned and came more fully into the broad moonlight my dear marchese giulio she said indulgently you really are a positive child in your very optimistic lookout on the world of to-day suppose i were to give them the chance as you suggest to learn my secret how do you think i should be received i might go to the great scientific institutions of london and paris and i might ask to be heard i might offer to give a demonstration here she began to laugh oh dear it would never do for a woman to demonstrate and terrify all the male professors would it no well i should probably have to wait months before being heard then i should probably meet with the chill repudiation dealt out to that wonderful hindu scientist jagadis bose by burden sanderson when the brilliant indian savant tried to teach men what they never knew before about the life of plants not only that i should be met with incredulity and ridicule a woman a woman dares to assume knowledge superior to ours and so forth no no let the wise men try their steam airships and spoil the skies by smoke and vapor so that agriculture becomes more and more difficult and sunshine an almost forgotten benediction let them go their own foolish way till they learn wisdom of themselves no one could ever teach them what they refuse to learn till they tumble into a bog or quicksand of dilemma and have to be forcibly dragged out by a woman hinted don aloysius with a smile she shrugged her shoulders carelessly very often marja slodowska curie for example has pulled many scientists out of the mud but they are not grateful enough to acknowledge it one of the greatest women of the age she is allowed to remain in comparative obscurity even anatoly france though he called her a genius had not the generosity or largeness of mind to praise her as she deserves though of course like all really great souls she is indifferent to praise or blame the notice of the decadent press 
noisy and vulgar like the beating of the cheap jack's drum at a country fair has no attraction for her nothing is known of her private life not a photograph of her is obtainable she has the lovely dignity of complete reserve she is one of my heroines in this life she does not offer herself to the cheap journalist like a milliner's mannequin or a film face she will not give herself away neither will i but you might benefit the human race said rivardi would not that thought weigh with you not in the least and she smiled the human race in its present condition is an unweeded garden things rank and gross in nature possess it merely and it wants clearing i have no wish to benefit it it has always murdered its benefactors it deludes itself with the idea that the universe is for it alone it ignores the fact that there are many other sharers in its privileges and surroundings presences and personalities as real as itself i am almost a believer in what the old-time magicians called elementals especially now don aloysius rose from his chair and put aside his emptied coffee cup his tall fine figure silhouetted more densely black by the whiteness of the moon rays had a singularly imposing effect why especially now he asked almost imperatively what has chanced to make you accept the idea an old idea older than the lost continent of atlantis of creatures built up of finer life cells than ours morgana looked at him vaguely surprised by his tone and manner nothing has chanced that causes me any wonder she said or that would make me accept any theory which i could not put to the test for myself but out in new york while i have been away a fellow-student of mine just a boy has found out the means of creating energy from some unknown source that is unknown to the scientists of rule and line they call his electric apparatus an atmospheric generator naturally this implies that the atmosphere has something to generate which has till now remained hidden and undeveloped i knew this long ago had i not known it i could not have thought out the secret of the white eagle she paused to allow the murmured exclamations of her hearers to subside then she went on you can easily understand that if atmosphere generates one form of energy it is capable of many other forms and on these lines there is nothing to be said against the possibility of elementals i feel quite elemental myself in this glorious moonlight just as if i could slip out of my body like a butterfly out of a chrysalis and spread my wings she lifted her fair arms upward with a kind of expansive rapture the moonbeams seemed to filter through the delicate tissue of her garments adding brightness to their folds and sparkling frostily on the diamonds in her hair and even lady kingswood very placid nature was conscious of an unusual thrill half of surprise and half of fear as the quite other world appearance she thus presented you have rather the look of a butterfly she said kindly one of those beautiful tropical things or a fairy only we don't know what fairies are like as we have never seen any morgana laughed and let her arms drop at her sides she felt rather than saw the admiring eyes of the two men upon her and her mood changed yes it is a lovely night for sicily she said but it would be lovelier in california in california echoed rivardi why california why oh i don't know why i often think of california it is so vast sicily is a speck of garden land compared with it and when the moon rises full over the great hills and spreads a wide sheet of silver over the pacific ocean you begin to realize a something beyond ordinary nature it helps you get to the beyond yourself if you have the will to try just then the soft slow tolling of a bell struck through the air and don aloysius prepared to take his leave the beyond calls to me from the monastery he said smiling i have been too long absent will you walk with me giulio willingly and the marchese bowed over lady kingswood's hand as he bade her good-night i will accompany you both to the gate said morgana suddenly and then when you are both gone i shall wander a little by myself in the light of the moon lady kingswood looked dubiously at her but was too tactful to offer any objection such as the danger of catching cold 
which the ordinary duenna would have suggested and which would have seemed absurd in the warmth and softness of such a summer night besides if morgana chose to wander by the light of the moon who could prevent her no one she stepped off the loggia on to the velvety turf below with an aerial grace more characteristic of flying than walking and glided along between the tall figures of the marchese and don aloysius like a dream spirit of the air and lady kingswood watching her as she descended the garden terraces and gradually disappeared among the trees was impressed as she had often been before by a strange sense of the supernatural as if some being wholly unconnected with ordinary mortal happenings were visiting the world by a mere chance she was a little ashamed of this uncanny feeling and after a few minutes hesitation she decided to retire within the house and to her own apartments rightly judging that morgana would be better pleased to find her so gone than waiting for her return like a sentinel on guard she gave a lingering look at the exquisite beauty of the moonlit scene and thought with a sigh what would it be if one were young once more and then she turned slowly pacing across the loggia and entering the palazzo where the gleam of electric lamps within rivalled the moonbeams and drew her out of sight meanwhile morgana between her two escorts stepped lightly along playfully arguing with them both on their silence you are so very serious you good padre aloysius she said and you marchese you who are generally so charming to-night you are a very morose companion you are still in the dumps about my steering the white eagle how cross of you madama i think of your safety he said curtly it is kind of you but if i do not care for my safety i do he said decisively and i also said aloysius earnestly dear lady be advised think no more of flying in the vast spaces of air alone alone with an enormous piece of mechanism which might fail at any moment it cannot fail unless the laws of nature fail said morgana emphatically how strange it is that neither of you seems to realize that the force which moves the white eagle is natural force alone however you are but men here she stopped in her walk and her brilliant eyes flashed from one to the other men with preconceived ideas wedged in obstinacy yes you cannot help yourselves even father aloysius she paused as she met his grave eyes fixed full upon her well he said gently what of father aloysius he is but man as you say a poor priest having nothing in common with your wealth or your self-will my child one whose soul admits no other instruction than that of the great intelligence ruling the universe and from whose ordinance comes forth joy or sorrow wisdom or ignorance we are but dust on the wind before this mighty power even you with all your study and attainment are but a little phantom on the air she smiled as he spoke true she said and you would save this phantom from vanishing into air utterly i would he answered i would fain place you in god's keeping and with a gesture infinitely tender and solemn he made the sign of the cross above her head and a prayer that you may be guided out of the tangled ways of life as lived in these days to the true realization of happiness she caught his hand and impulsively kissed it you are good far too good she said and i am wild and wilful forgive me i will say good night here we are just at the gate good night marchese i promise you shall fly with me to the east i will not go alone there be satisfied and she gave him a bewitching smile then with another markedly gentle good night to aloysius she turned away and left them choosing a path back to the house which was thickly overgrown with trees so that her figure was almost immediately lost to view the two men looked at each other in silence you will not succeed by thwarting her said aloysius warningly rivardi gave an impatient gesture and you i my son i have no aim in view with regard to her i should like to see her happy she has great wealth and great gifts of intellect and ability but these do not make real happiness for a woman and yet i doubt whether she could ever be happy in the ordinary woman's way no 
because she is not an ordinary woman said rivardi quickly more's the pity i think for her and for you added aloysius meaningly rivardi made no answer and they walked on in silence the priest parting with his companion at the gate of the monastery and the marchese going on to his own half-ruined villa lifting its crumbling walls out of wild verdure and suggesting the historic past when a caesar spent festal hours in its great gardens which were now a wilderness meanwhile morgana the subject of their mutual thoughts followed the path she had taken down to the seashore alone there she stood absorbed a fairy-like figure in her shimmering soft robe and the diamonds flashing in her hair now looking at the moonlit water now back to the beautiful outline of the palazzo di oro lifted on its rocky height and surrounded by a paradise of flowers and foliage then to the long white structure of the huge shed where her wonderful airship lay as it were in harbour she stretched out her arms with a fatigued appealing gesture i have all i want she said softly aloud all all that money can buy more than money has ever bought and yet the unknown quantity called happiness is not in the bargain what is it why is it i am like the princess in the arabian nights who was quite satisfied with her beautiful palace till an old woman came along and told her that it wanted a roc's egg to make it perfect and she became at once miserable and discontented because she had not the roc's egg i thought her a fool when i read that story in my childhood but i am as great a fool as she to-day i want that roc's egg she laughed to herself and looked up at the splendid moon round as a golden shield in heaven how the moon shone that night in california she murmured and roger seaton bare man as he is would have given worlds to hold me in his arms and kiss me as he did once when he didn't mean it ah uh, i wonder if he ever will mean it perhaps when it is too late and there swept over her mind the memory of manella her frank abandonment to passions purely primitive and she smiled a cold little weird smile he may marry her she said and yet i think not but if he does marry her he will never love her as he loves me how we play at cross purposes in our lives he is not a marrying man i am not a marrying woman we are both out for conquest on other lines and if either of us wins our way what then shall we be content to live on a triumph of power without love End of chapter 16of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 17 so the man from washington told you to bring this to me roger seaton asked the question of manella twirling in his hand an unopened letter she had just given him she nodded in the affirmative he looked at her critically amused at the evident pains she had taken with her dress and general appearance he twirled the letter again like a toy in his fingers i wonder what it's all about do you know manella shrugged her shoulders with a charming air of indifference i how should i know he is your friend i suppose not a bit of it and roger stretched himself lazily and yawned he is the friend of nobody who is poor but he is the comrade of everybody with plenty of cash he is as hard as a dried old walnut without the shred of a heart you are wrong said manella flushing up suddenly you are wrong and unjust he is an ugly old man but he is very kind seaton threw his head back and laughed heartily with real enjoyment manella oh manella he exclaimed what has he said or done to you to win your good opinion has he made you some pretty compliments and told you that you are beautiful every one can tell you that my dear it does not need mr senator gwent's assurance to emphasize the fact that you find him an ugly old man is natural but that you should also think him very kind does surprise me manella gazed at him seriously her lovely eyes gleaming like jewels under her long black lashes you mock at everything she said it is a pity 
Her tone was faintly reproachful. He smiled. My dear girl, I really cannot regard Mr. Senator Gwent as a figure to be reverenced, he said. He is one of the dustiest, driest old dollar-grabbers in the States. I gave him the chance of a fresh grab, but he was too much afraid to take it. Afraid of what? asked Manella quickly. Of shadows. Shadows of coming events. Yes, they scared him. Now, if you're a good girl and will sit very quiet, you can come into my hut out of this scorching sun and sit down while I read the letter. I may have to write an answer, and if so, you can post it at the plaza. He went before her into the hut, and she followed. He bade her sit down in the chair by the window. She obeyed, and glanced about her shyly, yet curiously. The room was not untidy, as she expected it would be without a woman's hand to set it in order. On the contrary, it was the perfection of neatness and cleanliness. Her gaze was quickly attracted by the bowl of perpetually moving fluid in the centre of the table. "'What is that?' she asked. "'That? Oh, nothing. An invention of mine, just to look pretty and cool in warm weather. It reminds me of women's caprices and fancies, always on the jump. Yes, don't frown, Manella, that is so. Now, let me see what Mr. Sam Gwent has to say that he didn't say before. And seating himself, he opened the letter and began to read. Manella watched him from under the shadow of her long fringed eyelids. Her heart beat quickly and uncomfortably. She was fearful lest Gwent should have broken faith with her after all, and have written of her and her vain passion to the man who already knew of it only too well. She waited patiently for the god of her idolatry to look up. At last he did so, but he seemed to have forgotten her presence. His brows were knitted in a frown, and he spoke aloud as to himself. A syndicate? Old humbug! He knows perfectly well that the thing could not be run by a syndicate. It must be a state's own single possession, a state's special secret. If I were as bent on sheer destructiveness as he imagines me to be, I should waste no more time but offer it to Germany. Germany would take it at once. Germany would require no persuasion to use it. Germany would make me a millionaire twice over for the monopoly of such a force. That is, if I wanted to be a millionaire, which I don't. But Gwen's a fool. I must have scared him out of his wits or he wouldn't write all this stuff about risks to my life advising me to marry quickly and settle down. Good God! I! Marry and settle down! What a tame ending to a life's adventure! Hello! Manella! His eyes lighted upon her as if he'd only just seen her. He rose from his chair and went over to where she sat by the window. Patient girl, he said, patting her dark head with his big sun-browned hand. As good as gold and quieter than a mouse. Well, you may go now. I've read the letter and there's no answer. Nothing for me to write or for you to post. She lifted her brilliant eyes to his. What glorious eyes they were! He would not have been man had he not been conscious of their amorous fire. He patted her head again in a quite paternal way. Nothing for me to write or for you to post, he repeated abstractedly. And how satisfactory that is! Then you are pleased, she said. Pleased? My dear, there is nothing to be pleased or displeased about. The ugly old man whom you found so very kind tells me to take care of myself, which I always do. Also to marry and settle down, which I always don't. She stood upright, turning her head away from the touch of his hand. She had never looked more attractive than at that moment. She wore the white gown in which he had before admired her, and a cluster of roses which were pinned to her bodice gave rich contrast to the soft tone of her smooth, sun-tanned skin, and swayed lightly with the unquiet heaving of the beautiful bosom which might have served a sculptor as a perfect model. A faint, quivering smile was on her lips. "'You always don't? That sounds very droll. You will be unlike every man in the world, then. They all marry. Oh, do they? You know all about it, wise Manella. And he looked at her, smiling. Her passionate eyes, full of glowing ardour, met his. 
a flashing fire seemed to leap from them into his own soul, and for the moment he almost lost his self-possession. Wise Manella, he repeated, his voice shaking a little, while he fought with the insidious temptation which beset him, the temptation to draw her into his arms and take his fill of the love she was so ready to give. They always marry. No, dear, they do not. Many of them avoid marriage. He paused, then continued. And do you know why? She shook her head. Because it is the end of romance. Because it brings down the curtain on a beautiful play. The music ceases, the lights are put out, the audience goes home, and the actors take off their fascinating costumes, wash away their paint and powder, and sit down to supper possibly fried steak and onions and a pot of beer. The fried steak and onions, also the beer, make a very good, ordinary marriage. In this flippant talk he gained the mastery over himself he had feared to lose, and laughed heartily as he saw Manella's expression of utter bewilderment. I do not understand, she said, plaintively. What is steak and onions? How do they make a marriage? You say such strange things. He laughed again, thoroughly amused. Yes, don't I, he rejoined, but not half such strange things as I could say if I were so inclined. I'm a queer fellow. He touched her hair gently, putting back a stray curl that had fallen across her forehead. Now, dear, he continued, it's time you went. You'll be wanted at the plaza, and they mustn't think I'm keeping you up here, making love to you. She tossed her head back, and her eyes flashed almost angrily. There is no danger of that, she said, with a little suppressed tremor in her throat, like the sob of a nightingale at the close of its song. Isn't there? And putting his arm round her, he drew her close to himself and looked full in her eyes. Manella, there was, a moment ago. She remained still and passive in his arms, hardly daring to breathe. So rapt was she in a sudden ecstasy, but he could feel the wild beating of her heart against his own. A moment ago, he repeated in a half whisper, a moment ago I could have made such desperate love to you as would have astonished myself, and you, and I should have regretted it ever afterwards, and so would you. The struggling emotion in her found utterance. No, no, not I, she said, in quick little passionate murmurs. I could not regret it. If you loved me for an hour, it would be the joy of my lifetime. You might leave me, you might forget, but that would not take away my pride and gladness. You might kill me. I would die gladly if it saved your life. Ah, you do not understand love, not the love of Manella and she lifted her face to his, a face so lovely, so young, so warm with her soul's inward rapture, that its glowing beauty might have made a lover of an anchorite. But with Roger Seaton the impulses of passion were brief. The momentary flame had gone out in vapour, and the spirit of the anchorite prevailed. He looked at the dewy red lips, delicately parted like rose petals, but he did not kiss them, and the clasp of his arms round her gradually relaxed. Hush, hush, Manella, he said, with a mild kindness, which in her overwrought state was more distracting than angry words would have been. Hush, you talk foolishness, beautiful foolishness, all women do when they set their fancies on men. It's nature, of course. You think it's love, but my dear girl, there is no such thing as love. There, now you are cross. For she drew herself quickly away from his hold and stood apart, her eyes sparkling, her breast heaving, with the air of a goddess enraged. You are cross because I tell you the truth. It is not the truth, she said, in a low voice quivering with intense feeling. You tell me lies to disguise yourself, but I can see... You yourself love a woman, but you have not my courage. 
you are afraid to own it you would give the world to hold her in your arms as you just now held me but you will not admit it not even to yourself and you pretend to hate where you are mad for love just as you pretend to be ill when you are well you should be ashamed to say there is no such thing as love what mean you then by playing so false with yourself with me and with her she looked lovelier than ever in her anger and he was taken by surprise at the impetuous and instinctive guess she had made at the complexity of his moods which he himself scarcely understood for a moment he stood inert embarrassed by her straight half scornful glance then he regained his usual mental poise and smiled with provoking good humour and tolerance temper manella temper again a pity a pity your spanish blood is too fiery manella it is indeed you have been very rude do you know how rude you've been but there i forgive you you're only a naughty child as for love he paused and going to the door of the hut looked out manella there is a big cloud in the west just over the ocean it is shaped like a great white eagle and its wings are edged with gold it is the beginning of a fine sunset come and look at it and while we watch it floating along i'll talk to you about love she hesitated her whole spirit was up in arms against this man whom she loved and who so she argued with herself had allowed her to love him while having no love for her and yet since gwent had told her that his mysterious occupation might result in disaster and danger to his life her devotion had received a new impetus which was wholly unselfish that of watchful guardianship such as inspires a faithful dog to defend its master and moved by this thought she obeyed his beckoning hand and stood with him on the sward outside the hut looking at the cloud he described it was singularly white new fallen snow could be no whiter and shaped like a huge bird its great wings spread out to north and south were edged with a red gold fire seaton pushed an old tree stump into position and sat down upon it making manella sit beside him now for this talk he said love is the subject love the theme we are taught that we must love god and love our neighbour but we don't because we can't in the case of god we can't love what we don't know and don't see and we cannot love our neighbour because he is often a person whom we do know and can see and who is extremely offensive now let us consider what is love you manella are angry because i say there is no such thing and you accuse me of indulging in love for a woman myself yet i still declare in spite of you there is no such thing as love i ought to be ashamed of myself for saying this so you think but i am not ashamed i know i'm right love is a divine idea never realized it's like a ninth new note in the musical scale not to be attained it is suggested in the highest forms of poetry and art but the suggestion can never be carried out what men and women call love is the ordinary attraction of sex the same attraction that pulls all male and female living things together and makes them mate it is very unromantic and to a man of my mind very useless she looked at him in a kind of sorrowful perplexity you have much talk she said and no doubt you are clever but i think you are all wrong you do wise child now listen to my much talk a little longer have you ever watched silkworms no they are a typical example of humanity a silkworm while it is a worm feeds to repletion you can never get it as many mulberry leaves as it would like to eat then when it is gorged it builds itself a beautiful house of silk which is taken away from it in due course and comes out at the door in wings wings it hardly uses and seems not to understand then if it is a female moth it looks about for love from the male if the male loves it the female produces a considerable number of eggs like pinheads 
and then what then why she promptly dies and there's an end of her her sole aim and the end of being was to produce eggs which in their turn become worms and repeat the same dull routine of business now think me as brutal as you like i say a woman is very like a female silkworm she comes out of her beautiful silken cocoon of maidenhood with wings she doesn't know how to use she merely flutters about waiting to be loved and when this dream she calls love comes to her she doesn't dream any longer she wakes to find her life finished finished manella dry as a gourd with all the juice run out manella rose from her seat beside him the warm light in her eyes had gone her face was pale and as she drew herself up to her stately height she made a picture of noble scorn i am sorry for you she said if you think these things your thoughts are quite dreadful you are a cruel man after all i am sorry i spoke of the beautiful little lady who came here to see you you do not love her you cannot i felt sure you did but i am wrong there is no love in you except for yourself and your own will she spoke breathing quickly and trembling with suppressed emotion he smiled and rising saluted her with a profound bow thank you manella you give me a true character myself and my own will are certainly the chief factors in my life and they may work wonders yet who knows and there is no love in me no not what you call love but as concerns the beautiful little lady you may know this much of me that i want her he threw out his hands with a gesture that was almost tragic and such an expression came into his face of savagery and tenderness commingled that manella retreated from him in vague terror i want her he repeated and why not to love her but to break her wings for she unlike a silkworm moth knows how to use them i want her to make her proud mind bend to my will and way i want her to show her how a man can shall and must be a master of a woman's brain and soul a sudden heat of pent-up feeling broke out in this impulsive rush of words and he checked himself and seeing manella's pale scared face he went up to her and took her hand you see manella he said in quiet tones there is no such thing as love but there is such a thing as wanting and for the most selfish reasons man ever had i want her not you the colour rushed back to her cheeks in a warm glow her great dark eyes were ablaze with indignation she drew her hand quickly from his hold and i hope you will never get her she said passionately i will pray the holy virgin to save her from you you are wicked she is like an angel and you are a devil yes you surely must be or you could not say such horrible things you do not want me you say i know that i am a fool to have shown you my heart you have broken it but you do not care you could have been master of my brain and soul whenever you pleased ah yes dear he interrupted with a smile that would be so easy the touch of satire in these words was lost on her and she took them quite literally and a sudden softness sweetened her anger yes quite easy she said and you would be pleased you would do as you wished with me men like to rule women when it is worth while he thought looking at her with a curious pitifulness as one might look at a struggling animal caught in a net aloud he said yes manella men like to rule women it is their special privilege they have enjoyed it always even in the days when indian braves beat their scores out here in california and killed them outright if they dared to complain of the beating women are busy just now trying to rule men it's an experiment but it won't do men are the masters of life 
they expect to be obeyed by all the rest of creation i expect to be obeyed and so manella when i tell you to go home you must go yes love tempers and all you must go she met his eyes with a resolved look of her own i am going she answered but i shall come again oh yes and yet again and very often i shall come even if it is only to find you dead on this hill killed by your own secret yes i shall come he gave an involuntary movement of surprise and annoyance had mr senator gwent discussed his affairs with this beautiful foolish girl who like some forest animal cared for nothing but the satisfaction of mating where her wishes inclined what do you mean manella he demanded imperatively do you expect to find me dead she nodded vehemently tears were in her eyes and she turned her head away that he might not see them what a cheerful prospect he exclaimed gaily and i'm to be killed by my own secret am i i wonder what it is ah manella manella that stupid old gwent has been at you stuffing your mind with a lot of nonsense don't you believe him i've no secret that will kill me i don't want to be killed no manella though you come again and yet again and ever so often as you say you will not find me dead i am too strong but manella yielding to her inward excitement pointed her hand at him with a warning air of a tragedy queen do not boast she said god is always listening no man is too strong for god i am not clever i have no knowledge of what you do but this i will tell you surely you may have a secret or you may not have it but if you play with the powers of god you will be punished yes of that i am quite certain and this i will also say if you were to pull all the clouds down upon you and the thunders and the lightnings and all the terrible things of destruction in the world i would be there and you would know what love is yes her voice choked and then pealed out like that of a sibylline prophetess if god struck you down to hell i would be there and with a wild sobbing cry she rushed away from him down the hill before he could move or utter a word End of chapter 17secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 18 a red sky burned over egypt red with deep intensity of spreading fire the slow creeping waters of the nile washed patches of dull crimson against the oozy mud banks tipping palms and swaying reeds with colour as though touched with vermilion and here and there long stretches of wet sand gleamed with a tawny gold all cairo was out inhabitants and strangers alike strangers especially conceiving it part of their money's worth never to miss a sunset and beyond cairo where the pyramids lifted their summits aloft stern points of warning or menace from the past to the present and the future a crowd of tourists with their arab guides were assembled staring upward in amazement at a white wonder in the red sky a great airship which unlike other airships was noiseless and that moved vast wings up and down with the steady swift rhythm of a bird's flight as though of its own volition it soared an immense height so that it was quite impossible to see any pilot or passenger it hung over the pyramids almost motionless for three or four minutes as if about to descend and the watching groups below made the usual alarmist prognostications of evil taking care to look about for the safest place of shelter for themselves should the huge piece of mechanism above them suddenly escape control and take a downward dive but apparently nothing was further from the intention of its invisible guides its pause above the pyramids was brief 
and almost before any of the observers had time to realise its departure it had floated away with an easy grace silence and swiftness miraculous to all who saw it vanish into space towards the libyan desert and beyond the pyramids even the sphinx lost interest for the time being every eye being strained to watch the strange aerial visitant till it disappeared then a babble of question and comment began in all languages among the travellers from many lands who though most of them were fairly well accustomed to aeroplanes airships and aerial navigation as having become part of modern civilization found themselves nonplussed by the absolute silence and lightning swiftness of this huge bird-shaped thing that had appeared with extraordinary suddenness in the deep rose glow of the egyptian sunset sky meanwhile the object of their wonder and admiration had sped many miles away and was sailing above a desert which from the height it had attained looked little more than a small stretch of sand such as children play upon by the sea its speed gradually slackened and its occupants morgana and the marchesa rivardi and their expert mechanic gaspar gazed down on the unfolding panorama below them with close and eager interest there was nothing much to see every sign of humanity seemed blotted out the red sky burning on the little stretch of sand was all how small the world looks from the air said morgana it's not worth half the fuss made about it and yet it's such a pretty little god's toy she smiled and in her smiling expressed a lovely sweetness rivardi raised his eyes from the steering gear you are not tired madama he asked tired no indeed how can i be tired with so short a journey yet we have travelled a thousand miles since we left sicily this morning said rivardi we have kept up the pace have we not gaspar or rather the white eagle has proved its speed gaspar looked up from his place at the end of the ship about two hundred and fifty to three hundred miles an hour he said one does not realize it in the movement but you realize that the flight is as safe as it is quick said morgana do you not madama i confess my knowledge is outdistanced by yours replied gaspar i am baffled by your secret but i freely admit its power and success good now let us dine said morgana opening a leather case such as is used for provisions in motoring set plates glasses wine and food on the table a cold collation but we'll have hot coffee to finish we could have dined in cairo but it would have been a bore marquesa will stop here suspended in mid-air and the stars shall be our festal lamps vying with our own and she turned on a switch which illumined the whole interior of the airship with a soft bright radiance whereabouts are we still over the libyan desert rivardi consulted the chart which was spread open in his steering cabin no i think not we have passed beyond it we are over the sahara just now we can take no observations the sunset is dying rapidly and in a few minutes it will be a quite dark as he spoke he brought the ship to a standstill it remained absolutely motionless except for the slight swaying as though touched by wave-like ripples of air morgana went to the window aperture of her silken lined drawing-room and looked out all round the great airship were the illimitable spaces of the sky now of a dense dark violet hue with here and there a streak of dull red remaining of the glow of the vanished sun below there was only blackness for the first time a nervous thrill ran through her frame at the look of this dark chaos and she turned quickly back to the table where rivardi and gaspar awaited her before sitting down to their meal something quite foreign to her courageous spirit chilled her blood but she fought against it and seating herself became the charming hostess to her two companions as they ate and drank though she took scarcely anything herself for most unquestionably there was something uncanny in a meal served under such strange circumstances and so far as the two men were concerned it was only eaten to sustain strength well now have i not been very good she asked suddenly of rivardi 
did i not say you should fly with me to the east and are you not here i have not come alone though that was my wish i have even brought gaspar who had no great taste for the trip gaspar moved uneasily that is true madame he said the art of flying is still in its infancy and though in my profession as an engineer i have studied and worked out many problems i dare not say i have fathomed all the mysteries of the air or the influences of atmosphere i am glad that we have made this voyage safely so far but i shall be still more glad when we return to sicily morgana laughed we can do that to-morrow i dare say she said if there is nothing to see in the whole expanse of the desert but dark emptiness but what do you expect to see madama inquired gaspar with lively curiosity she laughed again as she met rivardi's keen glance why ruins of temples columns colossi a new sphinx all sorts of things she replied but at night of course we can see nothing and we must move onward slowly i cannot rest swaying like this in mid-air she put aside the dinner things and served them with hot coffee from one of the convenient flasks that hold fluids hot or cold for an interminable time and when they had finished this they went back to their separate posts the great ship began to move and she was relieved to feel it sailing steadily though at almost a snail's pace on the bosom of the air the oppressive nervousness which had affected her had not diminished she could not account for it to herself and to rally her forces she went to the window so called of her luxurious cabin this was a wide aperture filled in with a transparent crystal clear material which looked like glass but which was wholly unbreakable and through this she gazed awe smitten at the magnificence of the starry sky the millions upon millions of worlds which keep the mystery of their being veiled from humanity flashed upon her eyes and moved her mind to a profound sadness what is the use of it all she thought if one could only find the purpose of this amazing creation we'll learn a very little only to see how much more there is to know we live our lives all hoping searching praying and never an answer comes for all our prayers from the very beginning not a word from the mysterious poet who has written the poem we are to breed and die and there an end it seems strange and cruel because so purposeless or is it our fault do we fail to discover the things we ought to know so she mused while her white eagle ship sailed serenely on with a leisurely majestic motion through a seeming wilderness of stars courageous as she was with a veritable lion heart beating in her delicate little body and firm as was her resolve to discover what no woman had ever discovered before to-night she was conscious of actual fear something she knew not what crept with a compelling influence through her blood she felt that some mysterious force she had never reckoned with was insidiously surrounding her with an invisible ring she called to rivardi are we not flying too high have you altered the course no madama he replied at once we are on the same level she turned towards him her face was very pale well be careful to my mind we seem to be in a new atmosphere there is a sensation of greater tension in the air or is it my fancy we must not be too adventurous we must avoid the great nebula of orion for example madame you jest we are trillions upon trillions of miles distant from any great constellation do i not know it you are too literal marquesa of course i jest you could not suppose me to be in earnest but i am sure we are passing through the waves of a new ether not altogether suited to the average human being the average human being is not made to inhabit the higher spaces of the upper air hark what was that she held up a warning hand and listened there was a distinct and persistent chiming of bells bells loud and soft 
bells mellow and deep clear and silvery clanging in bass and treble shocks of rising and falling rhythm and tune do you hear rivardi and gaspar simultaneously rose to their feet amazed undoubtedly they heard it was impossible not to hear such a clamour of concordant sound startled beyond all expression morgana sprang to the window of her cabin and looking out uttered a cry of mingled terror and rapture for there below her in the previously inky blackness of the great desert lay a great city stretching out for miles and glittering from end to end with a peculiarly deep golden light which seemed to bathe it in the lustre of a setting sun towers cupolas bridges streets squares parks and gardens could be plainly seen from the airship which had suddenly stopped and now hung immovably in mid-air though for some moments morgana was too excited to notice this again she called to her companions look look she exclaimed we have found it the brazen city but she called in vain turning for response she saw to her amazement and alarm both men stretched on the floor senseless she ran to them and made every effort to rouse them they were breathing evenly and quietly as in profound and comfortable sleep but it was beyond her skill to renew their consciousness then it flashed upon her that the white eagle was no longer moving that it was in fact quite stationary and a quick rush of energy filled her as she realized that now she was as she had wished to be alone with her airship to do with it as she would all fear had left her her nerves were steady and her daring spirit was fired with resolution whatever the mischance which had so swiftly overwhelmed rivardi and gaspar she could not stop now to question or determine it she was satisfied that they were not dead or dying she went to the steering gear to take it in hand but though the mysterious mechanism of the airship was silently and rapidly throbbing the ship did not move she grasped the propeller it resisted her touch with a hard and absolute inflexibility all at once a low deep voice spoke close to her ear do not try to steer you cannot proceed her heart gave one wild bound then almost stood still from sheer terror she felt herself swaying into unconsciousness and made a violent effort to master the physical weakness that threatened her that voice what voice surely one evoked from her own imagination it spoke again this time with an intonation that was exquisitely soothing and tender why are you afraid for you there is nothing to fear she raised her eyes and looked about nervously the soft luminance which lit the white eagle's interior from end to end showed nothing new or alarming her dainty rose-lined cabin held no strange or supernatural visitant all was as usual after a pause she rallied strength enough to question the audible but invisible intruder who is it that speaks to me she asked faintly one from the city below was the instant reply given in full clear accents i am speaking on the sound ray she held her breath in mute wonder listening the voice went on equably you know the use of wireless telephony we have it as you have it only your methods are imperfect we speak on sound rays which are not yet discovered in your country we need neither transmitter nor receiver wherever we send our messages no matter how great the distance they are always heard slowly morgana began to regain courage by degrees she realized that she was attaining the wish of her heart namely to know what no woman had ever known before again she questioned the voice you tell me i cannot proceed she said why because our city is guarded and fortified by the air was the answer we are surrounded by a belt of etheric force through which nothing can pass a million bombs could not break it everything driven against it would be dashed to pieces 
we saw you coming we were surprised for no airship has ever ventured so far we rang the bells of the city to warn you and stopped your flight the warm gentleness of the voice thrilled her with a sudden sympathy that was kind she said and smiled someone smiled in response or she thought so presently she spoke again then you hold me here a prisoner no you can return the way you came quite freely may i not come down and see your city no why because you are not one of us the voice hesitated and because you are not alone morgana glanced at the prostrate and unconscious forms of rivardi and gaspard with a touch of pity my companions are half dead she said but not wholly was the prompt reply is it that force you speak of the force which guards your city that has struck them down she asked yes then why was i not also struck down because you are what you are then after a silence you are morgana at this every nerve in her body started quivering like harp-strings pulled by testing fingers the unseen speaker knew her name and uttered it with a soft delicacy that made it sound more than musical she leaned forward extending a hand as though to touch the invisible how do you know me she asked as we all know you came the answer even as you have known the inside of a sun-ray she listened amazed utterly mystified whoever or whatever it was that spoke knew not only her name but the trend of her earliest studies and theories the inside of a sun-ray this was what she had only the other day explained to father aloysius as being her first experience of real happiness she tried to set her thoughts in order to realize her position here she was a fragile human thing in a flying ship of her own design held fast by atmospheric force above an unknown city situate somewhere in the great desert and someone in that city was conversing with her by a method of wireless as yet undiscovered by admitted science yet communication was perfect and words distinct following up the suggestion presented to her she said you are speaking to me in english are you all english folk in your city a faint quiver as of laughter vibrated through the sound ray no indeed we have no nationality no nationality none we are one people but we speak every language that has ever been spoken in the past or is spoken in the present i speak english to you because it is your manner of talk though not your manner of life how do you know it's not my manner of life because you are not happy in it your manner of life is ours it has nothing to do with nations or peoples you are morgana and you she cried with sudden eagerness oh who are you that speaks to me man woman or angel what are the dwellers of your city if it is in truth a city and not a dream look again and see answered the voice convince yourself do not be deceived you are not dreaming look and make yourself sure impelled to movement she went to the window which she had left to take up the steering gear and from there saw again the wonderful scene spread out below the towers spires cupolas and bridges all lit with that mysterious golden luminance like smouldering sunset fire it is beautiful she said it seems true it seems real it is true it is real the voice replied it has been seen by many travellers but because they can never approach it they call it a desert mirage it is more real and more lasting than any other city in the world can i never enter it she asked appealingly will you never let me in there was a silence which seemed to her very long 
still standing at the window of her cabin she looked down on the shining city a broad stretch of splendid gold luminance under the canopy of the dark sky with its millions of stars then the voice answered her yes if you come alone these words sounded so close to her ear that she felt sure the speaker must be standing beside her i will come she said impulsively somehow some way no matter how difficult or dangerous i will come as she spoke she was conscious of a curious vibration round her as though some other thing than the ceaseless silent throbbing of the airship's mechanism had disturbed the atmosphere wait said the voice you say this without thought you do not realize the meaning of your words for if you come you must stay a thrill ran through her blood i must stay she echoed why because you have learned the life secret answered the voice and as you have learned it so you must live i will tell you more if you care to hear an inrush of energy came to her as she listened she felt that the unseen speaker acknowledged the power which she herself knew she possessed with all my soul i care to hear she said but where do you speak from and who are you that speak i speak from the central watch-tower the voice replied the city is guarded from that point and from there we can send messages all over the world in every known language sometimes they are understood more often they are ignored but we who have lived since before the coming of christ have no concern with such as do not or will not hear our business is to wait and watch while the ages go by wait and watch till we are called forth to the new world sometimes our messages cross the wireless marconi system and some confusion happens but generally the sound ray carries straight to its mark you must well understand all that is implied when you say you will come to us it means that you leave the human race as you have known it and unite yourself with another human race as yet unknown to the world here was an overwhelming mystery but nothing daunted morgana pursued her inquiry you can talk to me on the sound ray she said and i understand its possibility you should equally be able to project your own portrait a true similitude of yourself on a light ray let me see you you are something of a wilful spirit answered the voice but you know many secrets of our science and their results so as you wish it another second and the cabin was filled with a pearly lustre like the vapour which sweeps across the hills in an early summer dawn and in the centre of this as in an aureole stood a nobly proportioned figure clad in gold-coloured garments fashioned after the early greek models presumably this personage was human but never was a semblance of humanity so transfigured the face and form were those of beautiful youth the eyes were deep and brilliant the expression of the features was one of fine serenity and kindliness morgana gazed and gazed bending herself towards her wonderful visitor with all her soul in her eyes when suddenly the vision if so it might be called paled and vanished she uttered a little cry oh why have you gone so soon she exclaimed it is not i who have gone replied the voice it is only the reflection of me we cannot project a light picture too far or too long and even now when you come to us if you ever do come do you think you will remember me how could i forget anyone so beautiful she said with passionate enthusiasm this time the sound ray conveyed a vibration of musical laughter where every being has beauty for a birthright how should you know me more than another said the voice beauty is common to all in our city as common as health because we obey the divine laws of both she stretched out her hands appealingly oh if only i could come to you now she murmured patience 
and the voice grew softer there is something for you to do in the world you must lose a love before you find it she drew a quick breath what could these words mean it is time for you now to turn homeward went on the voice you must not be seen above this city at dawn you would be attacked and instantly destroyed as having received a warning which you refused to heed do you attack and destroy all strangers so she asked is that your rule it is our rule to keep away the mischief of the modern world replied the voice as well admit a pestilence as the men and women of today i am a woman of today said morgana no you are not you are a woman of the future and the voice was grave and insistent you are one of the new race at the appointed hour you will take your part with us in the new world when will be that hour there was a pause then with an exceeding sweetness and solemnity the voice replied if he will that we tarry till he come what is that to thee a sense of great awe swept over her oppressive and humiliating she looked once more through her cabin window at the city spread out below and saw that some of the lights were being extinguished in the taller buildings and on the bridges which connected streets and avenues in a network of architectural beauty the voice spoke again we are releasing you from the barrier you are free to depart she sighed i have no wish to go she said you must the voice became commanding if you stay now you and your companions are doomed to perish there is no alternative be satisfied that we know you we watch you we shall expect you sooner or later meanwhile guide your ship the way is open quickly she sprang to the steering gear she felt the white eagle moving and lifting its vast wings for flight farewell she cried with a sense of tears in her throat farewell not farewell came the reply spoken softly and with tenderness we shall meet again soon i will speak to you in sicily in sicily she exclaimed joyfully you will speak to me there there and everywhere answered the voice the sound ray knows no distance i shall speak and you shall hear whenever you will the last syllables died away like faintly sung music and in a few more seconds the great airship was sailing steadily in a level line and at a swift pace onward the last shining glimpse of the mysterious city vanished and the white eagle soared over a sable blackness of empty desert through a dark space besprinkled with stars filled with a new sense of power and gladness morgana held the vessel in the guidance of her slight but strong hands and it had flown many miles before the marchesa rivardi sprang up suddenly from where he had lain lost in unconsciousness and stared around him amazed and confused a thousand pardons madama he stammered i shall never forgive myself i have been asleep end of chapter eighteen of the secret power by marie corelli this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this chapter read by vaughan mccarthy chapter nine at almost the same moment gaspard stumbled to his feet asleep asleep he exclaimed mon dieu the shame of it the shame what pigs are men to sleep after food and wine and to leave a woman alone like this the shame morgana quietly steering the white eagle smiled poor gaspard she said you could not help it you were so tired and you marcasse you were both quite worn out i was glad to see you sleeping 
There is no shame in it. As I have often told you, I can manage the ship alone. But Rivardi was white with anger and self-reproach. Gross pigs are we, he said hotly. Gaspard is right. And yet... Here he passed a hand across his brow and tried to collect his thoughts. Yes, surely something unusual must have happened. We heard bells ringing. Morgana watched him closely, her hand on her air vessel's helm. Yes, we all thought we heard bells, she said. But that was a noise in our own brains. The clamour of our own blood, brought on by pressure. We were flying at too great a height, and the tension was too strong. Gaspard threw out his hands with a half-defiant gesture. No, madama, it could not be so. I swear we never left our own level. What happened I cannot tell, but I felt that I was struck by a sudden blow, and I fell without force to recover. Sleep struck you that sudden blow, you poor Gaspard, said Morgana. And you have not slept so long, barely an hour. Just long enough for me to hover a while above this black desert and then turn homeward. I want no more of the Sahara. Rivardi, smarting under a sense of loss and incompetency, went up to her. Give me the helm, he said, almost sharply. You have done enough. She resigned her place to him, smiling at his irritation. You are sure you are quite rested? she asked. Rested, he echoed the word disdainfully. I should never have rested at all had I been half the man I profess to be. Why do you turn back? I thought you were bent on exploring the great desert. That you meant to try and find the traditional brazen city? She shrugged her shoulders. I do not like the prospect, she said. There is nothing but sand, interminable billows of sand. I can well believe it was all ocean once, when the earth gave a sudden tilt, and all the water was thrown off from one surface to another. If we could dig deep enough below the sand, I think we should find remains of wrecked ships, with the skeletons of antediluvian men and animals, remains of one of the many wasted civilizations. You do not answer me, interrupted Rivardi with impatience. What of your search for the brazen city? She raised her lovely mysterious eyes and looked full at him. Do you believe it exists? she asked. He gave a gesture of annoyance. Whether I believe or not is of no importance, he answered. You have some idea about it, and you have every means of proving the truth of your idea. Yet after making the journey from Sicily for the purpose, you suddenly turn back. Still, she kept her eyes upon him. You must not mind the caprices of a woman, she said, with a smile. And do please remember, the brazen city is not my idea. The legend of this undiscovered place in the desert was related by your friend, Don Aloysius. And he was careful to say it was only a legend. Why should you think I accept it as a truth? Surely it was the motive of your flight here? He demanded imperatively. Her brows drew together in a slight frown. My dear Marcusse, I allow no one to question my motives, she said with sudden coldness. That I have decided to go no farther in search of the brazen city is my own affair. But not even to wait for the full daylight, he expostulated. You could not see it by night, even if it existed. Not unless it was lit like other cities, she said, smiling. I suppose if such a city existed, its inhabitants would need some sort of illuminant. They would not grope about in the dark. In that case, it would be seen from our ship, as well by night as by day. Gaspard, busy with some mechanical detail, looked up. Then why not make a search for it while we are here, he said. You evidently believe in it. I have turned the white eagle homeward, and shall not turn again, she said. But I do not see any reason why such a city should not exist and be discovered some day. Explorers in tropical forests find the remains or beginnings of a different race of men from our own, pygmies, and such like beings. 
There is nothing really against the possibility of an undiscovered city in the great desert. We modern folk think we know a great deal, but our wisdom is very superficial and our knowledge limited. We have not mastered everything under the sun. The Marchese Rivardi looked at her with something of defiance in his glance. I will adventure in search of the legendary city myself alone, he said. Morgana laughed, her clear little cold laugh of disdain. Do so, my friend. Why not? she said. You are a daring airman on many forms of airships. I knew that, before I entrusted you with this scheme of mine. Discover the legendary brazen city if you can. I promise not to be jealous, and return to the world of curiosity mongers, also if you can, with a full report of its inhabitants and their manners and customs. And so you will become famous, but you must not fall asleep on the way. He paled with anger and annoyance. She still smiled. Do not be cross, amico, she said sweetly. Think where we are, in the wide spaces of heaven, pilgrims with the stars. This is no place for personal feeling of either disappointment or irritation. You asked me a while ago if I was tired. I thought I was hot, but I am very tired. I am going to rest, and I trust you both to take care of me and the White Eagle. We are to make straight for Sicily? he asked. Yes, straight for Sicily. She retired into her sleeping cabin and disappeared. The Marquise Rivardi looked at Gaspard questioningly. We must obey her, I suppose. We could not think of disobeying, returned Gaspard. She is a strange woman. And as he spoke, Rivardi gripped his steering gear with a kind of vindictive force. It seems absurd that we, two men of fair intelligence and scientific attainment, shall be ruled by her whim, her fancies, for after all, she is made up of fancies. Gaspard shook his finger warningly. This airship is not a whim or a fancy, he said impressively. It is the most wonderful thing of its kind ever invented. If it is given to the world, it will revolutionize the whole system of aerial navigation. Here we are, flying at top speed in perfect ease and safety, with no engine, nothing to catch fire, nothing to break or bust, and the whole mechanism mysteriously makes its own motive power as it goes. Radioactivity, it may be but its condensation and use for such a purpose is the secret invention of a woman, and surely we must admit her genius. As for our obedience, Excellenza, we are both royally paid to obey. Rivardi flushed red. I know, he said curtly, I never forget it, but money is not everything. Gaspard's mobile French face lit up with a mirthful smile. It is most things, he replied. Without it, even science is crippled. And this lady has so much of it. It seems without end. Again, it is seldom one meets with money and brains and beauty altogether. Beauty? Rivardi queried. Why, yes. Beauty that only flashes out at moments. Of all beauty, the most fascinating. A face that is always beautiful is fatiguing. It is the changeful face with endless play of expression that enthralls. Or so it is to me. And Gaspard gave an eloquent gesture. This lady we both work for seems to have no lovers. But if she had, not one of them could ever forget her. Rivardi was silent. I should not wonder, ventured Gaspard presently, if while we slept... She had seen her brazen city. Rivardi uttered something like an oath. Impossible, he exclaimed. She would have awakened us. If she could, no doubt, agreed Gaspard. But if she could not, how then? For a moment Rivardi looked puzzled. Then he dismissed his companion's suggestion with a contemptuous shrug. Buster, there is no brazen city. 
When she heard the old tradition, she was like a child with a fairy tale. A child, who reading of the strawberries growing in the winter snow, goes out forthwith to find them. She did not really believe in it, but it pleased her to imagine she did. The mere sight of the arid, empty desert has been enough for her. We certainly heard bells, said Gaspard. In our brains. Such sounds often affect the nerves when flying for a long while at high speed. For all our cleverness, we are only human. I have heard on the wireless sounds that do not seem of this world at all. So have I, said Gaspard, and though it may be my own brain talking, I'm not so obstinate in my own knowledge as to doubt a possible existing means of communication between one continent and another apart from our special wireless. In fact, I'm sure there is something of the kind, though where it comes from and how it travels I cannot say, but certain people get news of occurring events somehow, from somewhere, long before it reaches Paris or London. I dare say the lady we are with could tell us something about it. Her powers are not limitless, said Rivardi. She is only a woman, after all. Gaspard said no more, and there followed a silence. A silence all the more tense and deep because of the amazing swiftness with which the white eagle kept its steady level flight, making no sound despite the rapidity of its movement. Very gradually the darkness of night lifted, as it were, one corner of its sable curtain to show a grey peephole of dawn, and soon it became apparent that the ship was already far away from the mysterious land of Egypt, the land shadowing with wings, and was flying over the sea. There was something terrific in the complete noiselessness with which it sped through the air, and Rivardi, though now he had a good grip on his nerves, hardly dared allow himself to think of the adventurous business on which he was engaged. A certain sense of pride and triumph filled him, to realise that he had been selected from many applicants for the post he occupied, and yet with all his satisfaction there went a lurking spirit of envy and disappointed ambition. If he could win Morgana's love, if he could make the strange elfin creature with all her genius and inventive ability his own, why then? What then? He would share in her fame. I more than share it, since it is the way of the world to give its honour to no woman whose life is connected with that of a man. The man receives the acknowledgement invariably, even if he has done nothing to deserve it. And herein is the reason why many gifted women do not marry and prefer to stand alone in effort and achievement, rather than have their hardly won renown filched from them by unjust hands. When Roger Seaton confessed to the girl Manella that his real desire was to bend and subdue Morgana's intellectuality to his own, he spoke for the truth, not only for himself, but for all men. Absolutely disinterested love for a brilliantly endowed woman could be difficult to find in any male creature. Men love what is inferior to themselves, not superior. Thus women who are endowed with more than common intellectual ability have to choose one of two alternatives. Love, or what is called love and childbearing, or fame and lifelong loneliness. The Marquise Rivardi thinking along the usual line of masculine logic, had frequently turned over the problem of Morgana's complex character such as it appeared to him, and had almost come to the conclusion that if he only had patience, he would succeed in persuading her that wifehood and motherhood were more conducive to a woman's happiness than all the most amazing triumphs of scientific discovery and attainment. He was perfectly right according to simple natural law, but he chose to forget that women's mental outlook has, in these modern days, been greatly widened, whether for their gain or loss it is not yet easy to say. Even for men, much knowledge increaseth sorrow, and it may be hinted that women, 
with their often overstrung emotions and exaggerated sentiments, are not fit to plunge deeply into studies which tax the brain to its utmost capacity and try the nerves beyond the level of calm which is essential to health. Though it has to be admitted that married life is less peaceful than hard study, and the bright woman who recently said, a husband is more trying than any problem in Euclid, no doubt had good cause for the remark. Married or single, woman both physically and mentally is the greatest sufferer in the world. Her time of youth and unthinking joy is brief, her martyrdom long, and it is hardly wonderful that she goes so often to the bad where there is so little offered to attract her towards the good. Rivardi, letting himself go on the flood tide of hope and ambition, pleased his mind with imaginary pictures of Morgana as his wife and as mother of his children, rehabilitating his fallen fortunes, restoring his once great house, and building a fresh inheritance for its former renown. He saw no reason why this should not be, yet even while he indulged in his thoughts of her, he knew well enough that behind her small, delicate personality there was a powerful intellectual lens, so to speak, through which she examined the ins and outs of character in man or woman, and he felt that he was always more or less under this lens, looked at as carefully as a scientist might study bacteria, and that as a matter of fact it was as unlikely as the descent of the moon goddess to Endymion that she would ever submit herself to his possession. Nevertheless, he argued, stranger things had happened. The grey peep of dawn widened into a silver rift, and the silver rift streamed into a bar of gold, and the bar of gold broke up into long strands of blush pink and pale blue like festal banners hanging in heaven's bright pavilion, and the white eagle flew on swiftly, steadily, securely, among all the glories of the dawn, like a winged car for the conveyance of angels, and both Rivardi and Gaspard thought they were not far from the realization of an angel when Morgana suddenly appeared at the door of her sleeping cabin, attired in a fleecy wool gown of purest white, her wonderful gold hair unbound and falling nearly to her feet. What a perfect morning, she exclaimed. All things seem new, and I have had such a good rest. The air is so pure and clean. Surely we are over the sea. We are some fifteen thousand feet above the Mediterranean, answered Rivardi, looking at her as he spoke with unconcealed admiration. Never, he thought, had she seemed so charming, youthful, and entirely lovable. I am glad you have rested. You look quite refreshed and radiant. After all, it is a test of endurance, this journey to Egypt and back. Do you think so? And Morgana smiled. It should be nothing. It really is nothing. We ought to be quite ready and willing to travel like this for a week on end. But you and Gaspard are not yet absolutely sure of our motive power. You cannot realize that as long as we keep going so long will our going force be generated without effort. Yet surely it is proved. Gaspard lifted his eyes towards her, where she stood like a little white Madonna in a shrine. Yes, madama, it is proved, he said, but the secret of its proving? Ah, that, for the present, remains locked up in the mystery box here, and she tapped her forehead with her finger. The world is not ready for it. The world is a destructive savage, loving evil rather than good, and it will work mischief more than usefulness with such a force, if it knew. Now I will dress and give you breakfast in ten minutes. She waved a hand to them and disappeared, returning after a brief interval attired in her aviation costume and cap. Soon she had prepared quite a tempting breakfast on the table. Thermos coffee, she said gaily, all hot and hot. 
We could have had thermos tea, but I think coffee more inspiriting. Tea always reminds me of an afternoon at a country vicarage where good ladies sit round a table and talk of babies and rheumatism. Kind, but so dull. Come, you must take it in turns. You, Marcasse, first, while Gaspard steers. And Gaspard next, just as you did last night, at what we called dinner, before you fell asleep. Men do fall asleep after dinner, you know. It's quite ordinary, married men especially. I think they do it to avoid conversation with their wives. She laughed, and her eyes flashed mirthfully, as Rivardi seated himself opposite to her at the table. Well, I am not married, he said rather petulantly, nor is Gaspard, but some day we may fall into temptation and not be delivered from evil. Ah, yes. And Morgana shook her fair head at him with mock dolefulness. And that will be very sad. Though nowadays it will not bind you to a fettered existence. Marriage has ceased to be a sacrament. You can leave your wives as soon as you get tired of them. Or they can leave you. Rivardi looked at her with reproach in his handsome face and dark eyes. You read the modern press, he said. A pity you do. Yes, it is a pity anyone reads it, she answered. But what are we to read? If low-minded and illiterate scavengers are employed to write for the newspapers instead of well-educated men, we must put up with the mud the scavengers collect. We know well enough that every journal is more or less a calendar of lies. All the same, we cannot blind ourselves to the great change that has come over manners and morals, particularly in relation to marriage. Of course, the press always chronicles the worst items bearing on the subject. The press is chiefly to blame for it, declared Rivardi. Oh, I think not. And Morgana smiled as she poured out a second cup of coffee. The press cannot create a new universe. No, I think human nature alone is to blame, if blame there be. Human nature is tired. Tired? echoed Rivardi. In what way? In every way. And a lovely light of tenderest pity filled her eyes as she spoke. Tired of the same old round of working, mating, breeding and dying, for no results really worth having. Civilization after civilization has arisen, always with strife and difficulty, only to pass away, leaving, in many cases, scarce a memory. Human nature begins to weary of the continuous grind. It demands the why of its ceaseless labor. Latterly, poor striving men and women have been deprived of faith. They used to believe they had a loving father in heaven who cared for them. But the monkeys of the race, the atheists, swinging from point to point of argument and chattering all the time, have persuaded them that they are, as Tennyson once mournfully wrote, poor orphans of nothing, alone on that lonely shore, born of the brainless nature who knew not that which she bore. Can we wonder, then, that they are tired, tired of pursuing a useless quest? Human nature is craving for a change, for a newer world, a newer race. And those who see that nature is not brainless, but full of intelligent conception, are sure that the change will come. And you are one of those who see, said Rivardi incredulously. I do not say I am. That would be too much self-assertion, she answered. But I hope I am. I long to see the world endowed more richly with health and happiness. See how gloriously the sun has risen. In what splendor of light and air we are sailing. If we can do as much as this, we ought to be able to do more. We shall do more in time, he said. The advance of one step leads to another. In time, echoed Morgana. What time the human race has already taken to find out the simplest forces of nature. It is the horrible bulk of blank stupidity that hinders knowledge, the heavy obstinate bulk that declines to budge an inch out of its own fixity. 
Nowadays we triumph in our so-called discoveries of wireless telegraphy and telephony, light rays and other marvels. But these powers have always been with us, from the beginning of things. It is we, we only, who have refused to accept them as facts of the universe. Let us talk no more about it. Stupidity is the only thing that moves me to despair. She rose from the little table and called Gaspard to breakfast, while Rivardi went back to the business of steering. The day was now fully declared, and the great airship soared easily in a realm of ethereal blue. Blue above, blue below, its vast wings moving up and down with perfect rhythm, as if it were a living sentient creature, reveling in the joys of flight. For the rest of the day, Morgana was very silent, contenting herself to sit in her charming little rose-lined nest of a room and read, now and then looking out on the radiating space around her, and watching for the first slight downward movement of the white eagle towards land. She had plenty to occupy her thoughts, and strange to say, she did not consider as anything unexpected or remarkable her brief communication with the brazen city. On the contrary, it seemed quite a natural happening. Of course it had always been there, she said to herself, only people were too dull and unenterprising to discover it. Besides, if they had ever found it, certain travellers having declared they had seen it in the distance, they would not have been allowed to approach it. This fact was the one point that chiefly dwelt in her mind, the secret of science which she puzzled her brain to fathom. What could be the unseen force that guarded the city, girding it round with an unbreakable band from all exterior attack? A million bombs could not penetrate it. So had said the voice travelling to her ears on the mysterious sound ray. She thought of Shakespeare's lines on England. This precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house, against the envy of less happy lands. Modern science had made the sea useless as a wall or moat defensive against attacks from the air. But if there existed an atmospheric or etheric force, which could be utilised and brought to such pressure as to encircle a city or a country with a protective ring that should resist all effort to break it, how great a security would be assured against the envy of less happy lands. Here was a problem for study, study of the intricate character which she loved, and she became absorbed in what she called thinking for results, a form of introspection which she knew from experience, sometimes let in unexpected light on the creative cells of the brain, and impelled them to the evolving of hitherto untried suggestions. She sat quietly with a book before her, not reading, but bent on seeking ways and means for the safety and protection of nations as bent as Roger Seaton was on a force for their destruction. So the hours passed swiftly, and no interruption or untoward obstacle hindered the progress of the White Eagle as it careered through the halcyon blue of the calmest, loveliest sky that ever made perfect weather, till late afternoon when it began to glide almost insensibly downward toward earth. Then she roused herself from her long abstraction, and looked through the window of her cabin, watching what seemed to be the gradual rising of the land towards the airship, showing in little green and brown patches, like the squares of a chessboard, then the houses and towns, tiny as children's toys, then the azure gleam of the sea, and the boats dancing like bits of cork upon it, then finally the plainer, broader view wherein the earth with its woods and hills and rocky promontories appeared to heave up like a billowed crown with varying colours, and so steadily, easily down to the pattern of grass and flowers, from the centre of which the Palazzo d'Oro rose like a little white house for the abode of fairies. 
Well steered, said Morgana, as the ship ran into its shed with the accuracy of a sword slipping into its sheath, and the soundless vibration of its mysterious motive power ceased. Home again safely, and only away forty-eight hours, to the Sahara and back. How far we have been, and what we have seen. We have seen nothing, said Rivardi meaningly, as he assisted her to alight. The seeing is all within you. And the believing, she answered, smiling. All my thanks to you both for your skilful pilotage. You must be very tired. Here she gave her hand to each of them in turn. Again, a thousand thanks. No airship could be better manned. Or womaned, suggested Rivardi. She laughed. If you like, but I only steered while you slept. That is nothing. Good night. She left them, running up the garden path lightly like a child, returning from a holiday, and disappeared. But that which she calls nothing, said Gaspard as he watched her go, is everything. End of chapter 19「Of the Secret Power」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli Chapter 20 For some days after her adventurous voyage to the great desert and back, Morgana chose to remain in absolute seclusion. Save for Lady Kingswood and her own household staff, she saw no one, and was not accessible even to Don Eliseus, who called several times, moved not only by interest, but genuine curiosity to inquire how she fared. Many of the residents in the vicinity of the Palazzo d'Oro had gleaned scraps of information here and there concerning the wonderful airship which they had seen careening over their heads during its testing trials and as a matter of course they had heard more than scraps in regard to its wealthy owner. But nowadays, keen desire to know and to investigate has given place to a sort of civil apathy which passes for good form, that absolute indifferentism which is too much bored to care about other people's affairs, and which would not disturb itself if it heard a neighbor deciding to cross the Atlantic in a wash tub. Nothing matters is the general verdict on all events and circumstances. Nevertheless, the size, the swiftness, and soundlessness of the white eagle, and the secrecy observed in its making, had somewhat moved the heavy lump of human dough called society, and the whispered novelty of Morgana's invention had reached Rome and Paris, nay, almost London, without her consent or knowledge, so that she was more or less deluged with letters, and noted scientists, both in France and Italy, though all incredulous as to her attainment, made it a point of business to learn all they could about her, which was not much more than can be usually learned about any wealthy woman or man with a few whims to gratify. A murderer gains access to the whole press. His look, his manner, his remarks are all carefully noted and commented upon. But a scientist, an explorer, a man or woman whose work is that of beneficence and use to humanity, is barely mentioned except in the way of a sneer. So it often chances that the public know nothing of its greatest, till they have passed beyond the reach of worldly honor. Morgana, however, had no desire that her knowledge or attainment should be admired or praised. She was entirely destitute of ambition. She had read too much and studied too deeply to care for so-called fame, which, as she knew, is the mere noise of one moment, to be lost in silence the next. She was self-centered and yet not selfish. She felt that to understand her own entity, its mental and physical composition, and the possibilities of its future development, was sufficient to fill her life, that life which she quite instinctively recognized as bearing within itself the seed of immortality. Her strange interview with the voice from the city in the desert, and the glimpse she had been permitted to see of the owner of that voice, had not so much surprised her as convinced her of a theory she had long held, namely, that there were other types of the human race existing, unknown to the generality of ordinary men and women, types that were higher in their organization and mental capacity, types which by reason of their very advancement 
kept themselves hidden and aloof from modern civilization, and she forthwith plunged anew into the ocean of scientific problems, where she floated like a strong swimmer at ease with her mind upturned to the stars. Yet she did not neglect the graceful comforts and elegancies of the Palazzo d'Oro, and life went on in that charming abode peacefully. Morgana, always being the kindest of patrons to Lady Kingswood, and discoursing feminine commonplaces with her as though there were no other subjects of conversation in the world than embroidery and specific cures for rheumatism. She said little, indeed almost nothing, of her aerial voyage to the east, except that she had enjoyed it, and that the pyramids and the sphinx were dwarfed into mere insignificant dots on the land, as seen from the air. She had apparently nothing more to describe, and Lady Kingswood was not sufficiently interested in air travel to press inquiry. One bright sunny morning, after a week of her self-imposed seclusion, she announced her intention of calling at the monastery to see Don Alysius. "'I have been rather rude,' she said. "'Of course he has wanted to know how my flight to the east went off, and I have given no sign and sent no message.' "'He has called several times,' replied Lady Kingswood and I think he has been very much disappointed not to be received. Poor Reverend Father, and Morgana smiled. He should not bother his mind about a woman. Well, I'm going to see him now. Lady Kingswood looked at her critically. She was gowned in a simple white morning frock with touches of blue, and she wore a broad-brimmed Tuscan straw hat with a fold of blue carelessly twined about it. She made a pretty picture, one of extraordinary youthfulness for any woman out of her teens so much so that Lady Kingswood wondered if voyages in the air would be found to have a rejuvenating effect. "'They do not admit women into the actual monastery,' she went on. "'Feminine frivolities are forbidden. But the ruined cloister is open to visitors, and I shall ask to see Don Alysius there.' She lightly waved adieu and went, leaving her amiable and contented chaperone to the soothing companionship of a strip of embroidery at which she worked with the leisurely tranquillity which such an occupation engenders. The ruined cloister looked very beautiful that morning, with its crumbling arches crowned and festooned with roses climbing every way at their own sweet will, and Morgana's light figure gave just a touch of human interest to the solemn peacefulness of the scene. She waited but two or three minutes before Don Alysius appeared. He had seen her arrive from the window of his own private library. He approached her slowly. There was a gravity in the expression of his face that almost amounted to coldness and no smile lightened it as she met his keen, fixed glance. "'So you have come at last,' he said. "'I have not merited your confidences till now. Why?' His rich voice had a ring of deep reproach in its tone, and she was, for a moment, taken aback. Then her native self-possession and perfect assurance returned. "'Dear Father Alysius, you do not want my confidence. You know all I can tell you,' she said and drawing close to him, she laid her hand on his arm. Am I not right? A tremor shook him. Gently he put her hand aside. You think I know, he replied. You imagine. Oh, no, I imagine nothing. And she smiled. I am sure, yes, sure, that you have the secret of things that seem fabulous, and yet are true. It was you who first told me of the brazen city in the great desert. You said it was a mere tradition but you filled my mind with a desire to find it. And you found it? he interrupted quickly. You found it? You know I did, she replied. Why ask the question? Messages on a sound ray can reach you as well as me. He moved to the stone bench which occupied a corner of the cloister and sat down. He was very pale, and his eyes were feverishly bright. Presently he seemed to recover himself and spoke more in his usual manner. Rivardi has been here every day, he said. He has talked of nothing but you. He told me that he and Gaspard fell suddenly asleep, for which they were grievously ashamed of themselves, and that you took control of the airship and turned it homeward before you had given them any chance to explore the desert. Quite true, she answered tranquilly. And you knew all that before he told you. You knew that I was compelled to turn the ship homeward because it was not allowed to proceed. Dear Father Alysius, you cannot hide yourself from me. You are one of the few who has studied the secrets of the approaching future, the change which is eminent, the world to come which is coming. Yes, and you are brave to live as you do in the fetters of a conventional faith, when you have had such a far wider outlook. 
he stopped her by a gesture, rising from where he sat and extending a hand of warning and authority. "'Child, beware what you say!' And his voice had a ring of sternness in its mellow tone. "'If I know what you think I know, on what grounds do you suppose I have built my knowledge? Only on that faith which you call conventional, that faith which has never been understood by the world's majority, that faith which teaches of the God and man done to death by the man without God in him, and who, nevertheless, by the spiritual strength of a resurrection from the grave, proves that there is no death but only continuous renewal of life. This is no mere convention of faith, no imaginary or traditional tale. It is a pure scientific fact. The virginal conception of divinity in women, and the transfiguration of manhood, these things are true, and the advance of scientific discovery will prove them so beyond all denial. We have held the faith, as it should be held, for centuries, and it has led us, and continues to lead us, to all we know. We? queried Morgana softly. We? Of the church? Or of the brazen city? He looked at her for some moments without speaking. His tall, fine figure seemed more than ever stately and imposing, and his features expressed a calm assurance and the dignity of thought which gave them additional charm. "'Your question is bold,' he said. "'Your enterprising spirit stops at nothing. You have learned much. You are resolved to learn more. Well, I cannot prevent you, nor do I see any reason why I should try. You are a resolved student. You are also a woman.' a woman different to ordinary women and set apart from ordinary womanhood. So I say to you, we of the brazen city, if you will. For more than three thousand years we have existed, we have studied, we have discovered, we have known. We, the selected offspring of all the race that ever were born. We, the pure blood of the earth. We, the progenitors of the world to be. We have lived watching temporary civilizations rise and fall, seeing generations born and die, because, like weeds, they have grown without any root of purpose, save to smother their neighbors and destroy. We remain as commanded, waiting for the full declaration and culmination of those forces which are already advancing to the end, when the kingdom comes. Morgana moved close to him, and looked up at his grave, dark face beseechingly. Then why are you here? she asked. If you know... If you were ever in the brazen city, how did it happen that you left it? How could it happen? He smiled down into the jewel blue of her clear eyes. Little child, he said, brilliant soul that rejoiced in the perception that gave you what you called the inside of a sun ray, you for whom the things which interest men and women of the moment are mere toys of poor invention. You of all others ought to know that when the laws of the universe are understood and followed, there can be no fetters on the true liberty of the subject. If I were ever in the brazen city, mind I say if, there could be nothing to prevent my leaving it if I chose. She interrupted him by the uplifting of a hand. I was told, she said slowly, by a voice that spoke to me, that if I went there, I should have to stay there. No doubt, he answered, for love would keep you. Love? she echoed. Even so. Such love as you have never dreamed of, dear soul weighted with millions of gold. Love, the only force that pulls heaven to earth and binds them together. But you, you, if you were in the brazen city. If, he repeated emphatically. If, yes, if, she said. If you were there, love did not hold you. No. There was a silence. The sunshine burned down on the ancient gray flagstones of the cloister, and two gorgeous butterflies danced over the climbing roses that hung from the arches in festal wreaths of pink and white. A luminance deeper than that of the sun seemed to encircle the figures standing together, the one so elfin, light, and delicate, the other invested with a kind of inward royalty, expressing itself outwardly in stateliness of look and bearing. Something mysteriously suggestive of superhumanity environed them a spirit and personality higher than mortal. After some minutes, Olysia spoke again. The city is not a brazen city, he said. It has been called so by travelers who have seen its golden towers glistening afar off in a sudden refraction of the light lasting but a few seconds. 
Gold often looks like brass, and brass like gold, in human entities as in architectural results. He paused, then went on slowly and impressively. Surely you remember, you must remember, that it is written, The city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. The wall thereof is according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, and the city is of pure gold. Does that give you no hint of the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, of the new heavens and the new earth, the old things being passed away? Dear child, you have studied deeply, you have adventured far and greatly. Continue your quest, but do not forget to take your guiding light, the faith which half the world and more ignores. She sprang to him impulsively and caught his hands. Oh, you must help me, she cried. You must teach me. I want to know what you know. He held her gently and with reverent tenderness. I know no more than you, he answered. You work by science. I, by faith, the bedrock from which all science proceeds. And we arrive at the same discoveries by different methods. I am a poor priest in the temple of the divine, serving my turn. But I am not alone in service, for in every corner of the habitable globe there is one member of our city who communicates with the rest. One. But enough. Today's commercial world uses old systems of wireless telegraphy and telephony, which were known and done with thousands of years ago. But we have the sound ray, the light which carries music on its wings and creates form as it goes. Here he released her hands. Knowing what you do know, you have no need of my help, he continued. You have not found happiness yet, because that only comes through one source, love. But I doubt not that God will give you that in his own good time. He paused, and then went on. As you go out, enter the chapel for a moment, and send a prayer on the sound ray to the center of all knowledge, the source of all discovery. Have no fear but that it will arrive. The rest is for you to decide. She hesitated. And the brazen city? she queried. The golden city, he answered. Well, you have had your experience. Your name is known there, and no doubt you can hear from it when you will. Do you hear from it? she asked pointedly. He smiled gravely. I may not speak of what I hear, he answered, nor may you. She was silent for a space, then looked up at him appealingly. The world has changed for me, she said. It will never be the same again. I do not seem to belong to it. Other influences surround me. How I live in it? How shall I work? What shall I do? You will do as you have always done. Go your own way, he replied. The way which has led you to so much discovery and attainment. You must surely know in your own soul that you have been guided in that way, and your success is the result of allowing yourself to be guided. In all things you will be guided now. Have no fear for yourself. All will be well for you. And for you? she asked impulsively. He smiled. Why think of me? he said gently. I am nothing in your life. You are! she replied. You are more than you can imagine. I begin to realize... He held up his hand with a warning gesture. Hush, he said. There are things of which we must not speak. At that moment the monastery bell tolled the midday Angelus. Don Aloysius bent his head. Morgana instinctively did the same. Within the building the deep voices of the brethren sounded, chanting, Angelus Domini Nuntiavit Maria, et concepit de Spiritu Sancto. As the salutation to heaven finished, the mellow music of the organ in the chapel sent a wave of solemn and prayerful tenderness on the air, and, moved by the emotion of the hour, Morgana's heart beat more quickly, and tears filled her eyes. There must be beautiful music in the golden city, she said. Don Aloysius smiled. There is. And when the other things of life give you pause to listen, you will often hear it. She smiled happily in response, and then, with a silent gesture of farewell, left the cloister, and made her way to the chapel, part of which was kept open for public worship. It was empty, but the hidden organist was still playing. She went towards the high altar and knelt in front of it. She was not of the Catholic faith. 
she was truly of no faith at all save that which is taught by science, which, like a door opened in heaven, shows all the wonders within. But her keen sense of the beautiful was stirred by the solemn peace of the shut tabernacle with a cross above it, and the great lilies bending under their own weight of loveliness and fragrance from either side. It is the symbol of a great truth which is true for all time, she thought as she clasped her hands in an attitude of prayer. And how sad and strange it is to feel that there are thousands among the best-intentioned worshippers and priests who have not discovered its mystic meaning. The God and man, born of purity and woman. Is it only in the golden city that they know? She raised her eyes in half-unconscious appeal, and as she did so, a brilliant ray of light flashed downward from the summit of the cross which surmounted the altar and remained extended slantwise toward her. She saw it, and waited expectantly. Close to her ears a voice spoke with extreme softness, yet very distinctly. "'Can you hear me?' "'Yes,' she replied at once, with equal softness. "'Then listen. I have a message for you.' And Morgana listened. Listened intently, the sapphire hue of the ray lighting her gold hair as she knelt absorbed. What she heard filled her with a certain dread, and a tremor of premonition, like the darkness preceding storm, shook her nerves but the inward spirit of her was as a warrior clothed in steel. She was afraid of nothing, least of all of any event or incident passing for supernatural, knowing beyond all doubt that the most seeming miraculous circumstances are all the result of natural movement and transmutation. There never has been anything surprising to her in the fact that light is a conveyor of sound, and that she was receiving a message by such means seemed no more extraordinary to her mind than receiving it by the accepted telephonic service. Every word spoken she heard with the closest attention, until, as though a cloud had suddenly covered it, the sound ray vanished, and the voice ceased. She rose at once from her knees, alert and ready for action. Her face was pale, her lips set, her eyes luminous. "'I must not hesitate,' she said. "'If I can save him, I will.' She left the chapel and hurried home, where as soon as she reached her own private room she wrote to the Marchesa Rivardi the following note which was more than unpleasantly startling to him when he received it. I shall need you and Gaspard for a long journey in the White Eagle. Prepare everything in the way of provisioning and other necessary details. No time must be lost, and no expense need be spared. We must start as quickly as possible. This message, written, sealed, and dispatched by one of her servants to the Marchesa's villa, she sat for some moments lost in thought, wistfully looking out on her flower-filled gardens and the shimmering blue of the Mediterranean beyond. I may be too late, she said, speaking aloud to herself, but I will take the risk. He will not care, no, a man like that cares for nothing but himself. He would have broken my life, had I given him the chance, for the sake of an experiment. Now, if I can, I will rescue him for the sake of an ideal. End of chapter 20 Recording by Todd one of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 21 there shall be no more wars there can be none Roger Seaton said these words aloud with defiant emphasis, addressing the dumb sky. It was early morning, but an intense heat had so scorched the earth that not the smallest drop of dew glittered on any leaf or blade of grass. It was all arid, brown and burned into a dryness as of fever. But Seaton was far too much engrossed with himself and his own business to note the landscape or to be troubled by the suffocating closeness of the atmosphere. He stood, gazing with the idolatry of a passionate lover, at a small, plain metal case, containing a dozen or more small, plain metal cylinders, as small as women's thimbles, all neatly ranged side by side, divided from contact with one another by folded strips of cotton. "'There it is,' he went on, apostrophizing the still air. Complete, perfected. If I sold that to any nation under the sun, that nation could rule the world, could wipe out everything save itself and its own people. 
I have wrested the secret from the very womb of nature. It is mine, all mine. I would have given it to Britain, or to the United States, but neither will accept my terms. So therefore I hold it, I only, which is just as well. I, just I, a master of destiny. The power we call God has put this tiling into my hands. What a marvel! And shall I not use it? I will. Let Germany but stir an inch towards aggression, and Germany shall exist no longer. The same with any other nation that starts a quarrel. I, I alone, will settle it. His eyes blazed with the light of fanaticism. He was obsessed by the force of his own ideas and schemes, and the metal case on the table before him was, to his mind, time, life, present and future. He had arrived at that questionable point of intellectual attainment when man forgets that there is any existing force capable of opposing him, and imagines that he is but to go on his own way to grasp all worlds and secrets of their being. At this juncture, so often arrived at by many, a kind of super-sureness sets in, persuading the finite nature that it has reached the infinite. The whole mental organization of the man thrilled with an awful consciousness of power. He said within himself, I hold the lives of millions at my mercy. Other thoughts, other dreams had passed away for the moment. He had forgotten life as it presents itself to the ordinary human being. Now and again a flitting vision of Morgana vaguely troubled him. Her intellectual capacity annoyed him, and yet he would have been glad to discuss with her the scientific unfolding of his great secret. She would understand it, in all its bearings. She might advise. Advice? No, he did not need the advice of a woman. As for Manella, he had not seen her since the last violent outburst of what he called temper, and he had no wish for her presence. For now he had a thing to do which was of paramount importance, and this was to deposit the treasured discovery of his life in a secret hiding place he had found for it, till he should be ready to remove it to safer quarters, or till he resolved to use it. Had he been a religious man, of such humility as should accompany true religion, he would have prayed that its use should never be called upon. But he had trained himself into an attitude of such complete indifferentism towards life and the things of life, that to him it seemed useless to pray for what did not matter. Sometimes the thought, appalling in its truth, flashed across his brain that the force he had discovered and condensed within small compass might as easily destroy half the world as a nation. The fabled thunderbolts of Jove were child's play compared to those plain-looking thimble-like cylinders which contained such terrific power. A touch of hesitation, a pure human dread, affected his nerves for the moment. He shivered in the sultry air as with cold, and looked about him right and left as though suspecting some hidden witness of his actions. There was not so much as a bird or a butterfly in sight, and he drew a long, deep breath of relief. The day was treading in the steps of dawn, with the full blazonry of burning Californian sunlight, and away in the distance ridges and peaks of distant mountains stood out sharply clear against the intense blue of the sky. There was a great stillness everywhere, a pause, as it seemed, in the mechanism of the universe. The twitter of a bird or the cry of some wild animal would have been a relief, so Seaton felt, though accustomed to deep silence. Better get through with this at once, he said aloud, now that a safe place is prepared. Here he looked at his watch. In a couple of hours he'll be sending up from the plaza to know if I want anything. Irish Jake or Manella will be coming on some trivial matter. I'd better take the opportunity of complete secrecy while I can. For the next few minutes or so he hesitated. With a sudden fancy that he had forgotten something, he turned out his pockets, looking for he scarcely knew what. The contents were mixed and various, and among them was a crumpled letter which he had received some days since from Sam Gwent. He smoothed it out carefully and re-read it, especially one passage. 
I think the States will never get involved in another war, but I'm fairly sure Germany will. If she joins up with Russia, look out for squalls. In your old country, which appears to be peopled by madmen, there's a riding chap who spent a fortnight in Russia, not long enough to know the ins and outs of a village, yet assuming to know everything about the biggest territory in Europe. And the press is puffing up his ignorance as if it were wisdom. Germany has her finger on the spot, so perhaps your stuff will come in useful. But don't forget that if you make up your mind to use it, you will ruin America, commercially speaking, and many other countries besides. So think it well over, more than a hundred times. Lydia Herbert, whom perhaps you remember, and perhaps you don't, has caught her ancient mariner, that is to say, her millionaire, and all fashionable New York is going to the wedding, including yours truly. I had expected Morgana Royal to grace the function, but I hear she is quite engrossed with the decoration and furnishing of her Sicilian palace, as well as that of her advising artist, a very good-looking Marquis, or Marquesser, as he is called. It is also whispered that she has invented a wonderful airship, which has no engines, and creates its own motive power as it goes. Sounds rather tall talk, but this is an age of wonders and we never know what next. There is a new light ray just out which prospects for gold, oil, and all ores and minerals, and finds them in a fifty-mile circuit, so probably nobody need be poor for the future. When we've all got most things we want and there's nothing left to work for, I wonder what the world will be worth. Seaton left off reading and thrust the letter again in his pocket. What will the world be worth? he soliloquized. Why, nothing! Suddenly struck by this thought, which had not always presented itself with such sharp and clear precision as now, he took time to consider it. Capital and labour, the two forces which are much more prone to rend each other than to cooperate, these would both possibly be non-existent if science had its full way, if gold, silver, and other precious minerals could be picked up, as on the fabled Tom Tiddler's ground, by a ray of light, then the striving for wealth would cease, and work would be reduced to a minimum. The prospect was stupendous, but hardly entirely pleasing. If there were no need for effort, then the powers of mind and body would sink into inertia. What object should we live for? he mused, merely to propagate our own kind and bring more effortless beings into our world to cumber it? The very idea is horrible. Work is the very blood and bone of existence. Without it we should rot. But one must work for something, or someone. Wife? Children? Useless labour, for in nine cases out often the wife becomes a bore, and the children grow up ungrateful. Why waste strength and feeling on either? Thus mentally arguing, the exquisite lines of Tennyson's Lotus Eaters suddenly rang in his memory like a chime of bells from the old English village where he had lived as a boy, when his mother, one of the past sweet old-fashioned women, used to read to him and teach him much of the best in literature. Death is the end of life. Ah, why should life or labour be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast and in a little while our lips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? An effortless existence would be the existence of such as these fabled lotus-eaters, Moreover, it was not possible it could go on, since all nature shows effort without cessation. Roger Seaton knew this as all know it, but his soul's demand remained unsatisfied, for he sought to know the cause of all the toil and trouble, the why it should be. And at the back of his mind there was ever a teasing reminder of Morgana and her strange theories, some of which she had half imparted to him when their friendship had first begun. For her, Tennyson's line, death is the end of life, would be the statement of a foolish fallacy, as she held that there is no such thing as death, only failure to adapt the spirit to advancing and higher change in its physical organization. Today, 
he remembered with curious clearness what she had said on this subject. Radioactivity is the chief secret of life. It is for us to learn how to absorb it into our systems as we grow, to add by its means to our supplies of vitality and energy. It never gives out, nor should we. The nature intention is that we should become better, stronger, more beautiful, more mentally and spiritually perfect, and that we do not fulfill this intention is our own fault. The decimation of the human race by wars and plagues and famines has always been traceable to human error. All accidents happen through those who make accidents possible. Diseases are bred through human dirt, greed, ignorance, and neglect. They are no part of the divine scheme of things. The plan is to advance and make progress from one point of excellence to another, not to stop halfway and turn back on the road. Humanity dies because it will not learn how to live. She had spoken these words with a quiet simplicity and earnestness that impressed him at the time as being almost childlike, considering the depth of thought into which he must have plunged, notwithstanding her youth and her sex. And on this morning of all others, this morning on which he had set himself a task for which he had made long and considerable preparation, he found himself half mechanically repeating her phrase, Humanity dies because it will not learn how to live. There was no fatalism, no fixed destiny in this, only the force of will was implied, the will to learn, the will to know. And why should not humanity die, he argued within himself. If in the long course of ages it is proved that it will neither learn nor know, why should it remain? Room should be made for a new race. A clever gardener can produce a perfectly beautiful flower from an insignificant and common weed. Surely this is a lesson to us that it may be possible to produce a god from a man. He bent his eyes lovingly on the case of small cylinders lying open before him. The just-risen sun brightened them to a glitter as of cold steel, and for a moment he fancied they flashed upon him with an almost sinister gleam. Power of good or power of evil? he questioned his inward spirit. Who can decide? If it is good to destroy evil, then the force is a good force. If it is evil to destroy good with evil, then it is an evil thing. But nature makes no such particular discriminations. She destroys evil and good together at one blow. Why, therefore, should I, or any one, offer to discriminate? Since evil is always the preponderating factor. When the Lusitania was torpedoed, neither God nor nature interfered to save the innocent from the guilty. Men, women, and children were all plunged into the pitiless sea. I, as part of nature, if I destroy, I only follow her example. War is an evil, an abominable crime, and those that attempt to make it should be swept from the face of the earth, even if good and peace-loving units are swept along with them. This cannot be helped. He went into his hut, and in a few minutes came out again clothed in thick garments of a dark earth colour, and carrying a stout staff, steel pointed at its end, something after the fashion of a Swiss alpenstock. He brought with him a small metal box, into which he placed the case of cylinders, covering it with a closely fitting lid. Then he put the package into a basket made of rough twigs and strips of bark, having a strong handle, to which he fastened a leather strap, and slung the whole thing over his shoulders like a knapsack. Then, casting another look round to make sure that there was no one about, he started to walk towards a steeper descent of the hill, in a totally different direction from that which led to the Plaza Hotel. He went swiftly, at a steady, swinging pace, and though his way took him among confused masses of rocks and fallen boulders, he thought nothing of these obstacles, vaulting lightly across them with the ease of a chamois, till he came to a point where there was a declivity running sheer down to invisible depths, from whence came the rumbling echo of falling water. In this almost perpendicular wall of rock were a few ledges, like the precarious rungs of a broken ladder, and down these he prepared to go. Clinging at first to the topmost edge of the precipice, he let himself down warily, inch by inch, till his figure entirely disappeared, sunken, as it were, in darkness. As he vanished, 
there was a sudden cry, a rush as of wings, and a woman sprang up from amid bushes where she had lain hidden. It was Manella. For days and nights she had stolen away in the intervals of her work to watch him, and nothing had chanced to excite her alarm till now, till now, when she had seen him emerge from his hut and pack up the mysterious box he carried, and when she had heard him talking strangely to himself in a way she could not understand. As soon as he started to walk she followed him, pushing through heavy brushwood and crawling along the ground where she could not be seen, and now, with dishevelled hair and staring, terrified eyes, she leaned over the edge of the precipice, baffled and desperate. Tearless sobs convulsed her throat. Oh, God of mercy, she moaned in suffocated accents. How can I follow him down there? Oh, help me, Mary Mother, help me. I must, I must be with him. She gathered up her hair in a loose coil and wound her skirts tightly about her, looking everywhere for a footing. She saw a deep cranny which had been hollowed out by some torrent of water. It cut sharply through the rock like a path. She could risk that, perhaps, she thought, and yet her brain reeled. She felt sick and giddy. Would it not be wiser to stay where she was, and wait for the return of the reckless creature, who had ventured all alone into one of the deepest canons of the whole country? While she hesitated, she caught a sudden glimpse of him, stepping with apparent ease over huge heaps of stones and fallen pieces of rock at the bottom of the declivity. She watched his movements in breathless suspense. On he went, towards a vast aperture, shaped archwise like the entrance to a cavern. He paused a moment, then entered it. This was enough for Manella. Her wild love and wilder terror gave her an almost supernatural strength and daring, and all heedless now of results, she sprang boldly towards the deep cutting in the rock, swinging herself from jagged point to point, till reaching the bottom of the declivity at last, bruised and bleeding, but undaunted, she stopped, checked by a rushing stream that tumbled over great boulders and dashed its cold spray in her face. Looking about her, she saw to her dismay that the vaulted cavern, wherein Seaton had disappeared, was on the other side of this stream. She stood almost opposite to it. But how to get across? Gazing despairingly in every direction, she suddenly perceived the fallen trunk of a tree, lying half in and half out of the brawling torrent. It was green with slippery moss, and offered but a dangerous foothold. Nevertheless, she resolved to attempt it. I said I would die for him, she thought, and I will. Getting astride the tree, it swayed under her, but she found she could push one of the larger boughs forward to lengthen the extemporary bridge, and so, as it were, riding the waters which surged noisily around her, she managed by dint of superhuman effort to reach the projection of pebbly shore, where the entrance to the cavern yawned open before her black and desolate. The sun, in its full morning glory, blazed slanting down upon the darkness of the cannon, and as she stood shivering, wet through and utterly exhausted, wondering what next she should do, she caught sight of a form moving within the cave like a moving shadow, and ascending a steep natural stairway of columnar rocks piled one on top of the other. Affrighted as she was by the tomb-like aspect of the deep vault, she had not ventured so far that she would now shrink from further dangers or fail in her quest. The cherished object of her constant watchful care was within that subterranean blackness, and for what purpose? She did not dare to think. But there was an instinctive sense of dread foreknowledge upon her, a warning of impending evil. And had she not sworn to him, If God struck you down to hell, I would be there. The entrance to the cavern looked like the mouth of hell itself, as she had seen it depicted in one of her Catholic early lesson books. There were serpents and dragons in the picture, ready to devour the impenitent sinner. There might be serpents and dragons in this cave, for all she knew. But what matter? If the man she loved were actually in hell, she would be there, as she had said, and would surely find it heaven. 
and so, seeing the mere outline of his form, moving ghost-like in the gloom, it was to her a guiding presence, a light amid darkness, and when, after a minute or two, her straining eyes perceived him climbing steadily up the steep and perilous rocks, seeming about to disappear altogether, she mastered the tremor of her nerves and crept cautiously, step by step, into the sombre vault, blindly feeling her way through the damp, thick murkiness, reckless of all danger, and only bent on following him. End of chapter 21of the secret power this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lena emsley the secret power by marie corelli chapter 22 of all the vagaries and humours of humanity when considered in crowds there is nothing which appears more senseless and objectless than the way in which it congregates outside the door of a church at a fashionable or society wedding. The massed people, pushing and shoving each other about, have nothing whatever to do with either bride or bridegroom. The ceremony inside the sacred edifice has in most cases ceased to be a sacrament, and has become a mere show of dressed-up mannequins and womenkins, many of the latter being mere objets d'art, stands for the display of millinery. And yet the crowds fight and jostle, women scramble and scream, all to catch a glimpse of the woman who is to be given to the man, and the man who has agreed to accept the woman. The wealthier the pair, the wilder the frenzy to gaze upon them. Savages performing a crazy war dance are decorous of behaviour in contrast with these civilised folk, who tramp on each other's feet and are ready to squeeze each other into pulp for the chance of staring at two persons whom the majority of them have never seen before and are not likely to see again. The wedding of Miss Lydia Herbert with her ancient mariner, a seventy-year-old millionaire reputed to be as wealthy as Rockefeller, was one of these sensations, chiefly on account of the fact that every unmarried woman, young and old, and every widow, had been hunting him in vain for fully five years. Miss Herbert had been voted no chance, because she made no secret of her extravagant tastes in dress and jewels. Yet, despite society croakers, she had won the game. This in itself was interesting, as the millionaire she had secured was known to be particularly close-fisted and parsimonious. Nevertheless, he had shown remarkable signs of relaxing these tendencies for he had literally showered jewels on his chosen bride, leaving no door open for any complaint in that quarter. Her diamonds were the talk of New York, and on the day of her wedding her gowns literally flashed like a firework with numerous dazzling points of light. The voice that breathed o'er Eden had little to do with the magnificence of her attire or with the brilliancy of the rose-wreathed bridesmaids young girls of specially selected beauty and elegance, who were all, more or less, disappointed in failing to win the millionaire themselves. For these youthful persons in their teens had social ambitions hidden in hearts harder than steel. A good time of self-indulgence and luxury was all they sought for in life. In fact, they had no conception of any higher ideal. The millionaire himself, though old, maintained a fairly middle-aged appearance. He was a thin, wiry, well-preserved man, his wizened and furrowed countenance chiefly showing the marks of time's ploughshare. It would have been difficult to say why, out of all the feminine butterflies hovering around him, he had chosen Lydia Herbert. But he was a shrewd judge of character in his way, and he had decided that as she was not in her first youth, it would be more worth her while to conduct herself decorously as wife and housekeeper, and generally look after his health and comfort, than it would be for a less responsible woman. Then she had manner. Her appearance was attractive, and she wore her clothes well and stylishly. 
all this was enough for a man who wanted someone to attend to his house and entertain his friends and he was perfectly satisfied with himself as he repeated after the clergyman the words with my body i thee worship and with all my worldly goods i thee endow knowing that with his body he had never worshipped anything and that the endowment of his worldly goods was strictly limited to certain settlements he felt himself to be superior to his old bachelor friend sam gwent who supported him as best man at the ceremony and who as he stood stiffly upright in immaculate afternoon visiting attire among the restlessly swaying semi-whispering throng was all the time thinking of the dusky night gloom in the garden of the plaza far away in california and a beautiful face set against the dark background of myrtle bushes exhaling rich perfume what a startling contrast she would make to these dolls of fashion he thought what a sensation she would make there's not a woman here who can compare with her if i were only a bit younger i'd try my luck anyway i'm younger than today's bridegroom but she manella would never look at any other man than seaton who doesn't care a rap for her or any other woman here his thoughts took another turn no he repeated inwardly he doesn't care a rap for her or any other woman except perhaps morgana and even if it were morgana it would be for himself and himself alone while she ah it would be a clever brain indeed that could worry out what she cares for nothing in this world so far as i can see here the organ poured the rich strains of a soft and solemn prelude through the crowded church the sacred part of the ceremony was over and bride and bridegroom made their way to the vestry there to sign the register in the presence of a selected group of friends sam gwent was one of these and though he had attended many such functions before he was more curiously impressed than usual by the unctuous and bare-faced hypocrisy of the whole thing the smiling humbug of the officiating clergy the affected delight of the society toadies fluttering like wasps round bride and bridegroom as though they were sweet dishes specially for stinging insects to feed on and in his mind he seemed to hear the warm passionate voice of manella in frank admission of her love for seaton it is good to love him she had said i am happy to love him i only wish to serve him this was primitive passion the passion of primitive woman for her mate whom she admitted to be stronger than herself to whom she instinctively looked for shelter and protection and round whose commanding force she sought to rear the lovely fabric of home a state of feeling as far removed from the sentiments of modern women as the constellation of orion is removed from earth and sam gwent's fragmentary reflections flitting through his brain were more serious one might say more romantic than the consideration of dollars which usually occupied all his faculties he had always thought that there was a good deal in life which he had missed somehow and which dollars could not purchase and a certain irate contempt filled him for the man who unlike himself was in the prime of strength and who with all the glories of nature about him and the love and beauty of an exquisite womanhood at his hand for possession could nevertheless devote his energies to the science of destruction and the compassing of death without compunction on the lines roger seaton had laid down as the remedy against all war the kindest thing to think of him is that he's not quite sane gwent mused he has been obsessed by the horrible carnage of the great war and disgusted by the utter inefficiency of governments since the armistice and this appalling invention of his is the result the crashing chords of the bridal march from lohengrin put an end to his thoughts for the moment people began to crush and push out of church or stand back on each other's toes to stare at the bride's diamonds 
as she moved very slowly and gracefully down the aisle on the arm of her elderly husband she certainly looked very well and her smile suggested entire satisfaction with herself and the world press cameramen clambered about wherever they could find a footing to catch and perpetuate that smile which when enlarged and reproduced in newspapers would depict the grinning dental display so much associated with woodrow wilson and the prince of wales though more suggestive of a skull than anything else skulls invariably show their teeth we know but it has been left to the modern press cameraman to insist on the death grin in faces that yet live the crowd outside the church was far denser than the crowd within and the fighting and scrambling for points of view became terrific especially when the wedding guests motor cars began to make their way with sundry hoots and snorts through the densely packed mob women screamed some fainted but none thought of giving way to others or retiring from the wild scene of contest gwent judged it wisest to remain within the church portal till the crowd should clear and there safely ensconced he watched the maddened mass of foolish sightseers all of whom had plainly left their daily avocations merely to stare at a man and a woman wedded with whom personally they had nothing whatever to do people talk about unemployment he mused there is enough human material in this one street to make wealth for themselves and the whole community yet they are idle by their own choice if they had anything to do they wouldn't be here he laughed grimly the utter stodginess and stupidity of humanity en masse had of late struck him very forcibly and he found every excuse for the so-called incapacity of governments seeing the kind of folk they are called upon to govern he realized as we all who read history must do that we are no worse and no better than the peoples of the past we are just as hypocritical fraudulent deceptive and cruel as ever they were in legalized torture times and just as ineradicably selfish the pagans practice a religion which they did not truly believe in and so do we all through the ages god has been mocked all through the ages divine vengeance has fallen on the mockers and the mockery and after all thought gwent wars are as necessary as plagues to clear out a superabundant population only most unfortunately nature adopts such recklessness in her methods that it most often happens that the best among us are taken and the worst left i tried to impress this on seaton whose system of destruction would involve the good as well as the bad but these intellectual monsters of scientific appetite have no conscience and no sentiment to prove their theories they would annihilate a continent here a sudden ugly rush of the crowd dangerous to both life and limb pushed him back against the church portal with the force of a tidal wave it was not concerned with the bridal pair who had already driven away in their automobile nor with the wedding guests who were following them to the great hotel where the bride's reception was held it was caused by the wild dash of half a dozen or so unkempt men and boys who tore a passage for themselves through the swaying mob of sightseers waving newspapers aloft and shouting loudly with voices deep and shrill clear and hoarse earthquake in california terrible loss of life thousands dead awful scenes earthquake in california people swayed again then stopped in massed groups some clutching at the newsboys as they ran and buying the papers as fast as they could be sold while all the time above the muffled roar of the city they sent their cries aloft echoing near and far thousands dead awful scenes towns destroyed terrible earthquake in california sam gwent stepped out from the church portal elbowing his way through the confusion the yells of the news vendors rang sharply in his ears and yet for the moment he scarcely grasped their meaning california was the one word that caught him as it were with a hammer stroke then thousands dead 
finding at last an open passage through the dispersing crowd, he went at something of a run after one of the newsboys, and snatched the last paper he had to sell out of his hand. "'What is it?' he demanded as he paid his money. "'Dunno,' the boy replied, breathlessly. "'Spect everybody's dead down California way.' Gwent unfolded the journal and stared at the great headlines, printed in fat black letters, still smelling strongly of printer's ink. Appalling earthquake in California. Mountain upheaval. Towns wiped out. Plaza Hotel engulfed. Frightful loss of life. His eyes grew dim and dazzled. His brain swam. He gazed up unseeingly at the blue sky, the tall skyscraper houses, the sweep of human and vehicular traffic around him, and to his excited fancy the beautiful face of Manella came, like a phantom, between him and all else that was presented to his vision. That face, warm and glowing with woman's tenderness, the splendid dark eyes, aflame with love for a man whose indifference to her only strengthened her adoration, and he seemed to hear the deep, defiant voice of Roger Seaton ringing in his ears. Annihilation! A holocaust of microbes! I would, and could, wipe them off the face of the earth in twenty-four hours. He could, and would. And by heaven, said Gwent within himself, He's done it. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of The Secret Power。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter Twenty Three. Struck by the hand of God, so men say when, after denying God's existence, ail their lives, the seeming solid earth heaves up like a ship on a storm billow, dragging down in its deep recoil their lives and habitations. An earthquake, its irresistible rise and fall, makes human beings more powerless than insects. Their houses and possessions have less stability than the spider's web which swings its frail threads across broken columns in greater safety than any man-made bridge of stone. And terror, mad, hopeless, helpless terror, possesses every creature brought face to face with a dire cruelty of natural forces, which from the very beginning have played havoc with struggling mankind. Struck by the hand of God, and with a merciless blow, all the sunny plains and undulating hills of the beautiful stretch of land in southern California, in the centre of which the Plaza Hotel and Sanatorium had stood, were now unrecognisable. The earth was torn asunder and thrown into vast heaps. Great rocks and boulders were tumbled over each other pell-mell in appalling heights of confusion, and, for miles around, towns, camps and houses were laid in ruins. The scene was one of absolute horror. There was no language to express or describe it. No word of hope or comfort that could be fitly used to lighten the blackness of despair and loss. Gangs of men were at relief work as soon as they could be summoned, and these busied themselves in extricating the dead, and rescuing the dying whose agonised cries and moans reproached a power that made them for such an end. And perhaps as terrible as any other sound was the savage roar and rush of a loosened torrent, which came tearing furiously down from the cleft hills to the lower land, through the great cannon beyond the site where the plaza had stood, a cannon which had become enormously widened by the riving and the rending of the rocks, thus giving free passage to wild waters that had before been imprisoned in a narrow gorge. The persistent rush of the flood filled every inch of space with sound of an awful, even threatening character, suggesting further devastation and death. The men engaged in their dreadful task of lifting crushed corpses from under the stones that had fallen upon them were almost overcome and rendered incapable of work by the appalling clamour which was sufficient to torture the nerves of the strongest, 
and some of them, sickened at the frightful mutilation of the bodies they found, gave up altogether and dropped from sheer fatigue and exhaustion into unconsciousness, despite the heroic encouragement of their director, a man well used to great emergencies. Late afternoon found him still organising and administrating aid, with the assistance of two or three Catholic priests, who went about seeking to comfort and sustain those who were passing the line between. All the energetic helpers were prepared to work all night, delving into the vast suddenly made grave, wherein were tumbled the living with the dead. And it was verging toward sunset, when one of the priests, chancing to raise his eyes from the chaos of earth around him, to the clear and quiet sky, saw what at first he took to be a great eagle, with outspread wings soaring slowly above the scene of devastation. It moved with singular lightness and ease now and then appearing to pause, as though seeking some spot whereon to descend. And after watching it for a minute or two, he called the attention of some of the men around him to its appearance. They looked up warily from their gruesome task of excavating the dead. "'That's an airship,' said one. "'And a big thing, too.' "'An airship!' echoed the priest amazedly, and then was silent, gazing at the shining expanse of sky through which the bird-shaped vessel— made its leisurely way like the vision of a fairy-tale more than any reality. There was something weirdly terrible in the contrast it made, moving so tranquilly through clear space in apparent safety, while down below on the so-called solid earth all nature had been convulsed and overthrown, the wonderful results of human ingenuity, as measured with the remorseless action of natural forces, seemed too startling to be real to the mind of a Spanish priest who, despite all the evidences of triumphant materialism, still clung to the cross, and kept his simple, faithful soul high above the waves that threatened to engulf it. Turning anew to his melancholy duties, he bent over a dying youth just lifted from beneath a weight of stones that had crushed him. The boy's fast-glazing eyes were upturned to the sky. "'See the angel coming,' he whispered thickly. "'Never used to believe in them. But there's one sure enough. Glory!' and his utterance ceased for ever. The priest crossed his hands upon his breast and said a prayer, then again looked up to where the airship floated in the darkening blue. It was now directly over the cannon, immediately above the huge rift made by the earthquake, through which the clamorous rush of the water poured. While he watched it, it suddenly stood still, then dived slowly as though bent on descending into the very depths of the gully. He could not forbear uttering an exclamation, which made all the men about him look in the direction where his own gaze was fixed. "'That airship's going to kingdom come,' said one. "'Nothing can save it, if it takes to nose-diving down there.' They all stared amazed, but the dreadful work on which they were engaged left them no time for consideration of any other matter. The priest watched a few minutes longer, more or less held spellbound with a kind of terror, for he saw that, without doubt, the great vessel was either purposely descending, or being drawn into the vast abyss yawning black beneath it, and that falling thus it must be inevitably doomed to destruction. Whoever piloted it must surely be determined to invite this frightful end to its voyage, for nothing was ever steadier or more resolute than its downward movement towards the whirling waters that rushed through the cannon. All suddenly it disappeared whelmed as it seemed in darkness and the roaring flood, and the watching priest made the sign of the cross in air, murmuring, "'God have mercy on their souls!' Had he been able to see what happened, he might have thought that the confused brain of the dying boy, who had imagined the airship to be an angel, was not so far wrong, for no romancer or teller of wild tales could have pictured a stranger or more unearthly sight than the wonderful white eagle poised at ease amid the tossed-up clouds of spray, flung from the seething mass of waters, while at her prow stood a woman fair as any fabled goddess, a woman reckless of all danger, and keenly on the alert, with bright eyes searching every nook and cranny that could be discerned through the mist. Clear above the roaring torrent, her voice rang like a silver trumpet as she called her instructions to the two men who, equally defying every peril, had ventured on this journey at her command. Rivardi and Gaspar. "'Let her down very gently, inch by inch,' she cried. "'It must be here that we should seek.' In absolute silence they obeyed. 
both had given themselves up for lost and were resigned and ready to meet death at any moment from the first they had made no effort to resist morgana's orders she and they had left sicily at a couple of hours notice and their three days journey across the ocean had been accomplished without adventure or accident at such a speed that it was hardly to be thought of without a thrill of horror no information had been given them as to the object of their long and rapid aerial voyage and only now when the white eagle swooping over california reached the scene of the terrific devastation wrought by the earthquake did they begin to think they had submitted their wills and lives to the caprice of a madwoman however there was no drawing back nothing for it but still to obey for even in the stress and terror naturally excited by their amazing position they did not fail to see that the great airship was steadily controlled and that whatever was the force controlling it it maintained its level its mysterious vibrating discs still throbbing with vital and incessant regularity apparently nothing could disturb its equilibrium or shatter its mechanism and according to its woman designer's command they lowered it gently till it was so to say almost immersed in the torrent and covered with spray indeed morgana's light figure itself at the prow looked like a fair spirit risen from the waters rather than any form of flesh and blood so wreathed and transfigured it was by the dust of the ceaseless foam she stood erect bent on a quest that seemed hopeless watching every eddying curve of the water every flickering ripple her eyes luminous as stars searched the black and riven rocks with an eager passion of discovery when all suddenly as she gazed a thin ray of light pure gold in colour struck sharply like a finger point on a shallow pool immediately below her she looked and uttered a cry beckoning to rivardi come come he hurried to her side gaspard following the pool on which her eyes were fixed was shallow enough to show the pebbly bed beneath the water and there lay apparently two corpses one of a man the other of a woman whose body was half flung across that of the man morgana pointed to them they must be brought up here she said insistently you must lift them we have emergency ropes and pulleys it is easily done why do you hesitate because you demand the impossible said rivardi you send us to death to rescue the already dead she turned upon him with wrath in her eyes you refuse to obey me what a face confronted him white as marble and as terrible in expression as that of a medusa it had a paralyzing effect on his nerves and he shrank and trembled at her glance you refuse to obey me she repeated then if you do i destroy this airship and ourselves in less than two minutes choose obey and live disobey and die he staggered back from her in terror at her looks which gave her a supernatural beauty and authority the fay woman was fay indeed and the powers with which superstition adores the fairy folk seemed now to invest her with irresistible influence choose she reiterated without another word he turned to gaspard who in equal silence got out the ropes and pulleys over which she had spoken the airship stopped dead suspended immovably over the wild waters and almost hidden in spray and though the strange vibrations of its multitudinous discs continued in itself it was fixed as a rock a smile sweet as sunshine after storm changed and softened morgana's features as she saw rivardi swing over the vessel's side to the pool below while gaspard unwound a gear by which he would be able to lift and support the drowned creatures he was bidden to bring that's a true noble she exclaimed i knew your courage would not fail believe me no harm shall come to you inspired by her words he flung himself down and raising the body of the woman first was entangled by the wet thick strands of her long dark hair which like seaweed caught about his feet and hands and impended his movements he had time just to see a face white as marble under the hair then he had enough to do to fasten ropes around the body and push it upward while gaspard pulled both men doubting whether the weight of it would not alter the balance of the airship despite its extraordinary fixity of position morgana bending over from the vessel watched every action she showed neither alarm nor impatience nor anxiety and when gaspard said suddenly it is easier than i thought it would be she merely smiled as if she knew another few moments and the drowned woman's body was hauled into the cabin of the ship 
where Morgana knelt down beside it. Parting the heavy masses of dark hair that enshrouded it, she looked, and saw what she had expected to see, the face of Manella Sorriso. But it was the death-mask of a face, strangely beautiful, but awful in its white rigidity. Morgana bent over it anxiously, but only for a moment— Drawing a small vial from her bosom, she forced a few drops of the liquid it contained between the set lips, and with a tiny syringe injected the same at the pulseless wrist and throat. While she busied herself with these restorative meshes, the second body, that of the man, was landed almost at her feet, and she found herself gazing in a sort of blank stupefaction of what seemed to be the graver image of Roger Seaton. No effigy of stone ever looked colder, harder, greyer than this inert figure of man, uninjured apparently, for there were no visible marks of wounds or bruises upon his features, which appeared frozen into stiff rigidity, but a man as surely dead as death could make him. Morgana heard, as in a far-off dream, the Marchese Rivardi speaking. "'I have done your bidding because it was you who bade,' he said, his voice shaking with the tremor and excitement of his daring effort. "'And it was not so very difficult, but it is a vain rescue.' They are past recall. Morgana looked up from her awed contemplation of Seaton's rigid form. Her eyes were heavy with unshed tears. I think not, she said. There is life in them. Yes, there is life, though for the time it is paralysed. But, here she gave him the loveliest smile of tenderness. You brave Giulio, you are exhausted and wet through. Attend to yourself first. Then you can help me with these unhappy ones. And you, Gaspard. Gaspard, here, madame, you have done so well, she said, without fear or failure. Only by God's mercy, answered Gaspard, if the rope had broken, if the ship had lost balance. She smiled. So many ifs, Gaspard, have I not told you it cannot lose balance, and are not my words proved true? Now we have finished our rescue work, we may go. We can start at once. He looked at her. There is more weight on board, he said meaningly. If we are to carry two dead bodies through the air, it may mean a heavenly funeral for all of us. The white eagle has not been tested for heavy transport. She heard him patiently, then turned to Rivardi and repeated her words. We can start at once, steer upwards and onwards. Like a man hypnotized, he obeyed, and in a few moments the airship, answering easily to the helm, rose lightly as a bubble from the depths of the cannon, through the fiercely dashing showers of spray tossed by the foaming torrent, and soared aloft, high and ever higher, as swiftly as any living bird born for a long and powerful flight. Night was falling, and through the dense purple shadows of the Californian sky, a big white moon rose, bending ghost-like over the scene of destruction and chaos, lighting with a pale glare the tired and haggard faces of the relief men at their terrible work, of digging out the living and the dead from the vast pits of earth, into which they had been suddenly engulfed. While far, far above them flew the white eagle, gradually lessening in size through distance, till it looked no bigger than a dove on its homeward way. Some priests watching by a row of lifeless men, women and children killed in the earthquake, chanted a nonc dimittis, as the evening grew darker, and the only one among them who had first seen the airship over the cannon, where it fell, as it were in the deep gulf surrounded by flood and foam, now raised his eyes in wonderment, as he perceived it once more soaring at liberty towards the moon. "'Surely a miracle!' he ejaculated under his breath. "'An escape from destruction through God's mercy! God be praised!' And he crossed himself devoutly, joining in the solemn chanting of his brethren, kneeling in the moonlight, which threw a ghastly lustre on the dead faces of the victims of the earthquake. Victims not struck by the hand of God, but by the hand of man, and he who was responsible for the blow lay unconscious of having dealt it, and was borne through the air swiftly and safely away, for ever from the tragic scene of ruin and desolation he had himself wrought. End of chapter 23「Secret Power » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Crelly, Chapter 24 A great silence pervaded the Palazzo d'Oro. 
the strained silence of an intense activity weighed with suspense. Servants moved about here and there with noiseless rapidity. Don Aloysius was seen constantly pacing up and down the Lagia, absorbed in anxious thought and prayer, and the Marchese Rivardi came and went on errands of which he alone knew the import. Overhead the sky was brilliantly blue and cloudless. The sun flashed a round shield of dazzling gold all day long on the breast of the placid sea. But within the house blinds were drawn to shade and temper the light for eyes that perhaps might never again open to the blessing and glory of the day. A full week had passed since the white eagle had returned from its long and adventurous flight over the vast stretches of ocean, bearing with it the two human creatures cast down to death in the deep Californian cannon, and only one of them had returned to the consciousness of life. The other still stayed on the verge of the Great Divide. Morgana had safely landed the heavy burden of seeming death her ship had carried, and simply stating to Lady Kingswood and her household staff that it was a case of rescue from drowning, had caused the two corpses, such as they truly appeared, to be laid each in a separate chamber, surrounded with every means that could be devised or thought of for their resuscitation. In an atmosphere glowing with mild warmth on soft beds they were placed, inert and white as frozen clay, their condition being apparently so hopeless that it seemed mere imaginative folly to think that the least breath could ever again part their set lips or the smallest pulsation of blood stir color through their veins. But Morgana never wavered in her belief that they lived, and hour after hour, day after day, she watched with untiring patience, administering the mysterious balm or portion which she kept preciously in her own possession. And not till the fifth day of her vigil when Manella showed faint signs of returning consciousness, did she send to Rome for a famous scientist and physician with whom she had frequently corresponded. She entrusted the dispatch of this message to Rivardi, saying, It is now time for further aid than mine. The girl will recover, but the man, the man is still in the darkness. And her eyes grew heavy with a cloud of sorrow and regret, which softened her delicate beauty and made it more than ever unearthly. "'What are they? What is he to you?' demanded Rivardi jealously. "'My friend, there was a time when I should have considered that question an impertinence from you,' she said, tranquilly. "'But yours is the great share of the rescue, and your magnificent bravery wins you my pardon for many things.' And she smiled as she saw him flush under her quiet gaze. What is this man to me, you ask? Why nothing? Not now. Once he was everything, though he never knew it. Some quality in him struck the keynote of the scale of life for me. He was the great delusion of a dream. The delusion is ended, the dream is over. But for that he was to me, though only in my own thoughts. I've tried to save his life, not for myself, but for the woman who loves him. The woman we rescued with him? The woman who is here? She bent her head in assent. Rivardi's eyes dwelt on her with greater tenderness than he'd ever felt before. She looked so frail and fairy-like, and withal so solitary. He took her little hand and gently kissed it with a courteous reverence. Then, after all, you've known love, he said in a low voice. You've felt what it is, though you've assumed to despise it? My good Gulio. I do despise most heartily what the world generally understands as love, she replied. There's no baser or more selfish sentiment. A sentiment made up half of animal desire and half of a personal seeking for admiration, appreciation, and self-gratification. Yes, Gulio, it is so, and I despise it for all these attributes. In truth, it is not what I understand or accept as love at all. What do you understand and accept? he asked softly. Her eyes shone kindly as she raised them to his face. Not what you can ever give, Gulio, she said. Love, to my mind, is the spiritual part of our being. It should be the complete union of two souls that move as one, like the two wings of a bird making the body subservient to the highest flights, even as far as heaven. The physical mating of man and woman is seldom higher than the physical mating of any other animals under the sun. 
The animals know nothing beyond, but we, we ought to know something. She paused, then went on. There is sometimes a great loftiness, even in the physical way of so-called love, such passion as the woman we have rescued has for the man she was ready to die with. A primitive passion of primitive women at her best. Such feeling is out of date in these days. We have passed that boundary line. And a great unexplored world lies open before us. Who can say what we may find there? Perhaps we shall discover what all women have sought from the beginning of things. And that is, he asked, happiness, she replied, the perfect happiness of life and love. He'd held her hand till now when he released it. I wish I could give it to you, he said. You cannot, Gulio. I'm not made for any man, as men go. It is a pity you think so, he said, for, after all, you are just a woman. Am I? she murmured, and a strange flitting smile brightened her features. Perhaps, and yet, perhaps not. Who knows? She left him puzzled and uneasy. Somehow she always managed to evade his efforts to become more intimate in his relations with her. Generous and kind-hearted as she was, she held him at a distance, and maintained her own aloof position inexorably. A less intelligent man than Rivardi would have adopted the cynic's attitude and averred that a rejection of love and marriage arose from her own lovableness and unmarriageableness, but he knew better than that. He was wise enough to perceive the rareness and delicacy of her physical and mental organization and temperament, a temperament so finely strung as to make all other women seem gross and material beside her. He felt and knew her to be both his moral and intellectual superior, and this very fact rendered it impossible that he could ever master her mind and tame it down to the subservience of married life. That dauntless spirit of hers would never bend to an inferior. Not even love, if she could feel it, would move her thus far. And the man she had adventured to cross ocean to rescue, what was he? She confessed that she had loved him, although the love was past. And now she'd set herself to watch night and day by his dead body, for dead he surely was, in Rivardi's opinion sparing no pains to recover what seemed beyond recovery, while one of the greatest mysteries of the whole mysterious affair was just this. How had she known the man's life was in danger? All these questions Rivardi discussed with Don Aloysius, who listened to him patiently without committing himself to any reply. Whatever Morgana had confided to him, and she would confided much, he kept his own counsel. Within forty-eight hours of Morgana's summons, the famous specialist from Rome, Professor Marco Ardini, noted all over the world for his miraculous cures of those whom other physicians had given up as past curing, arrived. He heard the story of the rescue of a man and woman from drowning with emotionless gravity, more taken for the moment by Morgana herself, whom he'd never seen before with whom he had corresponded on current questions of scientific importance. From the extremely learned and incisive tone of her letters, he had judged her to be an elderly woman of profound scholarship, who had spent the greater part of her life in study, and his astonishment at the sight of the small, dainty creature who received him in the library of the Plaza d'Oro was beyond all verbal expression. In fact, he took some minutes to recover from the magnetic shock of her blue eyes and wistful smile. I must be quite frank with you, she said, after a preliminary conversation with the great man in his own Italian tongue. These two people have suffered their injuries by drowning, but not altogether. They are the victims of an earthquake, and were thrown by the earth's upheaval into a deep chasm flooded with water. The professor interrupted her. Pardon, signora, there's been no recent earthquake in Europe. She gave a little gesture of assent. Not in Europe, no, but in America. In California, there's been a terrible one. In California? He echoed amazingly. Gran Dio! You do not mean to say that you brought these people from California across that vast extent of ocean? She smiled. By airship, yes. Really nothing so very remarkable. You will not ask for further details just now, Professor and she laid her pretty hand coaxingly on his arm. You and I both know how advisable it is to say as little as possible of our own work or adventures, 
while any subject is awaiting treatment and every moment counts. I will answer any question you may ask when you've seen my patients. The girl is a beautiful creature. She's beginning to regain consciousness. But the man, I fear, is past even your skill. Come. She led the way, and Professor Ardini followed, marveling at her ethereal grace and beauty, and more than interested in the case on which his opinion was sought. Entering a beautiful room, glowing with light and warmth and color, he saw, lying on a bed and slightly propped up by pillows, a lovely girl, pale as ivory, with dark hair loosely braided on either side of her head. Her eyes were closed, and the long black lashes swept the cheeks in a curved fringe. The lips were faintly red, and the breath parted them slowly and reluctantly. The professor bent over her and listened. Her heart beat slowly but regularly. He felt her pulse. She will live, he said. There are no injuries? None, Morgana replied, as he put his questions. Some few bruises, but no bones broken, nothing serious. You have examined her? Yes. You have no nurses? No. I and my house people are sufficient. Her tone became slightly peremptory. There's no need for outside interference. Whatever your orders are, they shall be carried out. He looked at her. His face was a somewhat severe one, furrowed with thought and care. But when he smiled, a wonderful benevolence gave it an almost handsome effect. And he smiled now. You shall not be interfered with, he said. You have done very well. Complete rest, nourishment, and your care are all that this patient needs. She will be quite herself in a very short time. She is extraordinarily beautiful. I wish you could see her eyes, said Morgana, almost as if the uttered wish had touched some recess of her stunned brain. Manella's eyelids quivered and lifted. The great dark glory of the stars of her soul shone forth for an instant, giving sudden radiance to the pallor of her features. Then they closed again as in utter weariness. Magnificent, said Ardini, under his breath, and full of the vital light. She will live. And she will love added Morgana softly. The professor looked at her inquiringly. The man she loves is in the next room, she continued. We rescued him with her. If it can be called a rescue, he's the worst case. Only you may be able to bring him back to consciousness. I've done my best in vain. If you fail, then we must give up hope. She preceded him into the adjoining chamber. As he entered it after her, he paused, almost intimidated despite his long medical and surgical experience, by the stone-like figure of man that lay before him. It was as if one should have unearthed a statue gray with time, a statue nobly formed, with a powerful head and the severe features sternly set, the growth of beard revealing rather than concealing the somewhat cruel contour of mouth and chin. The professor walked slowly up to the bed and looked at this strange effigy of a human being for many minutes in silence, Morgana watching him with strained but quiet suspense. Presently he touched the forehead, it was stone cold, then the throat, stone cold and rigid. He bent down and listened for the heart's pulsations, not a flutter, not a beat. Drawing back from this examination, he looked at Morgana. She met his eyes with the query in her own, which she emphasized by the spoken word. Dead? No, he answered, I think not. It is very difficult for a man of this type to die at all. Granted favorable conditions and barring accidents caused by the carelessness of others, he ought to be one of those destined to live forever. But, here he hesitated, if I'm right in my surmise, of course it is only a first opinion. Death would be the very best thing for him. Oh, why do you say that? She asked pitifully. Because the brain is damaged, hopelessly, this man, whoever he is, has been tampering with some chemical force he does not entirely understand. His whole body is charged with its influence. And this it is that gives his form its unnatural appearance, which, though death-like, is not death. If I leave him alone and untouched, he will probably expire unconsciously in a few days. But if... After what I've just told you, you wish me to set the life atoms going again, 
even as a clock is wound up, I can relax the tension which now paralyzes the cells, muscles, and nerves, and he will live, yes, like most people without brains, he will live a long time, probably too long. Morgana moved to the bedside and gazed with a solemn earnestness at the immobile, helpless form stretched out before her, as though ready for burial. Her heart swelled with suppressed emotion. She thought with anguish of the brilliant brain, the strong, self-sufficient nature brought to such ruin through too great an estimate of human capability. Tears rushed to her eyes. Oh, give him life, she whispered. Give him life for the sake of the woman who loves him more than life. The professor gave her a quick, keen glance. You? She shivered at the question as though struck by a cold wind. Then, conquering the momentary weakness, answered, No, the girl you've just seen. He is her world. Ardini's brows met in a saturn frown. Her world would be an empty one, he said with an expressive gesture. A world without fruit or flower, without light or song. A dreary world. But such as it is, such as it is bound to be, it can live on a life and death. Are you quite sure of this? Morgana asked. Can any of us, however wise, be quite sure of anything? His frown relaxed and his whole features softened. He took her hand and patted it kindly. Signora, you know as I do, that the universe and all within it represents law and order. A man is a little universe in himself, and if the guiding law of his system is destroyed, there is chaos and darkness. We scientists can say, let there be light, but the fulfilled result, and there was light, comes from God alone. Why should not God help in this case, she suggested. Ah, why? And Ardini shrugged his shoulders. How can I tell? My long experience has taught me that wherever the law has been broken, God does not help. Who knows whether this frozen wreck of man has obeyed or disobeyed the law. I can do all that science allows. And you will do it, interrupted Margana eagerly. You will use your best skill and knowledge. Everything you wish shall be at your service. Name whatever fee your merit claims. He raised his hand with a deprecatory gesture. Money does not count with me, Signora, he said, nor with you. The point with both of us in all our work is success. Is it not so? Yes, and it is because I do not see a true success in this case that I hesitate. True success would mean the complete restoration of this man to life and intelligence. But life without intelligence is no triumph for science. I can do all that science will allow, and you will do this all, said Morgana eagerly. You will forgo triumph for simple pity, pity for the girl who would surely die if he were dead, and perhaps after all God may help the recovery. It shall be as you wish, Signora. I must stay here two or three days. As long as you find it necessary, said Morgana, all your orders shall be obeyed. Good. Send me a trustworthy man-servant who can help to move and support the patient, and we can get to work. I left a few necessary appliances in your hall. I should like them brought into this room, and then, here he took her hand and pressed it kindly. You can leave us to our task and take some rest. You must be very tired. I am never tired, she answered gently. I thank you in advance for all you're going to do. She left the room then with one backward glance at the inert, stiff figure on the bed and went to arrange matters with her household that the professor's instructions should be strictly carried out. Lady Kingswood, deeply interested, heard her giving certain orders and asked, There is hope, then? Those two poor creatures will live? I think so, answered Morgana with a thrill of sadness in her sweet voice. They will live. Pray God their lives may be worth living. She watched the man's servant who she had chosen to wait on Ardini depart on his errand. She saw him open the door of the room where Seaton lay, and shut it. Then there was a silence. Oppressed by a sudden heaviness of heart, she thought of Manila, and entered her apartment softly to see how she fared. The girl's beautiful dark eyes were wide open, and full of the light of life and consciousness. She smiled and stretched out her arms. It is my angel, she murmured faintly. My little white angel who came to me in the darkness, 
and this is heaven. Swiftly and silently Morgana went to her side, and taking her outstretched arms, put them round her own neck. Manila, she said tenderly, dear beautiful Manila, do you know me? The great loving eyes rested on her with glowing warmth and pleasure. Indeed I know you, and Manila's voice, weak as that of a sick child, sounded ever so far away. The little white lady of my dreams, oh, I've wanted you, wanted you so much, why do you not come back sooner? Afraid to trouble her brain by the sudden shock of two rapidly recurring memories, Morgana made no reply, but merely soothed her with tender caresses, when all at once she made a violent struggle to rise from the bed. I must go, she cried. He's calling me. I must follow him. Yes, even if he kills me for it, he's in danger. Morgana held her close and firmly. Hush, hush, dear, she murmured. Be quite still. He's safe, believe me. He's near you, in the next room, out of all danger. Oh, no, it is not possible. And the girl's eyes grew wild with terror. He cannot be safe. He's destroying himself. I've followed him every step of the way. I've watched him, oh, so long. He came out of the hut this morning. I was hidden among the trees. He could not see me. She broke off, and a violent trembling shook her whole body. Morgana tried to calm her into silence, but she went on rambling incoherently. There was something he carried as though it was precious to him, something that glittered like gold, and he went away quickly, quickly to the canyon. I followed him like a dog, crawling through the brushwood. I followed him across the deep water, to the cave where it was all dark, black as midnight. She paused, then suddenly flung her arms round Morgana, crying, Oh, hold me, hold me. I'm in this darkness trying to find him. There, there. He turns and sees me by the light of a lamp he carries. He knows I have followed him, and he is angry. Oh, dear God, he is angry. He raises his arm to strike me. She uttered a smothered shriek and clung to Morgana in a kind of frenzy. No mercy, no pity. That thing that glitters in his hand, it frightens me. What is it? I kneel to him on the cold stones. I pray him to forgive me, to come with me. But his arm is still raised to strike. He does not care. Here a pale horror blanched her features. She drew herself away from Morgana's hold and put out her hands with the instinctive gesture of one who tries to escape falling from some great height. Morgana, alarmed at her looks, caught her again in her arms and held her tenderly, whereat a faint smile hovered on her lips, and her distraught movements ceased. What is this? she asked, then murmured. My little white lady, how did you come here? How did you cross the flood unless on wings? Ah, you were a fairy, and you can do all you wish to do. But you cannot save him. It is too late. He will not save himself, and he does not care. He does not care, neither for me nor you. She drooped her head against Morgana's shoulder, and her eyes closed in utter exhaustion. Morgana laid her back gently on her pillows, and pouring a few drops of the cordial she had used before, and of which she had the sole secret into a wine glass full of water, held it to her lips. She drank it obediently, evidently conscious now that she was being cared for. But she was still restless, and presently she sat up in a listening attitude, one hand uplifted. Listen, she said in a low, odd tone. Thunder, do you hear it? God speaks. She lay down again passively and was silent for a long time. The hours passed, and the day grew into late afternoon, and Morgana, patiently watchful, thought she slept. All suddenly she sprang up, wide-eyed and alert. What was that? she cried. I heard him call. Morgana, startled by her swift movement, stood transfixed, listening. The deep tones of a man's voice rang out loudly and defiantly. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. I say so. I am master of the world. End of chapter 24《The Secret Power》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Secret Power》by Marie Corelli Chapter 25 A brilliant morning broke over the flower-filled gardens of the Palazzo d'Oro, 
and the sea stretched out in a wide radiance of purest blue shimmered with millions of tiny silver ripples brushed on its surface by a light wind as delicate as a bird's wing morgana stood in a rose marble legia looking with a pathetic wistfulness at the beauty of the scene and beside her stood marco ardini scientist surgeon and physician looking also but scarcely seeing his whole thought being concentrated on the case with which he had been dealing it is exactly as i first told you he said the man is strong in muscle and sinew but his brain is ruined it can no longer control or command the body's mechanism therefore the body is practically useless power of volition is gone the poor fellow will never be able to walk again or to lift a hand a certain faculty of speech is left but even this is limited to a few words which are evidently the result of the last prevailing thoughts impressed on the brain cells it is possible he will repeat those words thousands of times the oftener he repeats them the more he will like to say them what are they morgana asked in a tone of sorrow and compassion strange enough for a man in his condition replied ardini and always the same there shall be no more wars there can be none i say it I only, it is my great secret, I am master of the world. Poor devil, what a master of the world is there? Morgana shuddered as with cold, shading her eyes from the radiant sunshine. Does he say nothing else? she murmured. Is there no name, no place that he seems to remember? He remembers nothing, he knows nothing, answered Ardini. He does not even realize me as a man. I might be a fish or a serpent for all his comprehension. One glance at his moveless eyes is enough to prove that. They are like pebbles in his head, without cognizance or expression. He mutters the words great secret over and over again, and tacks it on to the other phrase of no more wars, in a semi-conscious sort of gabble. This is, of course, the disordered action of the brain working to catch up and join together hopelessly severed fragments. Morgana lifted her sea-blue eyes and looked with grave appeal into the severely intellectual, half-frowning face of the great professor. "'Is there no hope of an ultimate recovery?' she asked. "'With time and rest and the best of unceasing care, might not this poor brain right itself?' "'Medically and scientifically speaking, there is no hope, none whatever,' he replied. "'Though of course we all know that nature's remedial methods are inexhaustible.' and often to the wisest of us seem miraculous, because as yet we do not understand one tithe of her processes. But in this case, this strange and terrible case, and he uttered the words with marked gravity, it is nature's own force that has wrought the damage. Some powerful influence which the man has been testing has proved too much for him, and it has taken its own vengeance. Morgana heard this with strained interest and attention. "'Tell me just what you mean,' she said. "'There is something you do not quite express, or else I am too slow to understand.' Ardini took a few paces up and down the Lagia, and then halted, facing her in the attitude of a teacher preparing to instruct a pupil. "'Signora,' he said, "'when you began to correspond with me some years ago from America, I realized that I was in touch with a highly intelligent and cultivated mind. I took you to be many years older than you are with a ripe scientific experience. I find you young, beautiful, and pathetic in the pure womanliness of your nature, which must be perpetually contending with an indomitable power of intellectuality and of spirituality. Spirituality is the strongest force of your being. You are not made like other women. This being so, I can say to you what other women would not understand. Science is my life subject, as it is yours. It is a window set open in the universe, admitting great light. But many of us foolishly imagine that this light emanates from ourselves as a result of our own cleverness, whereas it comes from that divine source of all things which we call God. We refuse to believe this. It wounds our pride. And we use the discoveries of science recklessly and selfishly, without gratitude, humbleness, or reverence. So it happens that the first tendency of godless men is to destroy. The love of destruction and torture shows itself in the boy who tears off the wing of an insect, or kills a bird for the pleasure of killing. 
the boy is father of the man and we come after much ignorant denial and obstinacy back to the inexorable truth that they who take the sword shall perish with the sword if we consider the sword as a metaphor for every instrument of destruction we shall see this force of its application the submarine for example built for the most treacherous kind of sea warfare how often they that undertake its work are slain themselves and so it is through the whole gamut of scientific discovery when it is used for inhuman and unlawful purposes when this same sword is lifted to put an end to torture disease and the manifold miseries of life then the power that has entrusted it to mankind endows it with a blessing and there are no evil results I say this to you by way of explaining the view I am forced to take of this man whose strange case you ask me to deal with. My opinion is that, through chance or intention, he has been playing recklessly with a great natural force, which he has not entirely understood for some destructive purpose, and that it has recoiled on himself. Morgana looked him steadily in the eyes. You may be right, she said. He is, or was, one of the most brilliant of our younger scientists. You know his name. I have sent you from New York some accounts of his work. He is Roger Seaton, whose experiments in the condensation of radioactivity startled America some four or five years ago. Roger Seaton? he exclaimed. What? The man who professed to have found a new power which would change the face of the world? He, this wreck, this blind deaf lump of breathing clay? Surely he has not fallen on so horrible a destiny. Tears rushed to Morgana's eyes. She could not answer. She could only bend her head in assent. Profoundly moved, Ordini took her hand and kissed it with sympathetic reverence. Signora, he said, this is indeed a tragedy. You've saved this life, and I know not what risk to yourself. And as I am aware what a life of great attainment it promised to be, you may be sure I will spare no pains to bring it back to normal conditions. But frankly, I do not think it will be possible. There is the woman who loves him. Her influence may do something. If he ever loved her, yes. And Morgana smiled rather sadly. But if he did not, if the love is all on her side... Ardini shrugged his shoulders. A great love is always on the woman's side, he said. Men are too selfish to love perfectly. In this case, of course, there's no emotion, no sentiment of any sort left in the mere hulk of a man. But still, I will continue my work and do my best. He left her then, and she stood for a while alone, gazing far out to the blue sea and sunlight, scarcely seeing them for the half-unconscious tears that blinded her eyes. Suddenly a ray, not of the sun, shot athwart the Lagia and touched her with a deep gold radiance. She saw it and looked up, listening. Morgana. The voice quivered along the ray like the touch string of an Aeolian harp. She answered it in almost a whisper. I hear. You grieve for sorrows not your own, said the voice, and we love you for it. But you must not waste your tears on the errors of others. Each individual spirit makes its own destiny, and no other but itself can help itself. You are one of the chosen and beloved. You must fulfill the happiness you have created for your own soul. Come to us soon. A thrill of exquisite joy ran through her. I will, she said, when my duties here are done. The golden ray decreased in length and brilliancy and finally died away in a fine haze mingling with the air. She watched it till it vanished. Then, with a sense of relief from her former sadness, she went into the house to see Manella. The girl had risen from her bed, and with the assistance of Lady Kingswood, who tended her with motherly care, had been arrayed in a loose white woolen gown, which carelessly gathered round her, intensified by contrast, the striking beauty of her dark eyes and hair, and ivory pale skin. As Morgana entered the room, she smiled, her small, even teeth gleaming like tiny pearls in the faint rose of her pretty mouth, and stretched out her hand. What has he said to you? she asked. Tell me, 
Is he not glad to see you? To know he is with you? Safe with you in your home? Morgana sat down beside her. Dear Manella, she answered gently and with tenderest pity. He does not know me. He knows nothing. He speaks a few words, but he has no consciousness of what he's saying. Manella looked at her wonderingly. Ah, that is because he is not himself yet, she said. The crash of the rocks, the pouring of the flood. This was enough to kill him. But he will recover in a little while, and he will know you. Yes, he will know you, and he will thank God for life to see you. Her unselfish joy in the idea that the man she loved would soon recognize the woman he preferred to herself was profoundly touching, and Morgana kissed the hand she held. Dear, I am afraid he will never know anything more in this world, she said sorrowfully. Neither man nor woman, nor can he thank God for a life which he will be long living death, unless you can help him. I, and Manila's eyes dilated with brilliant eagerness, I will give my life for his. What can I do? And then, with patient slowness and gentleness, little by little, Morgana told her all. Lady Kingswood, sitting in an armchair near the window, worked at her embroidery, furtive tears dropping now and again on the delicate pattern, as she heard the details of the tragic verdict given by one of Europe's greatest medical scientists on the hopelessness of ever repairing the damage wrought by the shock which had shaken a powerful brain into ruins. But it was wonderful to watch Manella's face as she listened. Sorrow, pity, tenderness, love, all in turn flashed their heavenly radiance in her eyes and intensified her beauty. And when she'd heard all, she smiled as some lovely angel might smile on a repentant soul. Her whole frame seemed to vibrate with a passion of unselfish emotion. He will be my care, she said. The good God has heard my prayers and given him to me to be all mine. She clasped her hands in kind of ecstasy. My life is for him and him alone. He will be my little child, this big, strong, poor, broken man, and I will nurse him back to himself. I will watch for every little sign of hope. He shall learn to see through my eyes, to hear through my ears, to remember all that he has forgotten. Her voice broke in a half sob. Morgana put an arm around her. Manella, Manella, she said. You do not know what I say. You cannot understand the responsibility. It would make you a prisoner for life. Oh, I understand. And Manella shook back her dark hair with the little proud, decisive gesture characteristic of her temperament. Yes, and I wish to be so imprisoned. If we'd not been rescued by you, we should have died together. Now you will help us to live together, will you not? You are a little white angel, a fairy, yes. To me you are. Your heart is full of unspent love. You will let me stay with him always, always, as his nurse, his servant, his slave? Morgana looked at her tenderly, touched to the quick by her eagerness and her beauty, now intensified by the glow of excitement which gave a roseate warmth to her cheeks and deeper darkness to her eyes. All ignorant and unsuspecting as she was of the world's malignity and cruel misjudgments, how could it be explained to her that a woman of such youth and loveliness, electing to dwell alone with a man, even if the man were a hopeless paralytic, would make herself the subject of a malicious comment and pitiless scandal? Some reflection of this feeling showed itself in the expression of Morgana's face while she hesitated to answer holding the girl's hand in her own and stroking it affectionately the while. Manella, gazing at her as a worshipper might gaze at a sacred picture, instinctively divined her thought. Ah, I know what you would say, she exclaimed, that I might bring shame to him by my companionship. Oh, as yes, that is possible. Wicked people would talk of him and judge him wrongly. Oh, Medella, dear, murmured Morgana. Not him, not him, but you. Me? She tossed back her wealth of hair and smiled. What am I? Just a bit of dust in his path. I am nothing at all. I do not care what anybody says or thinks of me. What should it matter? But see, to save him, let me be his wife. His wife? 
Morgana repeated the words in amazement, and Lady Kingswood, laying down her work, gazed at the two beautiful women, the one so spirit-like and fair, the other so human and queenly, in a kind of stupefaction, wondering if she had heard all right. His wife, yes. Manella spoke with a thrill of exultation in her voice, and she caught Morgana's hand and kissed it fondly. His wife, it is the only way I can be his slave woman. Let me marry him while he knows nothing, so that I may have the right to wait upon him and care for him. He shall never know, for if he comes to himself again, please God he will. As soon as that happens, I will go away at once. He will never know. He shall never learn who it is that has cared for him. You see, I shall never really be his wife, nor he my husband, only in name. And then, when he comes out of the darkness, when he is strong and well once more, he will go to you, you whom he loves. Morgana silenced her by a gesture which was at once commanding and sweetly austere. Dear girl, he never loved me, she said gently. He's always loved himself. Yes, you know that as well as I do. Once I fancied I loved him, but now I know my way of love is not his. Let us say no more of it. You wish to be his wife? Do you think what that means? He will never know he is your husband, never recognize you. Your life will be sacrificed to a helpless creature whose brain is gone, who will be unconscious of your care and utterly irresponsive. Oh, sweet, too loving Manella, you must not pledge the best years of your youth and beauty to such a destiny. Manella's dark eyes flashed with passionate ardor and enthusiasm. I must, I must, she said. It is the work God gives me to do. Do you not see how it is with me? It is my one love, the best of my heart, the pulse of my life, youth and beauty. What are they without him? Ill or well, he is all I care for. And if I may not care for him, I will die. It is quite easy to die, to make an end. But if there is any youth or beauty to spend, it will be better to spend it on love than on death. My white angel, listen and be patient with me. You are patient, but still be more so. You know there will be none in the world to care for him. Ah, when he was well and strong, he said that love would weary him. He did not think he would ever be helpless and ill. Ah, no. But a broken brain is put away, out of sight, to be forgotten like a broken toy. He was at work on some wonderful invention, some great secret. It will never be known now. Not a soul will ever ask what has become of it or of him. The world does not care what becomes of anyone. It has no sympathy. Only those who love greatly have any pity. She clasped her hands and lifted them in an attitude of prayer, laying them against Morgana's breast. You will let me have my way, surely you will, she pleaded. You are a little angel of mercy, unlike any other woman I ever saw, so white and pure and sweet. You understand it all. In his dreadful weakness and loneliness, God gives him to me. Happy me, who am young and strong enough to care for him and attend upon him. I have no money, perhaps he has none either, but I will work to keep him. I am clever at my needle. I can embroider quite well, and I will manage to earn enough for us both. Her voice broke in a sob, and Morgana, the tears falling from her own eyes, drew her into a close embrace, and she murmured plaintively again, his wife, I must be his wife, his serving woman. Then no one can forbid me to be with him. You will find some good priest to say the marriage service for us and give us God's benediction. It will mean nothing to him because he cannot know or understand. But to me it will be a holy sacrament. Then she broke down and wept softly till the pent-up passion of her heart was relieved. And Morgana, mastering her own emotion, had soothed her into quietude. Leaning back from her armchair where she'd rested since rising from her bed, she looked up with an anxious appeal in her lovely eyes. Let me tell you something before I forget it again, she said. It is something terrible, the earthquake. Yes, yes, do not think of it now, said Morgana hastily, 
afraid that her mind would wander into a painful mazes of recollection. That is all over. Ah, yes, but you should know the truth. It was not an earthquake, she persisted. It was not God's doing, it was His work. And she indicated by a gesture the next room where Roger Seaton lay. A cold horror ran through Morgana's blood. His work. The widespread ruin of villages and townships. The devastation of a vast tract of country. The deaths of hundreds of men, women, and little children. His work? Could it be possible? She stood transfixed while Manila went on. I know it was his work, she said. I was warned by a friend of his who came to La Plaza that he was working at something which might lose him his life. And so I watched. I told you how I followed him that morning, how I saw him looking at a box full of shining things that glittered like the points of swords, how he put this box in a case and then in a basket, and slung the basket over his shoulder, and went down into the cannon, and then to the cave where I found him. I called him, he heard, and held up a miner's lamp and saw me. Then, then, oh dear God, then he cursed me for following him. He raised his arm to strike me, and in his furious haste to reach me he slipped on the wet mossy stones. Something fell from his hand with a great crash like thunder, and there was a sudden glare of fire. Oh, the awfulness of that sound and that flame! And the rocks rose up and split asunder. The ground shook and broke under me, and I remember no more, no more till I found myself here, here with you. Morgana roused herself from the stupefaction of horror with which she had listened to this narration. Do not think of it any more, she said in a low, sad voice. Try to forget it all. Yes, dear, try to forget all the mad selfishness and cruelty of the man you love. Poor besotted soul, he has a bitter punishment. She could say no more then. Stooping, she kissed the girl on the white forehead between the rippling waves of dark hair and strove to meet the searching eyes with a smile. Dear beautiful angel, will you help me? Manella pleaded. You will help me to be his wife? And Morgana answered with pitiful tenderness. I will. And with a sign to Lady Kingswood to come nearer and sit by the girl, as she lay among her pillows more or less exhausted, she herself left the room. As she opened the door on her way out, the strong voice of Roger Seaton rang out with singularly horrible harshness. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. I say it. My great secret. I am master of the world. Shuddering as she heard, she pressed her hands over her ears and hurried along the corridor. Her thoughts paraphrased the saying of Madame Roland on Liberty. O oh, science, what crimes are committed in thy name? She was anxious to see and speak with Professor Ardini, but came upon the Marchese Rivardi instead, who met her at the door of the library and caught her by both hands. What is all this? he demanded insistently. I must speak to you. You have been weeping. What is troubling you? She drew her hands gently away from his. Nothing, Giulio, and she smiled kindly. I grieve for the griefs of others quite uselessly, but I cannot help it. There is no hope, then, he said. None, not for the man, she replied. His body will live, but his brain is dead. Rivardi gave an expressive gesture. Horrible. Better he should die. Yes, far better. But the girl loves him. She is an ardent Spanish creature. Warm-hearted and simple as a child. She believes. And Morgana's eyes had a pathetic wistfulness. She believes, as all women believe when they love for the first time, that love has a divine power next to that of God, that it will work miracles of recovery when all seems lost. The disillusion comes, of course, sooner or later, but it has to come of itself, not through any other influence. She, Manella Ceriso, has resolved to be his wife. Grand deal! Rivardi started back in utter astonishment. His wife? That girl? Young, beautiful? She will chain herself to a madman? Surely you will not allow it. 
Morgana looked at him with a smile. Poor Giulio, she said softly. You are a most unfortunate descendant of your Roman ancestors, as far as we women are concerned. You fall in love with me, and you find I am not for you. Then you see a perfectly lovely woman who you cannot choose but admire, and a little stray thought comes flying into your head, yes, quite involuntarily, that perhaps, only perhaps, her love might come your way. Do not be angry, my friend. It was only a thought that moved you when you saw her the other day, when I called you to look at her as she recovered consciousness and lay on her bed like a sleeping figure of the loveliest of pagan goddesses. What man could have seen her thus without a thrill of tenderness? And now you have to hear that all that beauty and warmth of youthful life is to be sacrificed to a stone idol. For the man she worships is little more. Ah, yes, I am sorry for you, Giulio but can do nothing to prevent the sacrifice. Indeed, I have promised to assist it. Rivardi had alternately flushed and paled while she spoke. Her keen, incisive probing of his most secret fancies puzzled and vexed him. But with a well-assumed indifference, he waved aside her delicately pointed suggestions, as though he had scarcely heard them, and said, You have promised to assist? Can you reconcile it to your conscience to let this girl make herself a prisoner for life? I can, she answered quietly, for if she is opposed in her desire for such imprisonment, she will kill herself. So it is wisest to let her have her way. The man she loves so desperately may die at any moment, and then she will be free. But meanwhile, she will have the consolation of doing all she can for him, and the hope of helping him to recover vain hope as it may be, there is a divine unselfishness in it, for she says that if he is restored to health, she will go away at once and never let him know she is his wife. Rivardi's handsome face expressed utter incredulity. Will she keep her word, I wonder? She will. Marvelous woman. And there was bitterness in his tone. But women are all amazing when you come to know them. In love, in hate, in good and evil, in cleverness, and in utter stupidity, they are wonderful creatures. And you, Amicabella, are perhaps the most wonderful of them all. So kind and yet so cruel. Cruel? she echoed. Yes, to me. She looked at him and smiled. That smile gave such a dreamy, spirit-like sweetness to her whole personality that for the moment she seemed to float before him like an aerial vision rather than a woman of flesh and blood. And the bold desire which possessed him to seize and clasp her in his arms was checked by a sense of something like fear. Her eyes rested on his with a full, clear frankness. If I am cruel to you, my friend, she said gently, it is only to be more kind. She left him then and went out. He saw her small, elfin figure pass among the chains of roses, which at this season seemed to tie up the garden in brilliant knots of color, and then go down the terraces one by one towards the monastic retreat half buried among pine and olive, where Don Aloysius governed his little group of religious brethren. He guessed her intent. She will tell him all, he thought, and with his strange semi-religious, semi-scientific notions, it will be easy for her to persuade him to marry the girl to this demented creature who fills the house with his shouting, There shall be no more wars. I should never have thought her more capable of tolerating such a crime. He turned to leave the Legia, but paused as he perceived Professor Ardini advancing from the interior of the house, his hands clasped behind his back, and his furrowed brows bent in gloomy meditation. You have a difficult case, he queried. More than difficult, replied Ardini. Beyond human skill. Perhaps not beyond the mysterious power we call God. Rivardi shrugged his shoulders. He was a skeptic of skeptics, and his modern world experiences had convinced him that what man could not do was not to be done at all. The latest remedy proposed by the Signora is love, he said carelessly. The girl who is here, Manila Ceriso, has made up her mind to be the wife of this unfortunate. 
Ardini gave an expressive gesture. Altro! If she has made up her mind, heaven itself will not move her. It will be a sublime sacrifice of one life for another. What would you? Such sacrifices are common, though the world does not hear of them. In this instance, there is no one to prevent it. You approve? You tolerate it? exclaimed Rivardi angrily. I have no power to approve or to tolerate, replied the scientist coldly. The matter is not one in which I have any right to interfere. Nor, I think, have you. I have stated such facts as exist, that the man's brain is practically destroyed, but that owing to the strength of the life centers he will probably exist in his present condition for a full term of years. To keep him so alive will entail considerable care and expense. He will need a male nurse, probably two, food of the best and absolutely tranquil surroundings. If the signora, who is rich and generous, guarantees these necessities, and the girl who loves him desires to be his wife under such terrible conditions, I do not see how anyone can object to the marriage. Then he poor devil of a man will be married without his knowledge, and probably if he had his senses against his will, said Rivardi. Ardini bent his brows yet more frowningly. Just so, he answered, but he has neither knowledge nor will, nor is he likely ever to have them again. These great attributes of the God and man have been taken from him, power and will, will and power, the two wings of the soul. They are gone, probably forever. Science can do nothing to bring them back, but I will not deny the possibility of other forces which might work a remedy on this rune of a master of the world, as he calls himself. Therefore, I say, let the love woman try her best. End of chapter 25Twenty six of the Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter twenty six. Don Aloysius sat in his private library, a room little larger than a monastic cell, and at his feet knelt Morgana like a child at prayer. The rose and purple glow of the sunset fell aslant through a high royal window of painted glass, shedding an aureole round her golden head, and intensified the fine, dark, intellectual outline of the priest's features as he listened with fixed attention to the soft, pure voice, vibrating with tenderness and pity as she told him of the love that sought to sacrifice itself for love's sake only. In your creed and in mine, she said, there is no union which is real or binding save the spiritual, and this may be consummated in some way beyond our knowledge, when once the sacred rite is said. You need no explanation from me, you who are a member and future denizen of the Golden City, you who are set apart to live long after these poor human creatures have passed away with the unthinking millions of the time, and you can have no hesitation to unite them as far as they can be united so that they may at least be saved from the malicious tongues of an always evil-speaking world. You once asked me to tell you of the few moments of real happiness I've known. This will be one of the keenest joys to me if I can satisfy this loving-hearted girl and aid her to carry out her self-chosen martyrdom, and you must help me. Gently, Eliseus laid his hand on her bent head. It will indeed be a martyrdom, he said slowly long and torturing. Think well of it. A woman, youthful and beautiful, chained to a mere breathing image of man, a creature who cannot recognize either persons or objects, who is helpless to move, and who will remain in that pitiable state all his life, if he lives. Dear child, are you convinced there is no other way? Not for her, Morgana replied. She has set her soul to try if God will help her to restore him. She will surround him with the constant influence of a perfectly devoted love. Dare we say there should be no healing power in such an influence? 
we who know so much of which the world is ignorant? He stroked her shining hair with a careful tenderness, as one might stroke the soft plumage of a bird. And you, he said in a low tone, what of you? She raised her eyes to his. A light of heaven's own radiance shone in those blue orbs, an angelic peace beyond all expression. What should there be of me except the dream come true? She responded, smiling. You know my plans. You also know my destiny. For I've told you everything. You will be the controller of all my wealth, entrusted to carry out all my wishes, till it is time either for you to come where I am or for me to return hither. We never know how or when that may be, but it has all seemed plain sailing for me since I saw the city called Brazen, but which we know is golden, and when I found that you belonged to it, and were only stationed here for a short time, I knew I could give you my entire confidence. It is not as if we were of the passing world or its ways. We are of the new race, and time does not count with us. Quite true, he said, but for these persons in whom you are interested, time is still considered, and for the girl it will be long. Not with such love as hers, replied Morgana. Each moment, each hour, will be filled with hope and prayer and constant vigilance. Love makes all things easy. It is useless to contend with the fate which both the man and woman have made for themselves. He is, I should say he was, a scientist who discovered the means of annihilating any section of humanity at his own wish and will. He played with the fires of God and brought annihilation on himself. My discovery, the force which moves my airship, the force that is the vital element of all who live in the Golden City, is the same as his, but I use it for health and movement, progress and power, not for the destruction of any living soul. By one single false step he has caused the death and misery of hundreds of helpless human creatures, and this terror has recoiled on his own head. The girl Manella has no evil thought in her. She simply loves. Her love is ill-placed, but she also has brought her own destiny on herself. You have worked, and so have I, with the universal force, not as the world does, against it. And we have made ourselves what we are and what we shall be. There is no other way, either forward or backward. You know there is not. Here she rose from her knees and confronted him a light aerial creature of glowing radiance and elfin loveliness. And you must fulfill her wish, and mine. He rose also and stood erect, a noble figure of a man with a dignified beauty of mind and feature that seemed to belong to the classic age rather than ours. So be it, he said. I will carry out all your commands to the letter. May I just say that your generosity to Giulio Rivardi seems almost unnecessary? To endow him with a fortune for life is surely too indulgent. Does he merit such bounty at your hands? She smiled. Dear Father Eliseus, Giulio has lost his heart to me, she said, or what he calls his heart. He should have some recompense for the loss. He wants to restore his old Roman villa. And when I am gone, he will have nothing to distract him from this artistic work. I leave him the means to do it. I hope he will marry. It is the best thing for him. She turned to go. And your own Palazzo d'Oro? Will become the abode of self-sacrificing love, she replied. It cannot be put to better use. It was a fancy of mine. I love it in its gardens. And I should have tried to live there had I not found out the secret of a large and longer life. She paused, then added, Tomorrow morning you will come? He bent his head. Tomorrow. With a salute of mingled reverence and affection, she left him. He watched her go, and hearing the bell begin to chime in the chapel for vespers, he lifted his eyes for a moment in silent prayer. A light flashed downward, playing on his hands like a golden ripple, and he stood quietly expectant and listening. A voice floated along the ray. You are doing well and rightly, it said. You will release her now from the strain of seeming to be what she is not. 
she is of the new race and her spirit has advanced too far to endure the grossness and materialism of the old generation she deserves all she has studied and worked for lasting life lasting beauty lasting love nothing must hinder her now nothing shall he answered the ray lessened in brilliancy and gradually diminished till it entirely vanished and don eliseus with the rapt expression of a saint and visionary entered the chapel where his brethren were already assembled and chanted with them magna opera domini exquisita in ominous voluntarius ejus the next morning all radiant with sunshine saw the strangest of nuptial ceremonies one that surely had seldom if ever been witnessed before in all the strange happenings of human chance manella ceriso pale as a white orm lily her rich dark hair adorned with a single spray of orange blossom gathered from the garden stood trembling beside the bed where lay stretched out the immobile form of the once active world defiant roger seaton his eyes wide open and staring into vacancy were like dull pebbles fixed in his head his face was set and rigid as a mask of clay only his regular breathing gave evidence of life Manella's pitiful gazing on this ruin of the man to whom she devoted her heart and soul, her tender sorrow, her yearning beauty, might have almost moved a stone image to a thrill of response. But not a flicker of expression appeared on the frozen features of that terrible fallen pillar of human self-sufficiency. Standing beside the bed with Manella was Marco Ardini, intensely watchful and eager to note even a quiver of the flesh or a tremor of muscle and near him was lady kingswood terrified yet enthralled by the scene and anxious on behalf of morgana who looked statuesque and pensive like a small attendant angel close to don eliseus he in his priestly robes read the marriage service with soft and impressive intonation himself speaking the responses for the bridegroom and taking Manella's hand, he placed it on Seton's, clasping the two together, the one so yielding and warm, the other stiff as marble, and setting the golden marriage ring which Morgana had given on the bride's finger. As he made the sign of the cross and uttered the final blessing, Manella sank on her knees and covered her face. There followed a tense silence. Eliseus laid his hand on her bent head. God help and bless you, he said solemnly. Only the divine power can give you strength to bear the burden you have taken on yourself. But at his words, she sprang up, her eyes glowing with a great joy. It is no burden, she said. I have prayed to be his slave, and now I am his wife. That is more than I ever dared to dream of. For now I have the right to care for him, to work for him, and no one can separate me from him. What happiness for me! But I will not take a mean advantage of this. Ah, no, no good, father. Listen, I swear before you and the holy cross you wear that if he recovers, he shall never know. I will leave him at once without a word. He shall think I am a servant in his employ. Or rather, he shall not think at all about me, for I will go where he can never find me, and he will be as free as he ever was. Yes, truly, by the blessed Madonna, I swear it. I will kill myself rather than let him know. She looked regally beautiful, her voice flushed with the pride and love of her soul, and in her newly gained privilege as a wife she bent down and kissed the pallid face that lay like the face of a corpse on the pillow before her. He is a poor wounded child just now, she murmured tenderly, but I will care for him in his weakness and sorrow. The doctor will tell me what to do, and it shall all be done. I will neglect nothing. As for money, I have none, but I will work. Morgana put an arm about her. Dear, do not think of that, she said. For the present you will stay here. I am going on a journey very soon. And you and Lady Kingswood will take care of my house till I return. Be quite satisfied. You will have all you want for him and for yourself. Professor Ardini will talk to you now and tell you everything. Come away. But Manella was gazing intently at the figure on the bed. She saw its gray lips move. With startling suddenness, a harsh voice smote the air. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. 
My great secret, I am master of the world. She shrank and shivered, and a faint sobbing cry escaped her. Come, said Morgana again, and gently led her away. The spray of orange blossom fell from her hair as she moved, and Don Aloysius, stooping, picked it up. Marco Ardini saw his action. You will keep that as a souvenir of this strange marriage, he said. No. And Don Aloysius touched the white fragrant flower with his crucifix. I will lay it as a votive offering on the altar of the Eternal Virgin. About a fortnight later, life at the Palazzo d'Oro had settled into organized lines of method and routine. Professor Ardini had selected two competent men attendants, skilled in surgery and medicine, to watch Seton's case with all the care trained nursing could give, and himself had undertaken to visit the patient regularly and report his condition. Seton's marriage to Manila Ceriso had been briefly announced in the European papers and cabled to the American press, Senator Gwent being one of the first who saw it thus chronicled, much to his amazement. He has actually become sane at last, he soliloquied, and beauty has conquered science. I gave the girl good advice. I told her to marry him if she could, and she's done it. I wonder how they escaped that earthquake. Perhaps that brought him to his senses. Well, well, I dare say I shall be seeing them soon over here. I suppose they are spending their honeymoon with Morgana. Curious affair. I'd like to know the ins and outs of it. Have you seen that Roger Seaton is married? Was the question asked of him by everyone he knew, especially by the flashing society butterfly, once Lydia Herbert, who in these early days of her marriage was getting everything she could out of her millionaire. And not to Morgana? Just think. What a disappointment for her. I'm sure she was in love with him. I thought so, Gwyn answered cautiously. And he with her. But one never knows. No one ever does, laughed the fair Lydia. Poor Morgana, left on the stock. But she's so rich it won't matter. She can marry anybody she likes. Marriage isn't everything, said Gwent. To some it may be heaven, but to others. The worser place, agreed Lydia. And Morgana's not like ordinary women. I wonder what she's doing. And when we shall see her again. Yes, I wonder, Gwent responded vaguely, and the subject dropped. They might have had more than ordinary cause to wonder had they been able to form even a guess as to the manner and intentions of life held by the strange half-spiritual creature whom they imagined to be but an ordinary mortal moved by the same ephemeral aims and desires as the rest of the grosser world who, even among scientists, accustomed as they are to study the evolution of grubs into lovely rainbow-winged shapes, and the transformation of ordinary weeds into exquisite flowers of perfect form and glorious color, goes far enough or deep enough to realize similar capability of transformation in a human organism self-trained to so evolve and develop itself who, at this time of day, even with the hourly vivid flashes kindled by the research lamps of science, reverts to former theories of men like de Gabalis, who held that beings in process of finer evolution and formation, and known as elementals nourishing their own growth into exquisite existence, through the radio force of air and fire, may be among us all recognized yet working their way out of lowness to highness, indifferent to worldly loves, pleasures, and opinions, and only bent on the attainment of immortal life. Such beliefs serve only as material for the scoffer and iconoclast. Nevertheless, they may be true for all that, and may in the end confound the mockery of materialism, which in itself is nothing but the deep shadow cast by a great light. The strangest and most dramatic happenings have the knack of settling down into the commonplace, and so in due course the days at the Palazzo d'Oro went on tranquilly, Manila being established there and known as the Bella Signora Seton by the natives of the little surrounding villages, who were gradually brought to understand the helpless condition of her husband and pitied her accordingly. 
Lady Kingswood had agreed to stay as friend and protectress to the girl as long as Morgana desired it. Indeed, she had no wish to leave the beautiful Sicilian home she had so fortunately found, and where she was treated with so much kindness and consideration. There was no lack or stint of wealth to carry out every arranged plan, and Manella was too simple and primitive in her nature to question anything that her little white angel, as she called her, suggested or commanded. Intensely grateful for the affectionate care bestowed upon her, she acquiesced in what she understood to be the methods of possible cure for the ruined man to whom she had bound her life. If he gets well, quite, quite well, she said, lifting her splendid dark eyes to Morgana's blue as love in a mist, I will go away and give him to you. And she meant it. Having no predominant idea in her mind, save that of making her elect beloved happy. Meanwhile, Morgana announced her intention of taking another aerial voyage in the White Eagle, much to the joy of Giulio Rivardi. Receiving his orders to prepare the wonderful airship for a long flight, he and Gaspard worked energetically to perfect every detail, where he had previously felt a certain sense of fear as to the capabilities of the great vessel, controlled by a force of which Morgana alone had the secret. He was now full of certainty and confidence, and told her so. I am glad, he said, that you are leaving this place, where you have installed people who to me seem quite out of keeping up with it. That terrible man who shouts, I am master of the world. Ah, cara Madonna, I did not work at your fairy Palazzo d'Oro for such an occupant. I know you did not, she answered gently. Nor did I intend it to be so occupied. I dreamed of it as a home of pleasure where I should dwell alone. And you said it would be lonely, you remember? I said it was a place for love, he replied. You were right, and love inhabits it, love of the purest, most unselfish nature. Love that is a cruel martyrdom, he interposed. True, and her eyes shone with a strange brilliancy. But love, as the world knows it, is never anything else. There, do not frown, my friend. You will never wear its crown of thorns. And you are glad that I am going away? Yes, glad that you will have a change, he said. Your constant care and anxiety for these people whom we rescued from death must have tired you out unconsciously. You will enjoy a free flight through space, and the ship is in perfect condition. She will carry you like an angel in the air. She smiled and gave him her hand. Good Giulio, you are quite a romanticist. You talk of angels without believing in them. I believe in them when I look at you, he said, with all an Italian's impulsive gallantry. Very pretty of you and she withdrew her hand from his too fervent clasp. I feel sorry for myself that I cannot rightly appreciate so charming a compliment. It is not a compliment, he declared vehemently. It is the truth. Her eyes dwelt on him with a wistful kindness. You were what some people call a good fellow, Giulio, she said, and you deserve to be very happy. I hope you will be so. I want you to prosper so that you may restore your grand old villa to its former beauty. I also want you to marry and bring up a big family. Here she laughed a little. A family of sons and daughters who will be grateful to you and not waste every penny you give them, though that is the modern way of sons and daughters. She paused, smiling at his moody expression. And you say everything is ready? The White Eagle is prepared for flight? She will leave the shed at a moment's touch, he answered, when you supply the motive power. She nodded comprehensively and thought a moment. Come to me the day after tomorrow, she said. You will then have your orders. It is to be a long flight this time, he asked. Not so long as to California, she answered, but long enough. With that she left him, and he betook himself to the air shed where the superb white eagle rested all a quiver for departure, palpitating, or it, so it seemed to him, 
with a strange eagerness for movement which struck him as unusual and uncanny in a mere piece of mechanism. The next day moved on tranquilly. Morgana wrote many letters and varied this occupation by occasionally sitting in the Legia to talk with Manella and Lady Kingswood, both of whom now seemed the natural inhabitants of the Palazzo d'Oro. She spoke easily of her intended air trip, so that they accepted her intention as a matter of course, Manella only entreating, Do not be long away, her lovely, eloquent eyes emphasizing her appeal. Now and again the terrible cries of, There shall be no more wars, there can be none, my great secret, I am master of the world, rang through the house despite the closed doors cries which they feigned not to hear, though Manella winced with pain as at a dagger thrust each time the sounds echoed on the air, and the night came mildly glorious with a full moon shining in an almost clear sky, clear save for little delicate wings of snowy cloud drifting in the east like wandering shapes of birds that haunted the domain of sunrise. Guglio Rivardi leaning out of one of the richly sculptured window arches of his half-ruined villa, looked at the sky with pleasurable anticipation of the morrow's intended voyage in the White Eagle. The weather will be perfect, he thought. She will be pleased. And when she is pleased, no woman can be more charming. She's not beautiful like Manila, but she's something more than beautiful. She is bewitching. I wonder where she means to go. Suddenly a thought struck him, a vivid impression coming from he knew not whence, an idea that he had forgotten a small item of detail in the airship, which its owner might or might not notice, but which would certainly imply some slight forgetfulness on his part. He glanced at his watch. It was close on midnight. Acting on a momentary impulse, he decided not to wait till morning, but to go at once down to the shed and see that everything in and about the vessel was absolutely and finally in order. As he walked among the perfumed tangles of shrub and flower in his garden, and out towards the seashore, he was impressed by the great silence everywhere around him. Everything looked like a moveless picture, a study in still life. Passing through a little olive wood which lay between his own grounds and the sea, he paused as he came out of the shadow of the trees and looked towards the height crowned by the Palazzo d'Oro where from the upper windows twinkled a few lights showing the position of the room where the master of the world lay stretched in brainless immobility, waited upon by medical nurses ever on the watch, and a wife of whom he knew nothing, guarding him with the fixed devotion of a faithful dog rather than of a human being. Going onwards in a kind of abstract reverie, he came to a halt again on reaching the shore, enchanted by the dreamy loveliness of the scene. In an open stretch of dazzling brilliancy, the sea presented itself to his eyes, like a delicate network of jewels finely strung on swaying threads of silver, and he gazed upon it as one might gaze on the fairylands forlorn of Keats in his enchanting posy. Never surely, he thought, had he seen a night so beautiful, so perfect in its expression of peace. He walked leisurely. The long shed which sheltered the airship was just before him, its black outline silhouetted against the sky. But as he approached it more nearly, something caused him to stop abruptly and stare fixedly as though stricken by some sudden terror. Then he dashed off at a violent run till he came to a breathless halt, crying out, Grand Dio, it is gone! Gone! The shed was empty. No airship was there, poised trembling on its own balance, all prepared for flight. The wonderful white eagle had unfurled its wings and fled. Whither? Like a madman, he rushed up and down, shouting and calling in vain. It was after midnight, and there was no one about to hear him. He started to run to the Palazzo d'Oro to give the alarm, but was held back held by an indescribable force which he was powerless to resist. He struggled with all his might, uselessly. Morgana! he cried in a desperate voice. Morgana! Running down to the edge of the sea, he gazed across it, and up to the wonderful sky through which the moon rolled lazily like a silver ball. 
Was there nothing to be seen there save that moon and the moon-dimmed stars? With eager, straining eyes, he searched every quarter of the visible space. Stay! Was that a white dove soaring eastwards? Or a cloud sinking to its rest? Morgana! he cried again, stretching out his arms in despair. She has gone, and alone! Even as he spoke, the dove-like shape was lost to sight beyond the shining of the evening star. L'Envoy Several months ago, the ruin of a great airship was found on the outskirts of the great desert, so battered and broken as to make its mechanism unrecognizable. No one could trace its origin. No one could discover the method of its design. There was no remnant of any engine, and its wings were cut to ribbons. The travelers who came upon its fragments half buried in the sand left it where they found it, deciding that a terrible catastrophe had overtaken the unfortunate aviators who had piloted it thus far. They spoke of it when they returned to Europe, but came upon no one who could offer a clue as to its possible origin. These same travelers were those who a short time since filled a certain section of the sensational press with tales of a brazen city seen from the desert in the distance, with towers and cupolas that shone like brass or like the city of pure gold, revealed to St. John the Divine, where in the midst of the street of it is the tree of life. Such tales were and are received with scorn by the world's majority, for whom food and money constitute the chief interest of existence. Nevertheless, tradition sometimes proves to be true, and dreams become realities. However this may be, Morgana lives, and can make her voice heard when she will along the sound ray, that wonderful wireless which is soon to be declared to the world. For there is no distance that is not bridged by light, and no separation of sounds that cannot be again brought into unison and harmony. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy, and the Golden City is one of those things. Masters of the world are poor creatures at best, but the secret makers of the new race are the gods of the future. The End End of Chapter 26 End of The Secret Power by Marie Corelli